good morning to one and all i dr pranjal sharma junior resident of department of radiology at mgm medical college i am pleased to welcome you all to the much awaited mgm radiocon 2020 and we are privileged to have with us such eminent speakers the webinar will be followed by paper and poster presentations from all departments good morning i'm dr faiza sheik junior resident of department of radiology and before we begin this webinar i would like to give some instructions to all the attendees the attendees can put their queries in the chat box or the q and a section which would be addressed at the end of each session let's begin this webinar i would like to invite dr roshan pant so is director and consultant radiology and imaging at sir h n reliance foundation hospital and research center at mumbai and sir will be taking a session on fundamental techniques of ir we welcome you sir thank you it's a privilege to be here and I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here so there is i'll start this with a strange kind of a quiz thing so uh people might be aware that on the left is the famous movie arth satya and on the right on the cover of life magazine is a gentleman called dr charles daughter who's uh, very famous and there is a link between these two and uh, i don't expect people to get this but uh, the link between these two is this place called karlovy vary karlovy vary has a famous national movie festival for which adsat had got the best actor award for om puri and karlovy vary was the place where in 1963 a long time ago dr charles daughter first visualized the power of the angiographic catheter and image guided intervention and forecast what is now an everyday uh, well established technique and specialty for us in fact uh, he is the he is one of the first visionaries who pointed out the the ability of the angiographic catheter to provide sort of uh, pinhole surgery accurate treatment for uh, multiple pathologies that we now know so well as interventional radiology right that with the history to begin with now what are the basics of interventional radiology the very fundamental fact is that interventional radiology is a clinical specialty and the patient the live patient every part of the patient is at the center of interventional radiology in a lot of um, approaches of interventional radiology in the past have been procedure centric the interventional radiologist is told do this procedure and he does the procedure and the patient care everything else is taken over by the specialist who is actually admitted or, or is managing the patient but that is no longer the case and interventional radiology has to carry its share of the clinical workload including ward rounds opd etc so patient evaluation is a very basic fundamental of interventional radiology this evaluation will include clinical and laboratory as well as imaging evaluation which is of course central to interventional radiology so therefore knowledge of imaging anatomy and technology is very fundamental technical knowledge and skill of the tools the procedures the uh, the steps the scales etc are are of course vital and fundamental to the practice of interventional radiology and please understand that you cannot just learn the procedural part of disease management you have to know about the disease management for example if you are treating hepatocellular carcinoma you have to understand what is the role of uh, radiation therapy what is the role of uh, oncology what drugs can be used which uh, data supports the use of what kind of management and combination of managements in a given patient so to treat diseases one must understand diseases and understand the rules of various modalities including surgery and medicine in these uh, situations the management of peripheral arterial disease for example doesn't just mean angioplasty it also means managing graded exercise also means managing the antiplatelet therapy also means managing the patient's comorbidities from time to time okay so what we will discuss today will not be the entire uh, gamut of things obviously but we'll talk about pre procedure workup the fundamentals which apply to a broad range of procedures and what what the basic gradings and standards are we'll talk about 
about basically the access in simple procedures like arterial access, biliary access, chain access, that is the renal pelvic vessel system only, and post-procedure management and follow-up. Right. So patient evaluation pre-procedure workup includes, of course, uh, from time to time when you have requirements, you have to do an evaluation which aims at deciding whether the patient needs local anesthesia or general anesthesia. For example, a small child will almost invariably need general anesthesia, in which case a pre-anesthetic evaluation is mandatory to ensure that the child can undergo anesthesia safely. And that's part of our responsibility to have this done. Imaging evaluation, just because the patient has been imaged does not necessarily mean the patient has been imaged adequately to plan the procedure and the follow-up. So when you look at the imaging, you must always see whether the imaging is sufficient for what you aim to do. For example, uh, a CT scan of the abdomen may show us the aortic aneurysm, but is that sufficient? You will also need to see whether there are other aneurysms, what is the aorta like, and what are the pathways to treating the aneurysm like. That means you have to image, ideally, the entire aorta, and you have to image up till the common femoral artery at the level of both femoral heads to ensure that your pathway to get to the place that you want to treat is also adequate. And very, very central to all our procedures because it's a sort of surgical branch is bleeding risk evaluation. What is the patient's bleeding risk? If we do a procedure, is the patient likely to bleed heavily and land up with a complication or an emergency? So this is a very significant part of what we do. And this is the part we're going to discuss a little bit now. There is, these, are the, these are broadly the tests, as we all know, for evaluating the bleeding coagulation status of the patient. The INR or the prothrombin time, which basically looks at uh, extrinsic pathways influenced by oral anticoagulant therapy or in the presence of liver disease, it can be abnormal. And uh, activated partial thromboplasty in time is majorly used in patients who are on intravenous heparin therapy or who suffer from specific hematological coagulopathies. Otherwise, this is not in routine use. It is, of course, used when we place the patient on uh, intravenous continuous heparin therapy. We, of course, use APTT to monitor the effectiveness and the safety of the therapy by having a targeted APTT level. But it is not routinely used in patients who do not have uh, these issues. The platelet count is vital especially in patients where you know or suspect that the patient may be thrombocytopenic. And this includes patients, for example, who may have uh, liver disease, including portal hypertension, uh, sepsis, or uh, various other problems. Along with the platelet count, it's important to understand the platelet function is also relevant. So for example, patients with renal disease are likely to have disturbed platelet function. And therefore, uh, this will be important for these patients. This means that patients who are on antiplatelet therapy, they have to be also handled differently. Bleeding time and clotting time, the time-honored practice of doing bleeding time and clotting time before surgery has been abandoned because they are not reliable and they're usually not altered in patients who don't, have, don't already have clinically significant bleeding. Right. So... Antithrombotics and anticoagulants are very often in use in patients that we see. A lot of our patients will be on antiplatelets for cardiac disease and other indications. Some of them, because of previous DVT or pulmonary embolism, might be on heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Some of them for cardiac disease, valvular heart disease, atrial fibrillation might be on oral anticoagulants. And all this has to be kept in mind when you do an intervention, whether it be a biopsy or a, a, a biliary intervention or a renal intervention or an angioplasty, etc. So uh, these are the guidelines for what is required in patients. These are from the Society of Interventional Radiology. And uh, uh, if you see, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. If you see at the top, there are four columns. I mean, this category of uh, procedure divided into three categories, which are one, two, and three. Uh, category one, has low risk of bleeding and the bleeding is easily detected and controlled. These are basically a bleeding from areas which are superficial and compressible. And uh, therefore, if, you, if the patient bleeds, you can see it easily, either because the swelling appears or you can see the blood coming out and it's easy to control the bleeding by just pressing down on the bleeding point. Moderate risk of bleeding and where bleeding is a little more difficult to control includes arterial punctures, etc. And uh, uh, 
Category three is patients where there's a significant risk of hemorrhage and where the bleeding is difficult to detect or control. That means the patient is bleeding in a place where for the bleeding to be reflected clinically, a large amount of blood loss is required. For example, if a patient bleeds from the liver into the peritoneum, it will take a lot of bleeding and the, the patient will lose a lot of blood because before we become clinically aware that there is a bleed. The patient's pulse rate has to rise, BP has to fall, uh, or uh, the bleeding has to be sufficient to raise the abdominal girth. And these are late events, so the bleeding will be far more dangerous. So what do we do? In category one, uh, the only kind of investigation you need uh, is if the patient is on warfarin oral anticoagulation of other kinds and if the INR is more than two, we have to correct the INR before we do the procedure. This includes the simple procedures like uh, PICC line placement, uh, IVC plate placement, etc., which requires just a venous puncture and uh, it, the bleeding is easy to control. If the patient is on low molecular weight heparin, then just a single dose has to be omitted. No more than is required and antiplatelets need not be stopped in these patients. Uh, there's, if, you, if you notice, superficial aspiration and biopsy is included. Please realize we're not talking about deep structures like the liver or the kidney or, or uh, uh, the lung, etc. Only places which are easily accessed like superficial cervical nodes, uh, abscesses which are in the, in the uh, muscular compartment, etc. in limbs, those can be drained. Okay? Anything other than that goes into a different category. In the moderate risk category, and uh, you can see a list of the procedures which this applies to, if the INR is more than 1.5, it must be corrected and you must test the INR or the PT. Uh, a point here that the INR is not always reliable and it's very important to also look at the prothrombin time. And as we are aware, if the prothrombin time is more than three seconds above the control, that is abnormal. And in this situation where the INR may be normal, but the prothrombin time differs by more than three seconds, maybe a different kind of testing or detailed evaluation will be necessary. If the patient is on unfractionated heparin, then APTT is relevant. This is no use for looking at patients on low molecular weight heparin because APTT does not change much in patients on low molecular weight heparin. If the patient has suspected thrombocytopenia and if the count is below 50,000 you tested, then you have to transfuse the patient. Um, any patient with more than 75,000 platelets is usually has an adequate number of platelets and will not bleed with these procedures. For all these patients, uh, low molecular weight heparin has to be stopped for at least a single dose. And uh, as listed here, different antiplatelet drugs have a different duration for which they have to be stopped. Prasugril is the longest, uh, not a very commonly used drug, but clopid, ecosprin, and ticagrelor are very, very commonly used. Ecosprin does not have to be stopped. However, clopid and ticagrelor both have to be stopped for five days. Now, why five days? The half-life of the platelets is approximately 10 days. So in five days, at least 30 to 40 to 50 percent of the platelets in the body will no longer be blocked by these drugs. So that's the rationale for saying a five day uh, stopping of antiplatelets or a seven to 10 day in the case of Prasugril, which has a much longer duration of action. Now in category three procedures, which are usually majorly risk procedures, for example, a TIPS where you create, where you puncture through the liver parenchyma with a large needle from the hepatic vein to the portal vein to create the TIPS shunt track. There is a possibility that you may go through the liver capsule when you're doing this puncture, in which case uh, bleeding can be heavy. Or uh, in, in cases where you're doing, for example, a renal biopsy and the renal kidney, as you know, is a very vascular organ and a small amount of bleeding uh, uh, in the perinephric space can compress the kidney and create a page kidney situation and lead to prolonged renal and prolonged and permanent renal dysfunction at times. If you're doing a biliary intervention to the liver, again, a very vascular organ and heavy bleeding can happen uh, with punctures into the liver. So all these cases, INR has to be tested. Uh, platelet count has to be done. If the patient is happening, of course, APTT will have to be tested. And the correction uh, uh, thresholds are very clear. In this particular case, if the INR is more than 1.5, it has to be corrected. APT more, more than 1.5 times control has to be corrected. And thrombocytopenia less than 50,000 must transfuse. Uh, the only difference from moderate risk in this particular uh, category, category three, is that low molecular weight heparins have to be stopped for at least 24 hours. And even aspirin has to be stopped for these procedures. All right. Uh, now, please remember, even if you're doing biopsies, biopsies into the kidney or into the liver, etc., come into the high-risk category. 
So one has to remember. Particularly, I have seen if you do not check the drugs, a lot of the time the patient is on antiplatelets, biopsy is done. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get away with it. If you're unlucky, you'll have a terrible time. Right. So we'll talk about access techniques. Now, access techniques, I mean, how do you access a, a target space into which you want to place a catheter, right? So it is through a needle which is placed percutaneously and we'll talk about how the needle should be placed. But there are two fundamental ways of placing a catheter into a space. That space can be a vascular space like a vein and artery. It can be um, a, a space like the pelvic acid system or the biliary tree. Or it can be a space like the, the stomach for a gastrostomy or the jejunum for jejunostomy or the, even the trachea in the case of percutaneous dilatational tracheostomy. So there are two fundamental techniques. One is the Seldinger technique and the other is the trocar mounted catheter technique and i'll be talking about both of these and the advantages disadvantages right so before we go to that we'll talk about needle placement now needle placement there are certain principles uh, uh, very fundamental and simple is you take a short path because the shorter the path the less the chances of the easier it is to reach your target especially a smaller target take a safe path do not, uh, you know, avoid all neurovascular structures because you can damage those and cause significant problems and morbidities. Avoid transgressing multiple compartments, pleural or peritoneal. For example, if you are targeting a retroperitoneal structure, come through the retroperitoneum. Don't come across the peritoneum into the retroperitoneum, right? If you are, for example, going in for a collection which is uh, uh, in the pouch of Douglas, you might want to go transvaginal instead of coming... Uh, percutaneous. So avoid transgressing multiple compartments is a principle which is frequently forgotten. So one must try to remember this. Keep it simple. Keep it safe. Now, if you are going to place a wire through the needle to, you know, exchange for a catheter or to do some other procedure, then you have to remember the direction of the axis has to be such that the wire can go in easily. The wire does not encounter an obstruction immediately on exiting the needle because then it will be difficult to place. And there should be space for the wire to go in sufficiently that you can use the wire for putting in dilators or catheters, etc. Uh, for catheters that are placed for drainage purposes or long-term purposes, you, you must have sufficient tissue around the catheter to prevent pericatheteric leak. So supporting cuff has to be there. For example, in a liver abscess, there should be sufficient tissue to support the catheter and prevent leak of pus around the catheter into the peritoneum. If you are planning uh, a set of procedures, like for example, you're doing a biliary drainage and next step, a PTBD, and the next step is to place a biliary stent, then your needle placement should take into account that there is going to be a subsequent crossing of an obstruction or a stent placement, etc. And the, the needle placement should be planned with that in mind. And we shall illustrate this later on. For example, now you have this target and this blood vessel and you're accessing it percutaneously. Now, obviously, going across the blood vessel is a very bad idea. So you would prefer to do it from one of these two directions, for example. And uh, usually, the shorter direction, which avoids transgressing any other uh, compartment, is the best. Though in a given situation, depending on what else lies around it, for example, if to the, mid to the middle of this... Uh, uh, one second, excuse me. One minute. Okay, so uh, if you are, if you have the heart lying uh, to the middle, to this side, for example, you might not want to come from the lateral side going medially because just immediately medial to this target lies the heart. You might want, come from, want to come from the medial side going laterally. So the safety and the shortest path determine these things. Now, if you are doing a duct entry, then try to enter within a 15 degree or, or 30 degree arc in the direction of the duct. For example, this approach, uh, while it might be easier to see the duct from here, might be a problem because as soon as you enter, the wire has to take a right angle turn to go in the right direction and that may not be easy. So try to approach in the direction of the duct when you're entering a ductal structure. This would apply for uh, bile ducts in particular or also in vascular structures. Now, depending on what you want to access, for example, if you're doing a, planning a PCNL, you're planning an access, you have to access the calyx in which the stone lies. If the calculus is in the upper pole calyx, accessing 
a lower pole calyx as is usual is not going to be very useful because it might be very difficult or impossible to get up to the calculus from a lower pole calyx entry. Uh, similarly, uh, if you're doing a subsequent procedure of placing a DG stent, you might want to come where you get a nice gentle curve instead of getting a steep curve like you would from a lower pole calyx in this situation. So the upper pole calyx or the middle pole calyx might be a better access for planning a subsequent DJ stent. Now tissue cuff, for example, this is a liver abscess and you can puncture it most easily from here. But the problem here is you're very close to the liver capsule. And when you place a catheter, there may not be a sufficient tissue around the catheter to prevent a pericatheteric leak, in which case the pus might leak into the peritoneal or pleural space, depending on how you have gone. And uh, so I would prefer to come from here where there is a sufficient cuff around the normal tissue around the catheter to support it during the drainage process. Now let me talk about the Seldinger technique of placing a catheter. Now, uh, Sven Ivor Seldinger was perhaps uh, one of the most uh, uh, brilliant single procedures ever invented and it's used for a variety of procedures across the entire field of medicine uh, for central line placement routinely in ICUs, PDT, percutaneous tracheostomies, biliary drainage, PCN, collection drainage, arterial access, various procedures across the thing. And uh, interestingly, for those of you who are residents who are listening, when Seldinger invented this technique, he was a resident. At that point of time, there were no CT scans, MRIs, or even ultrasound. And the main way of looking at organs was angiography. And angiography required a cut down to the artery to place the catheter to do an angiography or a needle was placed directly as close into the artery which needed to be interrogated. For example, the catheter would be directly punctured and then contrast injected. And Seldinger came up with a way to access the artery without having to do a cut down. So uh, basically, he called it a, a, a severe attack of common sense. And uh, uh, he published this. However, his guide said this work is not sufficient for uh, you to uh, get your uh, uh, dissertation done. So his actual dissertation was on biliary, uh, on, on percutaneous cholangiography. So that was what he did his dissertation in. Interesting. So this is the Seldinger technique, which we are familiar with, illustrated here with, with you know, uh, the process of arterial puncture. Uh, into a structure, a needle is placed, which is step one. Through the needle, a guide wire is placed. The needle is removed. Over the guide wire, you can thread a catheter or a dilator or any other instrument, a balloon angioplasty catheter, a drainage pigtail, any other tube that you want to place into the space can be threaded over the guide wire. And this is very essentially the Seldinger technique. So it's very simple. Needle, confirm needle placement. Place the guide wire through the needle, remove the needle, place whatever you want over the guide wire. Now that what you place can be in the case of a tracheostomy, can be a tracheostomy tube. In the case of a cystostomy, maybe a Foley catheter. In the case of a biliary drainage, it may be a pigtail catheter, etc. The trocard technique is even simpler. It is basically like an angiocath. A catheter is placed on a needle, on top of a needle. And that is inserted. A catheter may be a pigtail shape which is straightened out by the needle or any other shape that you need. And basically you place the needle with the pigtail mounted on into the target and remove the needle. And now the catheter that you want is in the target. Simple enough, right? Really simple. However, there are limitations to the trocar technique that uh, make it difficult to use in many situations. Now the Seldinger technique as we know is multi-step and the trocar technique is two-step, which is push in, uh, pull out the needle. But, and uh, there is a guide wire skill minorly required for the Seldinger technique. And of course the guide wire is not so well seen on ultrasound. So sometimes with ultrasound, uh, it is difficult to do the Seldinger technique. Uh, but uh, if you combine it with fluoroscopy, that makes it much simpler. Of course, the trocar technique requires no guide wire and less skill. However, the trocar technique is rather difficult when the target is small and deep. It is, uh, they, it, it, especially uh, when you want to place a large catheter and you're going through a lot of tissue or the tissue is hard, the catheter can get accordioned on the needle. It 
gets it rolls up and then it comes off the needle instead of going into the target and this has been reported many times if you have a very long system then uh, the needle and the catheter are long and and can be difficult to handle uh, to place into a target moving target particularly like the liver when the patient is breathing it doesn't stop uh, the seldinger technique is almost universal and there's almost no place where you cannot use it it's uh, you can place catheters up to 30 french with the seldinger technique and uh, practically speaking even a chest tube can be placed with the seldinger technique and you really don't need to do any surgical uh, procedure to place these catheters right so the though the troca technique is nice and simple and can be used many times safely i would recommend that if you want to not have a problem in some some difficult lesions then you should be very familiar and comfortable with the seldinger technique as well even if all you are doing is abscess drainage or collection drainage now to talk about image guided vascular access specifically or this applies even to ductal access uh ultrasound guided because this has become a sort of a standard of care and we prefer to do this whenever possible so there are two basic techniques for ultrasound guided uh, vascular access basically short axis technique or in plane longitudinal technique so this is the short axis technique where you image the vessel uh so that you see a cross section of the vessel you place the needle over the vessel uh point the needle into the vessel get into the vessel and then the needle is punctured in and you can see the flow this is uh, this is this is a more reliable precise technique because uh, uh it has many advantages over the longitudinal uh, scan plane technique which I shall discuss in longitudinal technique you place the needle in the ultrasound probe along the length of the vessel and when you puncture you can see the needle going in okay so the the with larger vessels and uh, with the where you have a good smooth surface to enough access to do a longitudinal scan this technique may be easier but a lot of times when the surface is curved you may not get sufficient contact in the longitudinal plane of the of the target to be able to see things well enough okay in which case longitudinal access can be difficult for those when the vessel is very small there can be partial volume averaging and you will not know whether the needle is exactly entering the vessel or not when the needle comes close to the vessel it can practically obliterate the vessel then it can be difficult to do it with in plane technique and in such cases i much prefer the short axis technique so to summarize the short axis technique is better for smaller vessels uh it requires a little more training and skill to be able to uh, control it better and the big advantage of uh, short axis technique is you can precisely enter at the 12 o'clock position bang over the midpoint of the vessel that may be more difficult to achieve in the long axis technique uh, needle tip is less easy to spot in the short axis technique until you get used to it however it is not really a problem where the surface is highly curved uh, like over intercostal space etc doing a longitudinal technique might be very difficult and uh, the short axis technique probably works better right these are the common sources of error when trying to do an ultrasound guided puncture uh, biggest problem is that the needle is not in the plane of the scan when you're doing a in plane technique so you must uh, visually align the needle outside so that when it needle enters you should see the entire path of the needle now you'll see a lot of people uh, looking at tissue movement to know where the needle is now that is not a uh, not a very good idea especially in delicate situations where the target is small you need to see the needle tip and most of the cases uh, with the uh, eco tip needles which are specifically designed for ultrasound use you can always see it if there is an issue you can scrape the outside of the needle with a small blade and that will create rough surface that will allow you to see the needle tip better if the needle is not well seen on ultrasound remember if the needle has a stilet the removal of the stilet can sometimes make the needle more visible on ultrasound the contact of course in ultrasound is very important and air bubbles in the gel which is uh, because usually the probe is covered with the probe cover in these situations and uh, air bubbles in that cover can cause artifacts and make things difficult to see the probe has to be kept still you have to keep the probe still while you're putting the needle if the probe and the needle both are moving it's very difficult to manage uh, the situation because the error and missing the needle completely can be very very easy in this situation 
do not move probe and needle simultaneously, move one at a time so that the relative acceleration is small and you will be able to keep the needle in view at all times. Remember the needle tip is very important to be seen. Seeing some part of the needle is not good. You have to see the tip of the needle. Ideally, keep the needle tip in view all the time. And a very good place to practice this is when you're doing superficial biopsies where you use a high frequency probe. The risk is low and you can use uh, normal needles like for FNAC and that's a very good place to learn to do this well. Okay. Now, after the puncture, uh, you have to confirm the aspirate, whatever, whether you're puncturing a target is a blood vessel, then you must get blood back. If it is uh, an abscess, you should get pus back. If it's a pleural effusion, you should get effusion fluid back. Uh, if it is a bile duct, you should get bile back. After that, usually a guide wire is passed. You have to check that the guide wire is in lumen. Now, if you're doing a purely ultrasound guided procedure, in the vascular space, it's pretty easy to check. Sometimes it does happen. You have, you think you have placed the wire after confirming the aspiration into the uh, into the space, but because of patient movement and other accidents, the needle can get dislodged, and the guide wire can very easily pass down outside the lumen that you want to be in. And uh, it's easy to check on ultrasound. Now, after that comes the insertion of the catheter. Uh, you must remember to dilate a little bit larger than the size of the catheter. If using dilate, for example, if you're placing an 8 French catheter, dilute to 9 French or 10 French before you place the catheter because there's a certain amount of recoil. And surprisingly, with, especially with the uh, patients who have chronic collections or abscesses, etc., the wall can be very hard and the tissue fibrosis can make it very difficult to dilate adequately. Must remember the wire in the lumen is your lifeline. Do not push the wire in or pull it out. Keep the wire held and still. When you're doing the dilatation or catheter insertion, the wire should not move. Make sure that you align the catheter in the direction of the wire. Uh, and it's important to keep the wire straight as possible and pointing without any bends. And this is much easier on fluoroscopy than on ultrasound because you can see the entire length of the wire and, and make out that there's no bending or kinking happening. If you are having to use too much force, Either there is a lot of fibrosis, tissue reaction, or you're doing it wrong. Okay, so be careful about that. Remember to align, confirm, and insert gently. There's a palpation technique for arterial puncture. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Sir, yeah. Sir, there are just five minutes left for your session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm finishing. I'm finishing. Yes, sir. Yes. So you use access sites standard by palpation. The puncture is the same. The aspiration is seen. The catheter is same. Common femoral artery is the common site, but of course you can access many other arteries. And the Seldinger technique is what is used for this. So I shall move swiftly above because we don't have much time right now. So just to show you the complications of puncture, this is a pseudo aneurysm. And of course it can be treated easily. So now pre-procedure evaluation is very importantly determined by what you're going to do. For example, uh, for biliary cases, you will check for coagulopathy in all cases because liver disease leads to coagulopathy. These are the indications for PTBD. I shall not go into details of this or the procedural details, which is basically setting a technique. We can do stenting and similar procedures are done for renal collecting system, PCN. It can be done by trocar but that is only possible with a dilated system. So the usual process for a PCN is the Seldinger technique, right? Remember to puncture from the lateral side where the muscles are thin, okay? And don't do this where the catheters are inserted across the big muscles. That's very uncomfortable for the patient, right? So after the procedure, usually a DJ stent is placed. Your puncture should be right. As already said, you must plan the next step and if you do this right, the stenting will be simple. If you do it wrong, it will become very difficult. To summarize, you have to know the patient very well. You have to know the pathology, the disease which you are treating, which can be biliary obstruction, vascular disease, or other things. And you have to know your procedure and its steps very, very thoroughly. Uh, thank you. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, sir. There are no queries. If the attendees have any queries, they can kindly put them in the Q&A section on the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for being a part of this webinar.
For our next session, I would like to invite Dr. Malini Lavande, MAMS Consultant Musculoskeletal Radiologist at Innovision Imaging and Anavati Super Specialty Hospital, and MAM will be giving a talk on MRI physics and basic MRI sequences. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Preeti, for this invite. It's always uh, wonderful to be part of this uh, academic uh, session that is held every year. And uh, today, the topic that I'm going to speak on is MR physics. And frankly, I think all of us think physics is boring. I personally thought, uh, found physics extremely boring, especially when I was in my 12th standard and I was very happy to get out of physics finally now that I've joined MBBS. And then when you come to radiology and you really realize, oh, you have to read physics again, you're like, oh my God, why is this? Uh, but then you realize that all of this physics is something which is helping you daily in your practice. So then your whole outlook changes. Physics becomes interesting because earlier you were reading only the theoretical part of it. Now it is something that is going to affect how the images are produced. It is something that will help you reduce the artifacts to get good quality images. So obviously the whole outlook becomes different. So let's start looking at the MR physics. The first part is obviously the physics physics part of it. Then we will move on to the daily, the basic sequences. Again, I'm not be going into any of these advanced sequences of which there are a number of them, but the very basic T1, T2, proton density, stir, what do they mean? And how exactly the physics that we are first looking in the first about 20, 25 minutes, how that helps you in your practical day-to-day MRI reporting. So if you just look a little at the history, it took a very long time. The concept of nuclear magnetic resonance was in, introduced way back in 1930s. But from then to an introduction of MRI into real clinical practice took almost about uh, 50 years. It's a very long time. Normally, when a new concept comes in, the implementation into clinical medicine is usually faster. But here, it took a very long time, and that's because of the complexities involved. It's not as simple as there is a magnet, there is a signal received, and the image is formed. So obviously, it took a long time, and somewhere around 1981 is when it started. MRI was introduced into real clinical practice. And since then, it's come a very long way. The magnetic field strength. So uh, earlier we knew of 0.5, uh, one Tesla machines, uh, all these low field open MRI, which we call. And now it's very difficult to find one in Mumbai. Entire Mumbai, there would be rarely one or two, if at all that. It's all moved to 1.5 T is the minimum basic required. And then three Tesla has come. And again, it got incorporated into regular clinical practice very quickly. So we have 1.5 Tesla universally available and 3T also equally commonly available in India too. You have even seven Tesla machines, but these are right now only in research. And if you look at those images, they almost kind of almost simulate the histopathology kind. So that's where we are moving to in next few decades. The gradient capabilities again have increased tremendously. So the entire ability of MRI to become faster depends on the gradient, how quickly the gradients can change. So earlier you have sequences which would take five, six minutes to now, most of the sequences are about two to three minutes. And then you have certain sequences, like say diffusion, you have cardiac MRI. So you have certain sequences which we are happen in seconds. So again, that has changed significantly. And from earlier time when you had only SE, that is spin echo sequence, it has changed completely. You have now steady state, fast spin echo, echo planar, parallel imaging, a large number of sequences. So the whole thing has changed from 1980 to now. First introduction of MRI, and then the changes have been much more rapid. So let's look at the basic MR physics, and we divided it into three parts. So yes, there is a magnet, there is resonance, and you end up getting an image out of it. The human body is comparable to earth. Why? Because about three-fourths of the human body is made up of water molecules, which is what happens with earth also, and 
the earth is spinning around its own axis it's got a magnetic field similarly in human being there is a magnetic field and how does that come about so hydrogen protons are abundant in human body each hydrogen proton as we know is a has a single positive charge so a positively charged particle when it is spinning around its own axis just the way the earth spins around its own axis these hydrogen protons are spinning so there is a magnetic field developed around it so effectively there are millions of tiny magnets in the human body which together add up and form a magnetic field now luckily for us all these hydrogen protons are randomly oriented and they cancel out all the magnetic field thank god otherwise we would have been walking around as magnets probably attracting things to us so net magnetic vector or the net magnetic field is normally not significant because all of them are randomly oriented they all cancel out each other what happens when you place the patient in a mri machine so mri machine may be 1.5 tesla maybe 3 tesla whatever it may be when you place the patient in the magnetic field of the mri machine all these protons orient themselves along the external magnetic field the external magnetic field is very strong so these protons either orient themselves along or against the external magnetic field more of them orient along than against it's always easy to go with something than against something for example if you're with the wind with the stream that's common uh, logical thing so more align along the magnetic field some align against the magnetic field you so these cancel out and you end up getting a net magnetization vector an effective magnetic field which is along the direction of the external magnetic field that is the mr machine in which the patient has been placed now this magnetization vector is very weak it's compared to your 3 tesla machine or a 1.5 tesla machine this is like very very mini in front of that so you cannot measure it now i want some way in which i can measure this because only so what are we doing in mri we are trying to differentiate the tissues based on their magnetic property how much magnetization is happening based on that i'm trying to distinguish fat fluid what are x ray and ct doing based on how much x rays can penetrate the tissue or not penetrate it you are forming image ultrasound same thing how much ultrasound waves are allowed to go in how many of them are reflected back you form an image based on that here i'm trying to look at how much magnetization is happening and the signal that i'm getting so to form an image i need this to be little more stronger so that i can receive it and i can form an image now what does so as i said these hydrogen protons are spinning so they are spinning at a particular frequency imagine a spinning top so there's a particular frequency at which it is spinning the frequency of this spinning is product of the gyromagnetic ratio multiplied by the main magnetic strength so the magnetic strength varies so it may be 1.5 tesla machine it may be 3 tesla machine so that's the magnetic strength and gyromagnetic ratio is particular for the particular proton so for hydrogen it is different for phosphorus it is different whatever proton will have a separate gyromagnetic ratio which is fixed so what we can alter is the main magnetic field and that's why the mr machines have got stronger from 0.5 to 0.2 to 0.5 1 1.53 1 because that increases the frequency of precession of these proton precession means spinning around their own axis why do we use hydrogen as the main proton in mr imaging because it is most abundant in the human body and its gyromagnetic ratio is high so i am able to get a strong signal other one you may use phosphorus sometimes you use phosphorus for certain phosphorus spectroscopy you have for muscle studies and all that but not really much used 
people have there is sodium imaging for cartilage there are other things which have been used but primarily when we are talking of mri it's hydrogen that we are using for these two reasons one there is large amount in the human body two its gyromagnetic ratio is high so it produces a large magnetic moment so now we have the external magnetic field and we have this magnetic field in the body that is produced when you place the body in the magnetic magnet and as i said this is very weak you are not able to detect it it's not strong enough i want to do something to make it strong enough to get a signal here comes in so that was the magnet part of it and here comes in the concept of resonance now what is resonance resonance means when two imagine two things which are spinning around there on axis or whatever two structures when their frequency is same when it matches that's when the maximum energy transfer can happen between them so you use the term oh yes i resonate with you or this particular thing resonates with me so what it means the frequency is matching practical examples you are pushing a child in a swing you push the child the swing goes ahead it comes back if you push it when it has come the maximum behind that's when the maximum energy transfer will happen and again the swing will go much higher or an opera singer is singing and if her the frequency of her singing matches that of a glass the glass shatters we have seen it happening in enough movies that high pitched sound and the glass just shatters similarly soldiers are asked to walk out of step when they walk on a bridge because if they march in step and the frequency matches theoretically there's a possibility of a bridge collapse it's not happened with soldiers but there was this tacoma bridge which way back in 1940 the frequency of the wind at that particular time due to whatever the storm like thing and the bridge matched and the whole bridge just collapsed though it didn't have any structural defects as such so that is the concept of resonance how do we utilize it in mri so now what we do is we send in a radio frequency pulse this radio frequency pulse converts this longitudinal magnetization flips it into the transverse plane makes it transverse magnetization okay and this is a 90 degree pulse so it is flipping by 90 degree the longitudinal magnetization is converted into a transverse magnetization by flipping it now based on what tesla machine it is so as i said the frequency of spinning of the protons depends on gyromagnetic ratio which is fixed for hydrogen it's not going to change anywhere in the world or whatever you place the patient in and the magnetic field strength which is the mr magnet you are placing him in so if it is a 1.5 tesla machine this is the frequency of the hydrogen protons which are spinning so if i send in a radio frequency pulse at this frequency there will be resonance between the rf pulse that i am sending and the hydrogen proton giving it maximum energy to go into transverse magnetization so i told you all the protons were most of them were along magnetic field some were against so net magnetization vector was along the external magnetic field now to try to make it horizontal it's not easy if you are walking around in some position to try to change okay you are just lying down watching tv to get up and do something it requires some energy so you send in energy through this radio frequency pulse flipping this longitudinal magnetization into transverse magnetization okay so that is the excitation you are exciting the protons and changing their direction by giving them some external energy now what happens once the radio frequency pulse is stopped obviously the protons want to go back to what they were so suppose you have you see this people in circus or some carnival who can can walk on their hand or something like that but obviously they are not going to do it all the time they'll get back to their normal position so as soon as you stop this radio frequency pulse this transverse magnetization will start decreasing and the longitudinal magnetization will start recovering because the protons want to go back to their original 
position. They like their original position very much. They want to go back. Now, the energy which was given by the radio frequency pulse to make the protons flip, because they are going back to their original position, that energy is getting lost. It's given back. And it's given back as an echo, a signal which we receive. And that is formed into an MRI image. Okay, so here comes the image part. Place the patient in the magnet. Use the principle of resonance to send in a radio frequency pulse to flip the longitudinal magnetization into transverse magnetization. When the pulse is stopped, the longitudinal magnetization will recover and transverse magnetization will decrease. It will decay. You will receive a signal which is used to form the image. And why you can use to form an image? Different tissues this particular time for the transverse magnetization to decrease and longitudinal magnetization to recover is different for different tissue. Blood different, bone different, fat different, fluid different, calcium different. So all tissues have different times of this. So the signal will be received in different strength and you can give it a grayscale image. Give white color to where you're getting maximum bright signal. Give black color to where it is completely, you're not getting any signal. And you'll end up getting a grayscale image. Okay, so I hope that part is clear to everyone till now. Uh, we'll have questions at the end, so please feel free to ask. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Uh, next, what happens when the longitudinal magnetization starts decreasing? And Sorry, the transverse magnetization starts decreasing and the longitudinal magnetization starts recovering. So that is called T1 recovery time. How much time it takes for longitudinal magnetization to recover to 63% of its original value. So suppose the original was value was 100 something for it to become 63. So from zero, it has increased now. That time is called as T1 recovery time. So that's the T1. It's recovery because longitudinal magnetization is recovering. Now, there's another concept of in phase and out of phase. Best way in which I can explain it is imagine spinning. You have those spinning tops kids play with. Imagine on its top, you have clock wheels, clock uh, needles. Okay. So what do you see? Suppose this is at right now at whatever two o'clock like thing and you spin them because they are spinning at different frequencies. When you stop them, depending on how they are spinning, when you stop them, the clock may be at the same location. That means these two protons are in phase. They are in phase together or they may stop and the clock is for example, at two o'clock here, but it's at nine o'clock here. So that means these two protons are out of this, okay? These are in phase, this is out of this. And obviously the signal coming out will be stronger when the protons are together. When somebody is walking together, they are more strong. When they are all separately on their own path, the signal is weaker. So you want the protons to be in phase to try to get a strong signal. So this is the second thing. So what happens? T2 is decay. When you stop the radio frequency pulse, these protons go out of phase. And because they go out of phase, the transverse magnetization starts decreasing. So transverse magnetization, the time it takes to decrease to 37% of its original value. So we said that Longitudinal magnetization goes on increasing. Transverse magnetization goes on decreasing. So the time taken for this transverse magnetization to decrease to 37% of whatever it was to begin with, that's called as T2, it is DK. T1 is recovery, T2 is DK. Now, this T2 DK in reality is T2 star DK. Why? Because there are magnetic field inhomogeneous. See, human body is not homogeneous. There are tissues of all different densities and everything. Similarly, 
the MR magnet is also not homogeneous. There are some inhomogeneities somewhere. These make the protons go out of phase more quickly. So it increases the T2 decay faster. It decreases the time for that. So that becomes T2 star. There is a component of inhomogeneity. Okay. So now, different tissues have different T1 recovery time and T2 decay time. That's the principle on which MR is able to distinguish between the different tissues. So now, just putting in perspective all that we saw till now, first place the patient in magnet, you end up getting a longitudinal magnetization along the direction. You can't measure it. It's very weak. You send in a radio frequency pulse, 90 degree pulse, flip it to transverse magnetization, stop the pulse, the protons go out of phase. See here, they were in phase. Now they have all gone out of phase and longitudinal magnetization starts recovering, transverse magnetization starts decreasing. This gives out a signal which you receive from a coil, the coil that you have placed around the area to be scanned. The sending signal can be done by a coil or can be done by the entire magnet inside which there's a body coil. This signal which is received undergoes complex Fourier algorithm calculations and you end up getting an MR image like this, okay? Based on how much signal you are getting from each tissue. Now, protons, as soon as radio frequency pulse is stopped, the protons go out of phase. We said that, you can't avoid it. But I also said to get a strong signal, to get this signal here strong, I need the protons to be in phase. So what do I do? And for that, there is this talk about the rabbit and the tortoise. So imagine there's a race, rabbit and tortoise start together, okay? The tortoise is obviously slow. It has reached somewhere, say till here, this point. The rabbit is obviously faster and he's overtaken, he's reached here. Now, if I tell quickly them to turn around, 180 degree, take a turn and go back to your starting point, the rabbit has got a low, less distance to cover. The, the tortoise, the rabbit, though fast, has a longer distance to cover because he's already gone much ahead. So they will reach the starting point at the same time. Then again, in the opposite direction, the rabbit will overtake. But at this point, they are going to be together. And that's what is done to bring them in phase. The protons, which had gone out of phase. So one proton is like rabbit, one is like tortoise, one is going in one way, rabbit is going faster. You turn them 180 degree and bring them back, okay? So that is what is done here. So here, if we see, we first put a 90 degree pulse, Longitudinal magnetization becomes transverse magnetization. Protons start going out of phase. You want them to come into phase. You send in a 180 degree pulse. Now. That 180 degree pulse will turn the protons in their own direction. You, reverse, you turn. So now the protons which have been out of phase will get in phase. And when they are in phase, they will give us a strong signal that can be received to form an image. Okay. So that's why you have a 90 degree pulse to flip the longitudinal into transverse magnetization. You have a 180 degree pulse to reface the dephasing protons. The protons are going out of phase, dephasing. You want to reface them, bring them back in phase. So now comes this concept of what do we mean when we talk of TR and TE? Okay. So 190 degree pulse, if I send, it's not enough. It doesn't give me enough signal. I need to send multiple 90 degree again and again. So when the scan is going on for two and a half minutes in MRI, this is repeatedly happening. 90 degree, take get signal. 90 degree, get signal. 90 degree, get signal. Then all of that is combined together to form an image. I can alter the time between two 90 degree pulse. When do I apply the first 90 degree pulse? And when do I apply the second 90 degree pulse, okay? This gap here is called TR, time to repeat. So when am I repeating the 90 degree is called TR. These are all measured in milliseconds. Now, I send in the 90 degree pulse and I receive a echo, a signal. So this time here, the time between 90 degree pulse and the time at which I receive the signal or the echo is time to echo, which is 
TE. Okay, so we have come up with two new concepts. TR. When do I repeat the next ninety degree pulse? TE. Time between the ninety degree pulse and the time when I receive the signal back from the body. And by altering this, I can get different kind of images. See, CT is simple. You have a plane CT. You have a contrast CT. MR is much more complex. You have T1, T2, PD, so many. So what is it? What is happening? So just imagine this particular situation. You have two tissue, tissue A and tissue B. This one has a T1 time, that is time for longitudinal magnetization to recover of 20 milliseconds. B has T1 of 30 milliseconds. I apply a radio frequency pulse. Both of them have become transverse now. Now, if I wait for 40 milliseconds and then repeat the second 90 degree pulse. By 40, what has happened? Both of them have fully recovered. Both of them will again get flipped by 90 degree and both will give me the same signal. I cannot distinguish between tissue A and tissue B at all. But imagine if I apply the next 90 degree pulse. So I'm changing the TR. I apply the next 90 degree pulse at 25 milliseconds. What will happen? T1 has fully recovered the, of A. Tissue B, it has not yet fully recovered. So now when I apply the next 90 degree pulse at a shorter interval, this will give me more signal. Tissue B will give me less signal. This will look more white, brighter. This will look more dark. So I can distinguish between the two clearly. So when I'm keeping my TR very long, the T1 is not affecting, the T1 characteristic of the tissue is not affecting the image because all A, B, C, D, E, all have recovered completely. But if I keep my TR shorter, some tissues have recovered T1, some have not. So now the T1 is going to affect the quality of the image. So it, I get a T1 weighted image, okay? So TR, other thing is TE. If I keep a long TE, the T2 characteristics of the tissue have not yet had time to manifest themselves. But if I keep a short, sorry, if I keep a short TE, T2 characteristics have not yet had time to manifest. While if I keep long TE, the T2 chain, differences can affect the image, okay? So now what happens? If I keep long TR, long TE, T1 is not affecting the image, T2 has got time to affect the image. So I end up getting a T2 weighted image. If I keep short TR, I already explained to here how by short TR, T1 is able to affect the image, Short T, T2 has not had time to affect the image. So I get a T1 weighted image. If I keep long TR, short T, long TR, T1 is not able to affect the image. Short T, T2 is also not able to affect the image. So now the image depends on proton density. Whichever tissue has higher density of proton will look different from the tissue which has lower density of proton because the T1 and T2 times are not affecting the image anymore. The last combination of short TR and long TE, the other permutation combination possible, will not give us enough signal at all, okay? So effectively, we end up with these three things, both short T1, both long T2, TR long TE short proton density image, okay? So these are the differences, T1, PD, T2. T1 fluid is dark, T2 fluid is bright. Fat, bright on all, we'll come to all of this in the basic sequences. The last bit is, okay, I'm getting the signal. I'm forming an image, but I need to know from where I'm getting the signal. Only then I can form an image. Just getting signal is not enough. And for that, what we have to do is, there is something called as gradient. And what do I mean by gradient? If I can just tell you, gradient is a magnetic field which is increasing or decreasing in a graded fashion in a particular direction. So for example, here it is 
three here it is uh, in reality the differences are very minute but just to give you an example 2.9 2.8 2.7 2.6 2.5 like that same way or increasing in any one direction graded fashion it is and i need to locate things in 3d fashion x axis z axis y axis so what i do is i apply different gradient so if i apply a gradient like this which is decreasing like this this proton will spin little faster this proton will spin little slower because we know that the frequency depends on magnetic field and if i apply in all three directions x axis z axis y axis i end up getting something like this so i apply so in the mr machine there is already a particular gradient along the magnetic field and you add two more one is frequency encoding one is phase encoding i won't go into too many details but just to tell you at the end of it you end up with something like this every proton has its own particular characteristic if two protons have same frequency they have different phase if they have two same phase they have different frequency okay so every proton has its own unique thumbprint like thing by the end of it by applying all these gradients so now the machine knows from where i am getting dark signal from where i am getting bright signal from where i am getting gray signal it gives you shades of gray and forms an image okay now magnets can be permanent electromagnet superconductor so the earlier ones the permanent magnets would be weaker electromagnet you have to maintain electric supply throughout for it to work and again the strengths are not enough so what we use the 1.5 3t all are superconductive magnets you have to cool the wires by liquid helium to make it so low that the resistance becomes less and the magnetic field is produced so normally we use these uh titanium niobium wires embedded in large copper wire cooled with liquid helium so all of that is here so that cost is significantly high and there is quite a uh, decreasing availability of helium in the world in fact so that's why these machines are costlier and this is how your machine looks you have these superconducting wires and you have surrounded by all this helium and you have all these different coils shim coil which makes the magnetic field homogeneous gradient coils which i uh, told you why we use it radio frequency coil to send in a radio frequency all of them are present inside the machine and you have different coils so you can have various types of coil so there are coils like head coil which will send in the signal and receive it both or you may have something like knee coil which doesn't send in but only receives but it is according to the shape of the area you want to image this one you can use for shoulder you can use it for uh, elbow other areas then you have coils like spine coil and uh, torso coil why because you need to cover a large area but still get good signal so you have multiple elements so when i want to image cervical spine i'll activate only this top part when i want to image lumbar spine i'll activate this part so these are the phase direct coils so they are effectively multiple tiny coils put together to form a larger and obviously why is mr so loud in fact there are sometimes patients who say are machine theek kaam kar raha hai kya itna awaaz kyu kar raha hai or somebody they'll say ki can you reduce the volume now they have come up with new silent mr but not uh, very uh, widely still used because these gradient coils vibrate and that leads to this loud noise which can go up to 65 to 95 decibel so many people talk of little transient mild hearing loss when they come out because of this noise and very occasionally i have not seen one in my practice at least people there are articles talking of very occasional permanent hearing loss so that's about mr physics and these are two very good uh, uh, i would recommend uh, so in fact uh, many of the images and all are on this is uh, are from the emri.com and i have taken permission from the uh, author himself and there's mrphysics.com then there's another book uh, mr made easy so all of these are uh, tell make things very simple and easy for uh, residents to understand okay so if there are any questions i can take now and then i can move to the basic sequences which is a uh, uh, 
continuation of the same thing. So let me just uh, stop sharing, see the chat box, any questions? Okay, so I don't think there are any questions. Please, please feel free to ask. Even if time is not there, I can always answer them in the chat itself later. Okay, there is one question. Why there is long TR in T2? Yes, okay. So as I said, when you have tissue A and you have tissue B, if they have different T1 relaxation time, this has 30 millisecond, this has 20 millisecond. If I keep my TR long, both will have recovered completely. So after 50 milliseconds, the one with 30 millisecond also has recovered, 40 millisecond also has recovered, 20 millisecond also has recovered. So now next time, both will give the same signal. But if I keep my TR long, so if I keep my TR short, if I keep my TR short, say for example, 25 milliseconds, the one with 20 millisecond and 15 milliseconds have recovered. The one with 40, 50, 60 millisecond has not recovered equally. So they'll give you difference signal. So when you have long TR, T1 recovery time is not affecting the image. So it's not T1, it is a T2 image, but you also need long T for T2 differences to manifest themselves. So long TR, long T, T2, short TR, short T, T1, okay? Any other question? No, okay. So that's the only question. Uh, so uh, can I go ahead with the uh, sequences uh, lecture? Or would you need a, a little break to just recover from all of this physics? Ma'am, you can proceed with the ne oh, next lecture. Let me, uh, proceed with the sequences. Me which the participants can uh, put their queries in the chat box. Ma'am would be taking a look at the end of the session. So now this is basically just a continuation of what we spoke, but the less boring part, the more practical part, which we see all the time every day in our practice. Okay. So now I talked of T1, T2, PD. So why do we use so many different sequences? Why is not as simple as CT, which is just plain and post contrast? Because each has their own different. CT is good for certain things. MR is good for different things. So when I talk of spin echo, this is what I spoke about till now all the time. You first apply a 90 degree pulse to convert the transverse magnet longitudinal magnetization into transverse magnetization. Then you apply a 180 degree pulse to reface the dephasing protons. And then you get a signal, okay? This time is called TR from 190 degree to when you repeat this process. This time is called TE from 90 degree to the time you receive the signal. And 180 degree is applied midway between these. Obviously, logically, we told you the rabbit and tortoise have to turn back. So they have gone this much distance for them to come back to the starting line. It will take same distance. So 180 degree pulse is always applied at half TE. Okay. So you have a, this time is TE. Midway between that, you'll apply the 180 degrees. So this is your spin echo that we sp spoke of all the time till now. What is the advantage? It gives you a lot of strong signal, noise is less, artifacts are less. And all the textbooks, when they say this lesion is bright on uh, this, dark on that, they're talking of spin echo. This is the oldest one. But problem, it takes real long time. So effectively now spin echo is kind of uh, not used much, replaced by fast spin echo because it takes a very long time. So now let's start looking at the practical real aspect. Here, if I see there is tissue which is bright and which is dark on T1. This is T1, this is T2. So whatever is bright on T2, dark on T1 is fluid. So this is urine in the urinary bladder. It could be CSF in the spinal canal. It could be CSF in the brain. It could be bile in the gallbladder. All fluid looks bright on T2 dark on T1. So this here is a paraovarian cyst. And I know it's cyst because it looks exactly like the urine in the urinary blood. As against that. Now here I have a lesion which is bright on T1. And it's also bright on T2. So that is, it can be fat, it can be blood. Okay. Both, both fat and blood can be bright on both. 
So what do I do? I use a particular sequence in which I suppress the fat. You can see all this scalp fat here has become dark. When I've suppressed all the fat, this lesion is also becoming dark, telling me this is fat, this is not blood. So now I have a fat containing lesion in the sylvian fissure. So this is a sylvian fissure lipoma. Here I've got a lesion on T2. So everywhere, if you notice, the left is T2, right is T1. On T2, it is dark. On T1, it is bright. Okay. Now this combination can be high protein containing mucoid kind of material, or it can be blood. So blood has various appearances based on whether it is acute, subacute, chronic, all of that. Basically, high protein containing substance. So even subacute blood is high protein containing material. So I have a high protein containing lesion right at the foramen of Monroe. So I know it's colloid cyst. So that's how I can characterize the tissue extremely well on MR. In this shoulder, I've got this dark area in the supraspinatus on both sequence, T1, T2, both it's looking dark. So dark on both is usually calcium or fibrous tissue. So this is calcific tendinitis. I know that this is calcium. You can do an X-ray or a CT to confirm it. But on MR, I know this is calcium. So one, you use T1 and T2 to classify the tissue, characterize the tissue. You also use it for a different purpose. Now here I have got a lesion in the calcaneum. Okay. What is T1 telling me? It's telling me that the cortex is all intact. You can see this black line. So MR, everything is opposite of CT and X-ray. Cortex is darker while cortex is more dense on CT and X-ray. It tells me the cortex is all intact. So it's not a destructive lesion, but I can't see the inside of it well. Here on this T2, I can see the inside. It has got multiple blood fluid levels. So this tells me this is an aneurysmal bone cyst. So T1 tells us the anatomy-like appearance, and this tells you what the pathology is inside. Same way here. This T2 tells me it's bright, and I have these phleboliths here, so I'm thinking of hemangioma. T1 shows me its outline. You can see this popliteal vessel because fat, this is all fat. T1 fat is bright. So that fat outlines all structures. It shows me the anatomy much better, okay? Now here, I have this particular lesion. It's bright on T2. So it tells me it is cystic. It's a granuloma, but it's cystic. So I know it is cysticercosis. As against that, this is T2 in another patient. The central portion is dark, which tells me it is caseous material. So this is tubercular. Okay, so that's how we can use these in our daily life. Proton density looks like T2 because fluid is bright, but not as bright as T2. So proton density we use in musculoskeletal system. Why? Because I can see the meniscus fibrocartilage. You can see this gray here. That is the highline cartilage, articular cartilage. Black is the cortex. This black is the ligament. Here, anterior cruciate ligament. This is the iliotibial band. So all the structures that I want to see in internal derangement of musculoskeletal system, I can see on the proton density image. Now, we come to the next thing. Okay. Spin echo, we said it was 90 degree, 180 degree image. And it was taking a long time. The scans were really taking long time. So then they said, oh, we want to make it faster. This is not very practical. Patient is not able to cooperate. He's moving a lot. Can we do something to make it faster? So you apply a 90 degree pulse to convert the longitudinal magnetization into transverse magnetization. And then what are you using 180 degree pulse for? To reface the dephasing protons. But to apply 180 degree pulse, it takes time. To save that time, can we do something else? What was 180 degree pulse doing? The rabbit and the tortoise, it was swinging back in their own path, complete U-turn. Instead, if I apply a gradient, I already told you what gradient is. So if I apply, so the rabbit and tortoise. So some protons are moving fast. Some protons are moving slow. This is the rabbit. This is the tortoise. So if I apply a magnetic field gradient additionally on top of what is already happening in the machine, where the stronger part is this side, weaker part of the gradient, it's a magnetic field. We all know gyromagnetic ratio into magnetic field strength is the frequency. So now because stronger gradient is here, this tortoise will start moving faster 
while this will start moving slower. So effectively, they come back to phase again, and then again go out of phase in opposite direction. So you remove this 180 degree and replace it by a gradient, and that is called a, you put a gradient here to get an image here. That's called a gradient echo sequence. But it did not replace pin echo because it doesn't look the same. It looks different. Now, this 180 degree pulse was not only rephasing the dephasing protons, it was also compensating for external magnetic field inhomogeneities. There are many inhomogeneities within the body and outside. It is compensating for that. This gradient is able to rephase the dephasing protons, but it's not able to compensate for the inhomogeneity. So that becomes the use of M gradient. So why do we use gradient sequence? It didn't replace the spin echo, but it had its own use. Now here, smallest areas of magnetic field inhomogeneity will be exaggerated on the gradient sequence, okay? So in head injury patient, we all know CT is the first choice of modality. In patients who are not recovering consciousness as expected, worsening, you want to look for diffuse axonal injuries. These are tiny petechial hemorrhages because of shear. And these patients sometimes do not improve well. So on gradient, so CT will not show it. Routine T1, T2 image will not show it. But on gradient, you can see these dark areas. So tiny shear injuries get exaggerated. So it can detect hemorrhage very well. In the cervical spine, in the lumbar spine, you have a lot of fat to outline the nerve and the disc. In the cervical spine, you don't have fat. It's all CSF. So we use gradient to look for disc. You can see these discs, they get outlined well on these gradient images. Now, so again, gradient can be T1, gradient can be T2. Okay, that's a different thing. So these till now, what I was showing you was T2 gradient. Fluid is bright. Here, fluid is dark. If I want a 3D sequence, so for 3D sequence, for example, I want to calculate the hippocampus volume. So for 3D sequence, what do I do? I do a gradient sequence because it is faster. If I do a spin echo sequence, which takes minutes and so long, patient will move and 3D may not happen properly. Or whenever I want fast sequence for anything, for example, pituitary microadenoma. If you give contrast and come out and do the scan, microadenoma and the rest of the pituitary will enhance to the same degree. But I need dynamic images. I need to keep taking images through the pituitary repeatedly as soon as the contrast is given. Because pituitary microadenoma enhances, but slowly. It does not enhance at the same rate. So now I can see this. So dynamic sequence has to be a gradient sequence because it is a fast sequence. Gradient can also be used for cartilage sequence like this, where water, Fat, everything is dark. So only the cartilage you can see are looking very bright. Nowadays, we don't use it much. Earlier, this was a more popular sequence. Gradient flowing blood is bright. Okay. Why that happens? Let's see. So now, when blood at this point, you apply the 90 degree pulse, this portion of the blood, the hydrogen protons, longitudinal magnetization becomes transverse. But by the time I apply the 180 degree pulse to this particular slice, the blood has obviously is flowing. That protons have gone away. New protons have come, which still have the longitudinal magnetization. And what happens to longitudinal magnetization if you, uh, it has not been flipped at all. And you apply 180 degree. It's going to become ultra direction like this. And we said whatever is along the magnetic field, we cannot measure it. It has to come to some other angle for you to be able to measure it. So this blood does not give you any signal. So on spin echo sequence, flowing blood looks dark. But what happens on gradient? 90 degree apply, protons here have become transverse magnetization. That protons have with blood flow gone ahead. But the gradient which is applied is not slice selective. It's not like 180 degree. It's not applied only to this area. It's applied to this whole area. So here also the protons will experience that gradient and now they'll give you bright signal because the transverse magnetization will get into phase and give you a bright signal. So on flowing, blood looks bright on gradient. And how do you use this? MR angiography. You can do 
plain MR angiography without any contrast by using gradient sequence. You suppress fat, you suppress uh, fat, uh, water. So that's all additional things, but flowing blood looks bright. So I can get this kind of bright vessels without giving contrast. That works for head and neck. When I'm doing renal angio, that doesn't work because blood is not only in one direction. It's in, see, head and neck, the blood is kind of flowing relatively in one direction. You can do this. You need to do contrast enhanced MRI, which is similar to contrast enhanced CT angio. You inject contrast. At the time of peak enhancement, you acquire fast images. So you obviously need images which happen in seconds. You can't have a multiple minute long sequence. So that's also effectively gradient sequence in some form. Cine imaging. Unfortunately, the video is not working here. You can see the heart contracting and the relaxing, the systole, diastole, all the movements. Blood is bright and you need fast seconds long sequence. So that is gradient. So now coming to the last part, which is inversion recovery, and that would complete the basic sequences. We spoke about spin echo. We spoke about gradient. We come to one more sequence. So spin echo was 90 degree, 180 degree signal. Okay. And repeat this again and again and again. Gradient was 90, gradient signal. Repeat this again, again, and again. Okay. Now, if before starting your regular spin echo, this part is same as your spin echo, but before starting all of that, I apply a 180 degree pulse, okay? And then I wait for this particular time before starting your regular spin echo sequence. That is called as TI or inversion time. So what is going to happen? Let's look at that. Now, first there was longitudinal magnetization, okay? So before starting anything, normally we apply 90 degree and make it into transverse, okay? But here, before doing anything, I have applied a 180 degree pulse. So all this longitudinal magnetization has gone completely ultra to the external magnetic field. Then I stop that 180 degree pulse and wait. So tissue will start recovering. It will keep coming back towards longitudinal. It takes time. So now, if I apply the 90 degree pulse, when and the water and the fat molecules will recover at different rates. Okay, so just if I again make it simpler. This is longitudinal magnetization. I made it into right opposite. Then I stopped 180 degree pulse. All are recovering. They are slowly going back, trying to go back to this direction. Fat recovers at a different speed. Water recovers at a different speed. When fat molecules have come here, that is about 150 milliseconds after the 180 degree pulse was applied. If I apply that 90 degree pulse, I start my routine sequence. What will happen to fat? That fat will come like this because from here 90 degree it has come off. And we know anything which is along the external magnetic field cannot be measured. So fat will not give you any signal. But water has come to some other level, not at horizontal. So water will still give you signal. So I end up getting a fat suppressed sequence, which is stir image. And if I wait longer for 2000 millisecond and then apply the 90 degree pulse, water molecules have come to this level and they will become now this and will not give you signal. And I get a flare image, okay? So let's, I hope all of you understood this. If there's any doubt, I can kind of just explain to you quickly later. Before starting anything else, I am taking a 180 degree pulse I'm applying. Based on how much time I wait, by altering my TI, I can get either a fat suppress sequence or a water suppress sequence. And why do I need that? So here are examples. Flare is similar to T2, but the fluid is made to look dark, okay? Where do I use it? So here is this patient in whom I'm looking for hippocampal sclerosis. This is the normal hippocampus, the structure out here. I'm trying to see bright signal in hippocampus, but in normal T2, you have bright signal in the temporal horn right adjoining. So my eyes find it difficult to differentiate. So if I make the CSF look dark, I can still 
see this very well and that is flare fluid attenuated inversion recovery okay now patients with multiple sclerosis you have multiple small lesions which are periventricular plaques of demyelination dawson's fingers when csf is bright i may not be able to see these very well but this is t2 i can't use t1 obviously because on t1 these are dark i can't make out i need t2 but i make fluid looking dark so now i can see this very well so i think we are right on track i have about 8 uh, minutes and we will be comfortably able to finish in that next is subarachnoid hemorrhage we all know acute sah ct is good chronic sah ct will become isodense you will not see it but on mr t1 weighted image it will start becoming brighter so you will see it so earlier mr was thought it's not good for acute sh why because acute blood is bright on t2 and csf is also bright so how can you see it only subacute blood can be seen once it becomes bright on t1 but with flare the csf becomes dark so you can see this normal csf becomes dark so what remains bright in the sulci is subarachnoid hemorrhage so with flare mri is as sensitive as ct for acute subarachnoid hemorrhage that was when you suppress fluid when i suppress fat i get stir short tau inversion recovery sequence why do i need fat uh, stir image i need stir image when imaging marrow so in adults you have fatty marrow which is bright both on t1 and t2 and all your pathologies on mr majority of the pathologies are bright on t2 because they are effectively edema increased fluid bright fatty marrow bright edema how can i see my eyes can't distinguish so if i use a stir sequence make all the fat completely dark whatever is edema remains bright and there's no way i can miss it okay so for evaluating marrow pathology msk stir or fat sat t2 what you call it is essential similarly optic nerve surrounded completely by retrobulbar fat so in optic neuritis bright signal in it how will i appreciate when everything is bright bright against bright my eyes can't see so i use a stir sequence suppress all the fat around and you can see this optic nerve is swollen and bright so there is right optic neuritis so quick look at how do we really use all of this here is a patient who's come with pelvic lesions a female come with pelvic lesions detected on ultrasound on ultrasound they still had query as to what it could be we do mr it's bright on t1 it's bright on t2 but i can kind of see some level out here like a shading like thing but still it's bright it's not dark can be fat can be blood i'm not very sure so i do a fat sat sequence and this whole thing remains bright telling me this is subacute blood so now these are chocolate cyst as against that look at this particular patient this again ovarian lesion are operate kar le aur kuch bhi nahi hai component if you see is bright on t2 dark on t1 so i know this is fluid this component is bright on t1 and bright on t2 also can be fat can be blood so i go ahead and do fat sat sequence and what do i see that has become completely dark this is fat here it didn't become dark here it became dark so now i know this is a dermoid because that's a fatty component here i have a lesion in the midline large and it has got bright areas and this is the cystic component bright on t2 dark on t1 but on flare it's not getting suppressed so it's not clear fluid like csf it is thick proteinaceous fluid proteinaceous fluid and fat together i know this is dermoid a midline lesion so that's how i'm able to identify all these things here in this patient come with acute headache you have all this dark sulci here you can see bright signal in the sulcus i know this is subarachnoid hemorrhage i go ahead and do and on this mr you can see this aneurysm out here i do a plain mr angio and it can show me the aneurysm very well without even given contrast here this child came with headache and vomiting after head injury ct did not show much i can see hydrocephalus 
CT just showed some hydrocephalus, but nothing beyond that. I can see hydrocephalus and I can see something in the ventricle, but I'm not sure what it is. Is it real? Is it artifact? Gradient, it is showing blooming. So I know it's hemorrhage. So there is intraventricular hemorrhage, which has led. So MR is very sensitive to hemorrhage, which can't be detected on MR. If you see on CT, obviously you'll do CT with head trauma. You can see fractures, everything. It's quick, easy. But if not detected and you want to look for this patient has a myeloid angiopathy. You can see all these tiny micro hemorrhages all over the place. Here now, somebody has got right ear pain. I use this sequence, T2, it's showing. See on this, can I make out anything? I can see some soft tissue, but marrow I cannot evaluate on plain T2. I do fat sac, I can see it bright. I do T1, I can see it dark. That's why you have to use a combination of sequence. And then I give contrast, it is enhanced. So I can't have just one signal. T1, all these vertebral bodies, this is normal spine, fatty marrow, how it should look on T1. Here you can see how it's looking all dark. So this is metastasis. So I need a combination of different sequences to be able to tell. Okay. Uh, I think that kind of uh, ends the time. Okay. Here again, I do a stir. I can see optic neuritis. I do flare. I can see the Dawson fingers very well. See here you may not appreciate it that well, but here it's strikingly seen. And then just, uh, I think I have exactly a minute left. The last sequence, which is how to make faster. So you apply 90 degree and you receive a signal, okay? If I, by applying this 180 degree, I'm receiving a signal here. So long TR, long T, I'm getting a T2 weighted image. I can utilize this space in between and after the 90 degree, apply a 180 degree at a shorter TE and get one image here. So I get two images, T2 and PD together. I run the sequence only once, but get two images. This is obviously not possible with T1 and T2 or T1 and PD, only T2 and PD because both have common long TR. Long TR, only the T differ, so I can get two different sequences and fast spin echo where instead of normally I do 90 and 180 signal, 90, 180 signal, I utilize the space by applying multiple 180 degrees, try to make it faster. And that is what we currently use most often, fast spin echo. It is same like spin echo, but instead of 90, 180 signal, we use 90, multiple 180, trying to make all of this little faster. It can make image little blurred, but that's fine. Otherwise the patient will move and cause blur. So fast pin echo is what we are using currently. So again, for a little more in detail, you have this book MR made easy by sharing, which is very simple. And you also have MRI in practice by Carolyn and Catherine, which is an amazing book. Thank you very much for patient listening. One hour of physics can be quite tiring. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was truly a great session. I think physics is something which residents find daunting and which you have explained in a very simple and concise manner. We are surely going to remember the hair and the tortoise. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. For the next session now, we have with us Dr. Ravi Ramagantan, SIRS consultant at Kokila Ben Ambani Hospital, and indeed he needs no introduction. Sir will be giving a session on skeletal dysplasias. We welcome you, sir, to our webinar. I <clears throat> like this quotation a hell of a lot. Uh, Arthur Clarke is a writer of science fact and fiction. And he said something like this, that unless you know there is something available, like man landed on the moon and um, picked up moon dust, and he said, it's so silky smooth, like nothing else on earth. That's Neil Armstrong. So the first thing as far as how opposite can you get from hardcore hardware physics to the worst form of human suffering is completely opposite. And that's so interesting about radiology. We deal with two different things. We deal with images which have a background of huge physics. And as you go through this lecture, you'll see that 
completely devoid of that, you will see human suffering like nowhere else. So this is the first step. Now, why would you want to know about skeletal dysplasia? As you go along in this lecture, you'll realize that there are very, very few people in the country, not just in Bombay, who have some degree of confidence in diagnosing skeletal dysplasia, who have interest in skeletal dysplasia, so boring. It's rarely asked in DNB or MD. And I don't want to practice skeletal dysplasia. Why should I know? Towards the end of this lecture, you will realize why you should have at least a passing interest in skeletal dysplasia such that if you see a set of x-rays, uh, you can tell at least that this is skeletal dysplasia and that it is not a metabolic bone disease. That's often the question that is asked even today from endocrinologists, from pediatricians, sometimes from orthopedic surgeons. Is this skeletal dysplasia? That's the first question. And then the question of what dysplasia comes a little later. And also remember that unlike so many other things in radiology, you will see skeletal dysplasia x-rays often with patients. Patients will come to you with skeletal dysplasia. So you have a great opportunity to look at the patient behind the image. And what is more, I wouldn't say distressing, what is more, uh, heartwarming, if you will, is that the whole family is there. You have the patient who's young, usually a boy or a girl, and there is a mother, sometimes the father, and maybe siblings also. So there is probably no other place where you have x-rays in front of you and patients with the x-rays. The other problem with skeletal dysplasia is almost always, 99.5% of the time, all that you have got are plain x-rays. And as things are going on now, uh, the newer generation of people, the residents and young radiologists have no interest in x-rays. I'm not saying you should take interest in x-rays, but you should realize that whether it's an x-ray or whether it's a PET scan, it's all about human suffering. And just because you like PET scan, just because you find PET scan is high technology, just because PET scan pays you more and X-rays are non-romantic. You cannot lose the sight that all medicine, all medicine, not just radiology is about patients and it is not about doctors, it's not about radiologists. It's about the patient, whether he has skeletal dysplasia or an interesting tumor of the brain, it's human suffering. And at the end of this lecture, you can ask yourself, which is worse? And if I ask a show of hands here, don't do it. If I show of hands with eyes closed, think for yourself, would you want to be a person who does skeletal dysplasia with some degree of confidence or do you want to be a neuroradiologist? Almost all of you put both hands and say, I would rather be a neuroradiologist. This preamble is extremely important because skeletal dysplasia is usually considered is, uh, is no big deal. I mean, what's the big deal about plain x-rays? There are so few patients. I'm not interested in skeletal dysplasia. Send the patient to somebody, okay? That somebody doesn't know skeletal dysplasia at all. And the patient goes on from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor and lands up with somebody who probably understands a little bit of skeletal dysplasia. This is a hallmark. This is a common background in skeletal dysplasia. Patients have gone from doctor to doctor to doctor. You have no idea. They walk around the file this thick. X-rays repeated ad lib. Somebody does it, somebody does it, somebody does a family screening. Somebody starts on calcium and vitamin D. Somebody starts on growth hormone. Most of these, most of the time are unindicated. Till somebody says that for God's sake, this is a dysplasia, don't do anything in form of treatment. Nothing much can be done. So this slide is extremely profound. The first thing that you should be able to tell is that this is skeletal dysplasia, not metabolic bone disease, not a growth hormone defect, so on and so forth. 
how do you do that it's not very difficult at all why are my slides not moving okay the first therefore you to identify is this a skeletal dysplasia i told you it's not at all difficult it's simple common sense what happens in skeletal dysplasia you look at bone density and bone texture radiologists know what is bone density is more than normal less than normal uh, you can compensate for exposure so on and so forth and you say the bone density is more even if it is overexposed even if it is underexposed so unlike ct and mr a lot of variation occurs even in digital x the way the technician film said the way the algorithms of post processing are used you can get different completely different pictures especially in chest films but luckily in bone in bone radiology you will be able to tell almost always whether the bone density is more or no as far as bone texture is concerned it's a little more difficult even today some consultant uh, asked me sir how do you tell that the bone texture is abnormal you say the bone texture is abnormal because you have seen enough normal texture I mean that's that's the bottom line. You require some kind of temporal lobe uh, learning, not just occipital seeing and garbage in and garbage out, to say that the bone texture is abnormal. It's not difficult. You just have to see a few hundred X-rays of bone, and you can tell that the texture is abnormal, irrespective of the exposure factors. So these are the two things things that you look at uh, first off. Now. <clears throat> who in the world would say that the bone texture of the image on your left is normal the image on your right is normal dye bones you can see the now normal trabecular pattern you can see the cortical thickness which is white and that's normal and incidentally the whole trabecular pattern in the whole human body is fascinating you look at the femur look at how the trabeculae are formed you look at how the trabeculae are in the lower end of the of the femur the same trabecular pattern is what you see in elephants you look at dry bones of elephant it's all over the internet and you see that the same trabecular pattern is available but in the femur it's different because they are quadrupeds but that's aside the point so you have this type of trabecular pattern including the ones which is in the medullary region and the trabecular pattern that is in the cortex and you see the image on your left you can see that there is some normal trabeculae at the upper end of the tibia <clears throat> but you, as you go down it looks as if the trabeculae have been washed off that somebody has taken white paint gray paint and painted off again the bone and you get this you get this uh, what shall i say ground glass appearance ground glass the opaque glass sometimes that we put on windows so this this pattern is called uh, a ground glass appearance and when anyone describes this if i say ground glass and then it makes sense to you yeah it looks like ground glass it's not at all difficult to make out so once you say that this looks like ground glass it's like 9 minus 9 is 0 so simple if it is ground glass it looks like ground glass it is fibrous dysplasia and that's simple i mean i mean you can make out that this is abnormal trabecular pattern and it has a specific appearance so one is the texture of the bone the other one is density now in a lecture hall i've done this again and again and again whether there are five people or 500 people i tell them all see these images close your eyes and those of you who feel that the image on the left at normal bone density raise your hands not even the gatekeeper raises the hand nobody does that everybody knows here that the bone density is more so this is osteosclerosis that easy so you looked at texture you looked at bone density and the image on your right is osteoporosis okay call it osteopenia you can call it what you want it is black bones this is white bones and this is black bones now in most skeletal dysplasias there are important exceptions in most skeletal dysplasias 
you will have more bone density. Whether it's completely, uh, whether it involves the whole skeleton uniformly or not, there is more bone density. That's common in skeletal dysplasias. There are some where the bone density is less. We'll see examples of that, but that's in the minority. So this one image on your left is black, no brains required. Image on your left is white, no brains at all required. So this is the basis of identifying a skeletal dysplasia. The texture is abnormal and the density is abnormal. It's not as if both will be abnormal in all patients. One or the other will be abnormal. There may be some patients where both are normal. Yeah, those are exceptions. We will maybe look at that a little later, maybe not. So once you understand this, now the other thing which is important in skeletal dysplasia is that the patients usually will come to you with a bunch of x-rays, usually. Sometimes you see something like this on a patient who has uh, cough, 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 fever, fever, fever. And then you pick it up as increased bone density and then you can do a skeletal survey. So the first thing, the first thing is to identify that this could be a skeletal dysplasia by looking at bone texture and bone density. You have to look for it all the time. And then you may pick it up once in a thousand times. So once you do that, then you can start analyzing uh, what those differential diagnosis is. Now, skeletal dysplasia is about patients. It's not just about radiology. In fact, most radiology is never about radiology by itself. I keep saying that again and again and again. But in skeletal dysplasias, it becomes particularly important to know the background of the patient. For example, there are two or three things that you should know. Whether the child has normal milestones or not, whether the child is a dwarf or not a dwarf. These two things you should know. If you want, it will be useful to know whether the child is a proportionate dwarf, non-proportionate dwarf, upper segment, lower segment ratio at all. But just knowing whether the child is no, normal uh, mentation and whether the child is dwarf or not helps a lot. The other thing which can be useful is the family history. What about the par uh, parents? Now, it, it's, it's so useful. Usually the mother will walk in with a bunch of x-rays, the child is coming along. You look at the mother, you look at the father, I mean, look at the child, and then you ask the simple question. So if he comes and then you have the immediate family spectrum, somebody is tall, somebody is short, both are short, so on and so forth. And the one other question that you have to ask every single time is, is there, is there consanguineous marriage? And the patients have been asked this again and again. Before you start, they said, no, no, no. They have been asked this again and again. So what do you do? You look at the father, you look at the mother, and ask these two questions. Whether the other bachus are normal or not, if they have other bachus, whether they have multiple abortions or not, and whether they are married in consanguinity. And finally, you ask, is there anybody else in the family who's affected? So you can't do skeletal dysplasia just by looking at the X-ray. It may be possible in an exam spot, but that is not real life. So in real life, you start with the patient. The patient will come into the room or the patient is waiting in the outpatient. You all this history you ask before you start looking at the X-ray. Because you have to make a diagnosis, not a radiological diagnosis alone. All of this is useful. And when you finish diagnosing, there are things that the patient will say, I'll come to that a little later. All that depends upon what the rest, non-radiology issues are. Look at the father, look at the mother, ask for history of consanguinity, ask about other bachus, and whether this child is normally ventilated or not. You don't have to do that. If the child comes into the room and the child is playing around, completely unconscious of the fact this child, that he or she is abnormal. Otherwise, you look at it, Downs, for example. You look at Downs, you know it's Downs. So in borderline cases, it's better to know what is happening to the child's intellect. Keep talking to the mother. 
I keep saying mother because often the mother. And you will realize the amount of anguish in the family. And not just the patient. Probably the patient is not aware. And the mother will come out with stories and stories of why it's so distressing to have a child like this. And then you'll realize perhaps that why it's important to be able to diagnose skeletal dysplasia. The anguish on the mother. The expectations that they come to you with are the ones that spur you on to learn something about skeletal dysplasia. It is a moving story most of the time. So bone density is more, bone density is less, texture is normal, texture is abnormal, and then we go on. I don't know why, yeah, that's right. Now, now you start your role as a radiologist. Oftentimes, the patient will come with a telephone directory. I don't know how many of you have seen the telephone directory. In our time, there used to be a telephone directory, this, this thing. So the patient will walk in with so many sets of x-rays, yeah? And you can't make out head or tell what is going on. The best thing is to tell the patient, Aap kabhi kya ho nikal ke dena. so they know where the x-rays are done. So patients will come with a bunch of x-rays. Somebody, an orthopedic surgeon has done a set of x-rays. The endocrinologist has done another set of x-rays. The pediatrician has done a set of x-rays, all done within three months. It's, it's radiation burnout. So as a radiologist, your two jobs. One is to limit the number of x-rays that is being done and you educate your referring physician that next time, for God's sake, when you do a skeletal survey, just do this, okay? I'm not reading out for you, reading out this for you. This is essential minimum when you're looking at a skeletal dysplasia for the first time. On follow-up, you need not do so many x-rays, but this is the minimum that is required. For example, you don't request dull AP and lateral. You don't require lumbar spine AP and lateral. And you don't require all bones AP and lateral. You don't, you don't need that. This is the minimum for the first time. And after that, depending upon what the skeletal dysplasia is, how the growth of the child is, you can do some more or less. So this limited ones are all that you need to do. I'm repeating this because time after time, I see AP lateral of everything in the human body. And it's phenomenal amount of radiation. It's not fair. So this is one other job that you have to tell the referring physician for God's sake, just do this. Don't do everything else. If something more is required, I will tell you. So this is what you do. And then we start off with some examples. So I told you that the most common ones are the sclerosing bone dysplasias. The interesting thing, I don't say interesting thing, there's nothing interesting about skeletal dysplasia. There are no interesting cases. There are only unfortunate patients. And that's another of my, my own uh, aphorisms, you want to call it. There are no interesting cases. There are only unfortunate patients. I mean, that's how you will feel if you are that interesting case. Okay, so the most common variety of skeletal dysplasia, the good thing about skeletal dysplasia, as you'll see on you know, the last slide, is that most of the common ones that you see are the common ones that you see. You know what I mean? 80% of skeletal dysplasias can be covered on both fingers and all the fingers of your hand and perhaps of your toes, the common ones. But there are that 20% variety, you should not even break your head over. You just send it to an expert and he will or she will break her or his head. And then you'll realize that if you know a few conditions, maybe 10 conditions, you will be able to make a diagnosis. Okay, make it 60 or 80% of the time. It's no rocket science. It's here, your mind, that I can do it, like this one. So when you see white bones, white skull, you know that this is closing bone dysplasia. Do I have a lateral of this? Yeah. So I have a lateral of this, and you'll see that when there is sclerosing bone dysplasia, most of the time, the skull sclerosis is at the skull base. The skull base is always white. So I'm dividing now at the beginning into sclerosing bone dysplasia and non-sclerosing bone dysplasia. I'm taking up sclerosing bone dysplasia simply because it's not uncommon. Perhaps it's more common than non-sclerosing bone dysplasia, but that's one. Anyone, I mean anyone, a first year resident with what I'm going to tell, the fact that I'm going to tell can remember. Now, when you're talking of skeletal dysplasia, there are many facts. There, are, there is no reason, but there are facts. 
Now, when you have isolated facts, so remember, it becomes difficult to remember, okay? So in an exam, for example, you can mug up and go, but the more cases that you see, the easier it is for you to remember and to reason out why some things happen in some patients and why other things don't happen in some patients. So let's talk about, Preeti, if you're there, I have to 12 o'clock, no? Preeti is sleeping, okay. Uh, so your session will be till 12.30. Uh, 12.30? You want to kill me? Okay. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So you have sclerosing bone dysplasia, you have sclerosis skull. So when you have sclerosis skull, now more facts, okay, big names. There are two important or three perhaps important differential diagnoses. One is osteopetrosis. The other is pycnodisosteosis. It's, it's interesting for you to go and find the etymology. What do you mean by etymology? Why it's called osteopetrosis, why it's called pycnodisostosis, and why it's called clinocraniodisostosis. I could tell you, I don't want to tell you that. Simply because I want to inculcate, I mean, you realize that the talk is mainly for residents, the habit of looking up things that will not be asked in an exam. You have to have that curiosity. Why is this called pycnodisostosis? Why is this called cledocranial dysostosis? And you'll realize that the names are explanatory for the uh, radiological findings that are there in a particular condition. The first is osteoporosis. So there are three common, three common sclerosing bone dysplasias, which constitute something like 80, 90% of all sclerosing bone dysplasia that you'll ever see in your life. It can't get easier than that, just three. And it's very easy to tell the difference between the three. So if you have a sclerosing dysplasia and a few set of x-rays, you should be able to make a so-called histopathological diagnosis. That means you make a perfect final diagnosis most of the time. So when you have this type of skull, I will repeat, osteopetrosis, pycnodisostosis, cledocranial dysostosis. Okay. How do you tell the difference? So in this osteopetrosis, let's assume, though it's not necessarily true, that in all three, the bones look sclerosed, okay? They look white, they do, but they do white in, in different formats, but they are all sclerosed, anybody can tell. So this is one example, so it could be one of three, and you do the rest of the bones, this is what you see. Wow, so beautiful. I mean, this happens often. Wow, so beautiful. I will repeat. There's nothing beautiful about this. What you see here is, now I use the word interesting. Interesting because it has physiological sense. It has pathological sense. The first thing that you notice is that every single bone is sclerosed, which is what happens often in skeletal dysplasia. Almost always, but not always, Every bone is affected in sclerosing bone dysplasia, but to varying degrees. For example, you have this forearm with hand on your right, and look at the pattern there. You see what's called you. I mean, glibly everybody will say, "Sir, this is bone within bone appearance." Right? You ask your ward boy, he will tell you, "This is bone within bone appearance." Have you ever wondered why that happens? Why do we see? bone within bone appearance in sclerosing bone dysplasia. You'll see it in all three and you'll see it best in osteopetrosis. In fact, why is there bone, why the bone density increased in sclerosing bone dysplasia? Now is the interesting part, okay? Interesting because it's physiological. Now, when new bone is formed and if any of you is interested in anything to do with bone metabolism, sclerosing bone dysplasia or metabolic bone disease, you have to look up the book of histology. I mean, really interested. You look up the histology book by Arthur, Arthur Ham. Now it's gone through many editions. The new editors are not half as good as Arthur Ham himself, but you find an old volume in your library. Read the part about how bone is formed. That is interesting. It's interesting because like most things during embryogenesis, something is formed and it is destroyed 
till you get to human beings. So all that and, and thing that goes through on what that what the word ontology, yeah, from wherever you started to wherever you became a primate, and then human beings is sometimes seen in this. So what you see normally in bone is that bone is formed and bone is destroyed. So you have a model of the bone by osteoblast and that model is dissolved by osteoclast and then a new model forms. So many sclerosing dysplasia, the osteoclastic activity does not happen and it's not so simplistic, but that's one of the primary thing. The osteoclasts don't do their job. So the initial model that was formed remains. It should have been dissolved. So you see this classical bone within bone appearance in, um, in sclerosing bone dysplasia. So you have this uh, pathologic, histologic basis of bone within bone appearance. You have to ask yourself why all the time. I do that even now. Why? And get into trouble. Okay. Uh, so you have this bone within bone appearance, but you should know that it is the most common appearance. I'm sorry. It is most common in osteopetrosis, but you can see it in other sclerosing sclerosal bone dysplasia, which include pycnodisostosis and cleidocranial dysostosis. For the next five minutes, I'll repeat this ad nauseum. Hopefully you will remember that. The other thing that happens in osteopetrosis, which is again logical and therefore interesting, is that these patients have severe anemia. Why is that so? Because there's no normal marrow. So it's all bone, 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 bone with no normal marrow. There is no hematopoiesis happening from the marrow and you see a large liver and a large spleen. So these children are anemic, have large liver and large spleen. This type of extreme osteosclerosis is most common in osteopetrosis. Now I'm telling you facts, difficult to remember, but there are important differences between the three. So you have a large spleen or a large liver, it is almost certainly osteopetrosis, not like, not at all, pycnodisostosis or pycnocranial dysostosis. So white bone, white bone, white bone, organomegaly, severe anemia, and leukopenia, this is osteopetrosis. In fact, you don't need those anemia, organomegaly, etc., etc. You just see this, you look at the skull, and you know that it is osteopetrosis. If that is so simple, how do you tell pycnodisostosis and cleidocranial dysostosis? Let's get, get rid of the easy one. Cleidocranial. So you have sclerosis in the skull, and cledo is clavicle. So in cleidocranial dysostosis, it's unique in that the clavicles are small, hypoplastic, obviously on both sides are completely absent. So that is very simple. Something that looks like osteopetrosis or something that looks like cledo, I'm sorry, pycnodisostosis, but the clavicles are absent is cleidocranial dysostosis. The differentiation is important in terms of uh, inheritance. The differentiation is important in terms of severity of the disease and the associated changes. For example, this again is interesting. The amount of sclerosis of bones that you see in osteopetrosis is the bop of everything. It's the worst of the worst of the worst. It kills. It's not bad if it kills, but it produces a whole lot of suffering. For example, in osteopetrosis, you can have thickening around the foramina of the skull. So you have the optic foramen is markedly narrowed and these patients can go blind. Imagine, five, seven, eight, ten 10 years of age, the child is blind. But how often do you see children who are blind and deaf? Because the acoustic nerves are compressed and that completely narrows it. I mean, other things happen. The foramen magnum can be compressed, but they don't develop uh, quadriplegia, but they can develop hydrocephalus. So these are unusual, I'm not saying unusual in sclerosing bone dysplasias, but characteristic of osteopetrosis. Now, this is another concept. Textbooks may say what, I, what they want to. I may say what they want to, but in any skeletal, in any dysplasia, in skeletal dysplasia, there's something called as penetrance. It depends upon how bad the gene is, you may get one or more, more, more features exaggerated. So this is what I'm saying is classical. And when I say classical in osteopetrosis, it happens 99% in all patients with in, uh, osteopetrosis. 
but as you become more and more versatile in skeletal dysplasia you get this whole thing about gene penetrance and a whole spectrum of variations of the same disease but in osteopetrosis this is classical if there is a spot in an exam of a skeletal dysplasia this is it exactly millisecond diagnosis bone density is more and you have organomegaly osteopetrosis because you don't get osteo organomegaly in osteo in pectodysostosis or cleidocranial dysostosis somebody keep account of the number of times i see these say these words yeah if you don't want to sleep just keep a tally bar of how many times i say this because these are common and you have to be able to tell the difference between the three now you have the and i i am keeping a hand actually because it is from head to toe which is all what happens most of the time in all skeletal dysplasia look at the words that i am using i never said always almost never say always i say most of the time because that what skeletal dysplasia is do it's rare example like in examples like this the for it to have all the full blown features as you get into more uh, i'm sorry less common skeletal dysplasia you will see that everything nothing is all the time okay i mean nothing is all the time in whole of medicine but especially in skeletal dysplasia so what do i expect spot in an exam like this you make a single diagnosis of osteopetrosis <clears throat> now things change now look at One, two, three. Okay, look at this one. The lateral view of the skull. I told you this is osteopetrosis. I'm telling you that this is not osteopetrosis. Why am I saying that? The difference between the two is that the bone density at the base is more. I told you it is most often at the skull base. It may or may not be in the skull wall. But the big difference, as you can see on the frontal and the lateral view, is that now this is a word that you got used. The fontanelles are wide open. slowly beginning to get confused in osteopetrosis the fontanelles are not wide open in fact they are fused the premature fusion of osteo of os um of fontanelles so when you have sclerotic bone which is not so dense may be so dense look at these words again may often not sometimes may be but every single time the fontanelles are open often widely open it's not osteopetrosis which makes it pectodysostosis or cleidocranial dysostosis in both of these conditions you will have wide open fontanelles so sclerosing bone dysplasia wide open fontanelles just two conditions for all practical purposes cleidocranial dysostosis or more frequently pectodysostosis you have to look up and tell me you don't have to tell me tell yourself why it's called pectodysostosis so you have this wide open fontanel and you make one or the other diagnosis and then you look at the chest flow and see if the clavicles are normal or not if the clavicles are plumb normal it's not cleidocranial dysostosis if they look hypoplastic abnormal absent it's cleidocranial dysostosis so the big three the common ones in skeletal dysplasia in sclerosing bone dysplasia is fairly straightforward you just have to remember these facts and if you are asked something in an exam this is one of the one of the ones that's likely if you see a patient on consultation this may be one of the one but most pediatrician most endocrinologists and some orthopedic surgeons look can make a diagnosis so easily as we can they may mess up between the big three often they call everything osteopetrosis but you have to be able to see the fontanel and say that it's extremely important the outcome in pectodysostosis and cleidocranial dysostosis is vastly better as far as life expectancy is concerned compared to what happens in in osteopetrosis osteopetrosis is the worst form of human suffering it doesn't kill it makes you suffer 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 all your life and it's autosomal dominant so you see it coming again and again and again and runs in families so it's 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 beautiful excellent but beautiful suffering if there is a word like that uh why am i saying this because I'll <clears throat> talk about this at the end of this lecture. I I don't forget. I say this at the end of this lecture. Why you should know these things beyond radiology as far as skeletal dysplasia is concerned. Okay, so this one is increased bone density. I told you that in pycnoid dysostosis and cleidocranial dysostosis, the bone density is never as much as it is in osteopetrosis. 
So you look at the ribs on the lateral side and look at the vertebral body somewhere in the mid dorsal spine. There is slightly increased bone density. So classical, as if somebody has done Adobe Photoshop and taken all the clavicles. So this one will be cleidocranial dysostosis, and this one belongs to that other patient that you had with wide open fontana. So the big three are easy to tell one from the other. So you have bone within bone appearance here. This one, for example, was the acetabulum once upon a time. This was the acetabulum once upon a time before the once upon a time and so on and so forth. And this is a common presentation, is one of the common presentations of these skeletal dysplasias. Okay, now you will feel that there is so much bone. Why should there be pathological fractures? There is so much bone because it is brittle. It's like a completely dried out green stick. You know what's a green stick? I mean, hey, this was completely amazing. I felt like jumping off the 20th floor. I'm talking to a bunch of residents and I was asking, talking about green stick fractures, 20 of them in the hall. I said, why is green stick fracture called green stick fracture? Not one of them knew. I can't believe it happened just a couple of years back. Why is a green stick fracture called green stick? Not one of them knew. I hope at least some of you, Preeti, you know, why is a green stick fracture called green stick fracture anyway? The good thing was that I told them find out and the next time, one of the bachus came with a dried stem, uh, uh, dried uh, stem of a leaf and a green leaf and said, sir, this is green stick and that is not green stick. Okay, now this is not green stick. Normally in bachus, you expect green stick fractures, but in patients who have sclerosing bone dysplasias, the bone may look more bone, but they are brittle. And they break like banana. Take pictures and send me. Okay, you take a ripe banana and break it and make it break steep oblique, like normal bones fracture. You can't do that. They will most of the time fracture, <coughs> break, sorry, not fracture, transversely. And therefore, whenever there is a transverse fracture in bone, it's a pathological fracture for all practical purposes, 99 out of 100 times. So you don't normally see fracture transverse fracture. You see a shallow oblique or a long oblique fracture, a comminuted fracture, irrespective of the age, except of course in the so-called battered baby syndrome. So when you see transverse fractures like this, you are automatically sure that this is a pathological fracture. And there is sclerosing bone dysplasia. Okay, the one that's on the right, I mean the patient's right, is obvious. There is another one on the left of the patient, patient's left, which has bone, new bone formation, right? It has callus formation. So multiple fractures are common in all sclerosing bone dysplasia, like it may other occur in other dysplasia. So fractures is one of the common presentation of this early in life, before the other things set in. And then you imagine this parents going to the hospital repeatedly for treatment of fractures. Sometimes they are internally fixed. I mean, you wonder and look at an x-ray like this, you wonder how do they manage looking after one child, perhaps two children, with all the anguish of osteopetrosis, managing fracture after fracture and not knowing will tomorrow bring another fracture. This is one of the aspects of skeletal dysplasia that you have to be aware of because there is no treatment except surgical treatment. And then the damn thing can break again because the callus that forms is also brittle. So the patient will come to you and ask you with these excess, kya ho raha hai? Kyo aise ho raha hai? Mere pehle, iske pehle ek bachcha tha, usko bhi aise hoa, kuch kuch hoa, mar gaya ho. So this is something that goes beyond the patient. It goes to the whole family. And some of them are aware because there have been other patients in the Asian past who have had such fracture. So this is a pathological fracture. If you see it on reporting, you call it pathological, often see the patient and you see the whole spectrum of masala like this, you know that this is osteopetrosis. Sometimes orthopedic surgeons don't pick it up because it's sometimes not as close like this. So the worst, worst mistakes happen 
when the patient comes to you through orthopedic surgery because they don't see it commonly. So a banana fracture like this, look for other fractures, ask for a skeletal survey like I told, and make a diagnosis of one of the big three. I call it big three because they are common. So this is chalky bone. Now you can understand how it looks like. There is no medulla. And this is a classical of osteopetrosis. And a child grows older and older, the bone within bone appearance slowly disappears because osteoclasts slowly start working. They may be on strike, but they work slowly, slowly. And the bone within bone appearance starts, uh, stops growing. And the epiphysis also doesn't grow as fast. So this is a classical feature of all of these uh, skeletal discharges. So this is what I have uh, summarized. What I want to look at is the last one, ligament calcification. We are not talked about that. Now, you can have sclerosed bones throughout the body and ligament calcification in an older patient. So the moment you see ligament calcification with increased bone density, uh, you don't think of, uh, of bone dysplasia. That's classical of fluorosis. So you have increased bone density and uh, ligament calcification, it's fluorosis. Don't even think of a sclerosing bone dysplasia. Okay, now we come to the philosophy of diagnosing. There are three ways to diagnose. One, you've seen this gesture. If you want, you can Google. Why is it called gestalt? Why it's called antimony? All of you have heard of antimony radiology. Do you know who coined the term? Do you know why it's called antimony? Okay, one, Google, and you got all the answers. The strange thing is that perhaps you never thought of Googling so far. If you don't wonder, if you don't ask questions, you will be one more machine reader. You know what that means? You will be out of business in 10 years. Not a good thing. I'm saying this because you have to change your approach to radiology. You should have done the 20 years back if you joined 20 years back. If not now, ask questions, see patients, Change your whole attitude from looking at images to looking at patients. You will see it hopefully at the end of this lecture. So what is just out and what is aren't many? It simply means that how does a child learn? I mean, there's a full program on World Science Congress about how a child learns. So you give milk to the child and say, milk, milk, milk. You say, go get the glass, milk, 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 so on and so forth. So the child associates milk with the name. So just start is something like that. So you are a 25 year old kid and you say, this is dog, dog, dog. And you know that it's dog, dog, dog. That you learn when you're two years of age. 25 years of age, you said, this is osteopetrosis, this is osteopetrosis, this is osteopetrosis. Next time you see osteopetrosis, you know it's osteopetrosis. This is called just start. And you look at something, look at me now. You're seeing me for the first time, you know that this is right, okay? You don't describe, you know, two eyes, two, one nose, two ears. Everybody has, hopefully. So th this is called looking at something big. So you look at Taj Mahal and you know it's Taj Mahal. Look, look at Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know it's Leaning Tower of Pisa. You look at osteopetrosis, you know it's osteopetrosis. And just that. Same thing as Aunt Mary. And therefore, it simply means that you've seen one, you've seen them all. So this is what we call in radiology language as spot diagnosis. Most of the time, you'll get away with it. Sometimes you'll be wrong, but this is so simple. Osteopetrosis, pycnodisostosis, cleidocranial dysostosis. You look for three different things and you've got a diagnosis of these two. And these constitute about, let's say 50, no, about 80% of all sclerosing bone dysplasias, about 50% of dysplasia that you will see. Now, <clears throat> this is something slightly different and you will not see it in textbooks. I want you to pay attention to this because these children are cooked. They go from pediatrician to endocrinologist, to orthopedic surgeon, and all sorts of things happen. This is something which is common to developing countries. You will not find this in textbooks. So you have this appearance, which is classical. There is varus angulation of the femur. I hope you understand what is varus. Varus is, okay, let me define it for you. So often residents don't know. 
they know that this is virus you are them to define it they don't look at the left femur okay the part of the bone distal to a joint is turned towards the midline you name it after the bone after the joint which is proximal so this is toxa vara or varus angulation of the tibia and similarly you have of the tibia of the i'm sorry of the femur varus angulation of the femur and you'll say there is varus angulation of the tibia when the whole thing is bowed medial what's happening here it looks like ground glass appearance in 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 the bone but you magnify it that's another thing that you can do often you're looking at digital images you're not sure what's happening to the trabecular pattern you can mag 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 and you will be amazed at how how finely you can see trabecular pattern and then you have this varus angulation of tibias varus angulation of femurs and then you will see that the metaphyses are abnormal they have somewhat sclerosed appearance they don't show the brush border appearance but they have that sclerosed appearance and this is reminiscent of rickets and this is rickets that has been treated long long back this is not a skeletal dysplasia because in western world we don't see so much rickets and you don't see rickets treated 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 again and again and again such pictures are not available in western textbooks so the next time you see a child who has a waddling gait there is severe coxa vara and the hips are going out like that and coming in in the femur you know that this is rickets heel rickets don't give more vitamin d and calcium the alkaline phosphate is sky high in many of the skeletal dysplasias because reparative changes are going on and on and on you may have very high alkaline phosphate that doesn't automatically make it metabolic bone disease so this is an appearance that you keep in your head it looks like a skeletal dysplasia but you have changes of rickets at the metaphysis changes of old rickets at the metaphysis you have varus angulation of the femur and you have varus angulation of the tibia this is treated rickets there nothing you can do for this child and if the child is incapacitated you have to think of some corrective osteotomy at some point in life okay you can imagine how difficult it is for the child to walk because the ankles are touching each other the other thing that happens to these children which is heart wrenching is that when they go to school and when they are normal mentation the other bachchus make fun of them which is often a big complaint for the mothers they harass them so much they bully them so much that the child refuses to go to the school and often i tell the parent go meet the teacher meet the principal and explain to them that this is a special child and this has to be explained in the class to the other bachchus so that they stop ridiculing uh, these bachchus because they are too short or too fat so on and so forth they have unusual uh, facial features so skeletal dysplasia brings a whole lot of spectrum of other problems and it's something that we should at least some of you even if one out of the 100 takes interest passing interest in skeletal dysplasia Uh, it's a huge achievement for the field of patients with skeletal dysplasia okay so this is treated rickets this is not skeletal dysplasia we talked about bone texture so the one which is third from your left and the one that is first on your left are fibrous dysplasia i told you it has this ground glass type of opacity in the upper two thirds of the tibia is the same x-ray that i'm showing you is classical fibrous dysplasia so this is another example of just art you look at it and you know that this is empty now this gets interesting <clears throat> it gets interesting because this is really interesting one more example of how pediatrician endocrinologists and orthopedic surgeon uh, do not recognize an abnormality and treat it with vitamin d and calcium i am not exaggerating so many of these children with skeletal dysplasia will get kilograms of vitamin d and calcium i'm just exaggerating kilograms but it is true one person after the other looks at an x ray like this and says this is rickets and will treat with calcium vitamin d calcium and vitamin d to 20000 examples 
approximate 20,000 investigation find that serum calcium and phosphate is normal, alkaline phosphate is sky high and don't know what's going on. So why do you say this is not rickets? This is not rickets first because the bone density is normal. In rickets, no matter what form of rickets it is, there is osteoporosis. In fact, not osteoporosis, there is osteopenia, make it black bones. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you look at the metaphysis, though it superficially looks like brush border, it is not brush border. It is well-defined bone. And then the most classical feature of rickets, the widening of the zone of provisional, I'm sorry, widening of the zone, provisional zone of calcification, that, that's another thing I keep skipping up, provisional zone of calcification is not wide. The most important of all that is that you actually don't have brushes. You just have some poor definition of the metaphysical land and you have normal bone density. So something that looks like rickets but is not rickets is metaphysical dysplasia. Should remember this because these pain, again, in non sclerotic uh, skeletal dysplasia, I have another half an hour. Okay. Uh, this is the most common, very common, and very often mistreated, mismanaged uh, because people think that this is rickets. So I told you why it's not rickets. And the most important thing is that the bone density is normal. So you have a full skeletal survey you'll find that the bone density is normal, and this is some form of metaphysical dysplasia. There are now seven, maybe eight varieties of metaphysical dysplasia. Don't break your head over it now. All that you should know is that this is not rickets, and you know that this is metaphysical dysplasia. Okay, now, this is another gesture. You look at it and you know. Uh, sometimes people have, and often, very often, uh, when I show it to an audience in the hall and ask them, what do you think is going on? I rarely get responses. Rarely. Not as if I don't, but I rarely get responses. I'm surprised because in the humerus, in the along the outer cortex of the humerus, you have a projection of both. Every single time, without exception. When you have bone growing out of bone, it's an osteocortical. No exception. That is. What is the catch here? There's no catch. It's only diagnosis. And it's an important differential diagnosis. When you see bone growing out of bone in an exam, you say it's an osteochondroma. Fine. The examiner is going to ask you what else. And that's also very obvious. This is not normal bone. Look at the humerus. It's ultra short. And maybe the rest of the skeleton is also abnormal. It often is abnormal. You don't get these changes in an osteochondroma. You must have seen osteochondromas. They always grow away from the growth end of the bone. Now, have you wondered why that happens in an osteochondroma? The bone is growing down the lower end of the femur and the osteochondroma is pointing up. Wonder why. Okay. Uh, so in an isolated exostosis, the native bone is normal. It's just the bone springing out of a normal native bone from the metaphysis. Here, the bone itself is abnormal, which means there is abnormality of bone formation. It is not like osteochondroma. Usually, these bones are completely deformed and they are short. And you keep looking, you will find that more bones are abnormal. What are all abnormal? The bone is short. You look at the humeral head, it's poorly formed. The medial uh, epicondyle is very large, so on and so forth. And if you do a skeletal survey, virtually every bone will be abnormal. So when there is, this is an extremely important part, extremely important point. When you have an isolated osteochondroma or multiple osteochondromas in one bone and the underlying bone is abnormal, it is not multiple osteochondroma. It is called a diaphysial ecclesia or diaphysial ecclesis, whatever you want. And there is a huge difference between them. When you have multiple osteochondromas as an isolated, non-syndromic condition, you just knock off the osteochondromas, end of story, everybody will live happily ever after. But if you have even a single osteochondroma 
and indicates something like this, which points to the official ecclesia, it's a big deal. Because one fourth, okay, make it 18, 20% of patients with diaphyseal ecclesia have an osteochondroma that will become a chondrosarcoma. It's a high picture, high number, 20%. And it is an autosomal dominant condition. So families will have osteochondromas. Families will have short stature. And if you're interested at all in anything you do with patients and skeletal dysplasias, Google this for me. Uh, you write bumpy bones, osteochondroma, and poetry. Bumpy bones, poetry, and osteochondroma. And you will have a heart-wrenching poem which is written by a small child, school-going child, about his condition. Okay, so it's worth reading. Okay, simply because you have to have another dimension in your mind. Not just looking at images on the monitor. You will be out of business because AI yeah, will take over 10 years, 15 years. So bumpy bones, it's something that will make you pause and wonder what we are doing about in skeletal dysplasias. So I want you to have a good look. I'm keeping it on the monitor for some time. Bone going out of bone is an osteochondroma. This is a different ball game altogether. Even if this is the only bone which is affected, this is an abnormal bone. So I have this question often when I'm taking a class, how do you tell this is diaphyseal ecclesia? If you have a child who comes with an osteochondroma and the bone, native bone looks normal, okay? How do you find out if there are other bones that are affected, okay? I get all sorts of answers. I will do a skeletal survey. I will do this. I will do a PET scan. I will do that. The simplest thing is to ask the mother whether there are swellings elsewhere in the body. That's the first thing that you do. You can't be radiology, radiology, radiology. Oh God, that's crazy, absolutely crazy. There is a mother who's giving bath to the child every day, six month, a one year old child. And she will feel it if there is another bump. An older child will know there's another bump. You don't have to do a skeletal survey. So that's the first thing you do, ask the patient. There is no rule that you can't talk to the patient, no rule. It's allowed. Your degree will not be taken away from you. I say this in every single lecture because radiologists seldom talk to patients and you're not comfortable talking to patients. You can't do that in skeletal dysplasia. It's about hugely about patients. So if you have something like this, a single osteochondroma and malformed bone, you have a diagnosis. This is artificial ecclesia. The child will be in front of you completely normal. The mother may be short stature. The child may be short stature and or the father may be short stature and there may be a history of a consanguinity. So it's, it's a no-brainer. It, it's simple. It's a spot diagnosis. So, so far we are coming to those cases where the diagnosis is so easy. If you know it in your mind, you know it in your eye. You can see it and make a spot diagnosis. This one is extremely important because once you make a diagnosis, what advice you give to the patient is totally different, okay? You have to watch, you have to have periodic screening to make sure that it doesn't turn out into a chondrosarcoma. You may have to do biopsies off and on, okay? You have to counsel the patient about the difference between an osteochondroma, which is multiple osteochondromas or a single osteochondroma, which is not syndromic, and the one that's a part of diaphyseal ecclesia. You cannot have difficulty in diagnosing this first off as an osteochondroma because this bone growing out of the bone anywhere on the earth, anywhere, anywhere, even in a Martian is an osteochondroma. That simple. Okay. This is the other arm. Okay. This is a little more difficult. You have abnormal looking bone, the shoulder joint is dislocated, but you have one small growing stuff here and that's here. That's enough. These are often sessile osteochondromas. They are not pedunculated osteochondromas. That's what it looks like. This humerus is short. You saw the opposite side here. You saw this. So many bones are involved in terms of deformity. And you can tell looking at the child that this is short stature. We move on. Okay, the other one. So what am I doing so far? I'm showing you examples of common skeletal dysplasias where you can one look and make a spot diagnosis. I told you, no brainer, no temporal lobe, a little bit of it, most of it occipital lobe. 
garbage in garbage out so simple okay now when you look at this some something like this a child who is short stature and the question is is this achondroplasia achondroplasia has a wide variety of spectrum of uh, penetrant but all of them have one thing that is common the interpedicular distances are abnormal so you will have these patients will have lumbar spine exercise done their skull exercise done their hand exercise done trident and all that masala but if you want to make out the variations of achondroplasia from true achondroplasia you look at interpedicular distance normally as you go down from l1 to l5 the l4 interpedicular distance is the largest widest okay remember magic number it's the widest at l4 and l5 is shorter so l4 is larger than l3 is larger than l2 is larger than l1 and talking about frontal view of the lumbar spine where the interpedicular distances are well seen now in achondroplasia this pattern is not followed you will have the l4 interpedicular distance being normal i mean being the same as l3 or often less than l3 so that's all that you have to do you can take a ruler and measure if you want or you can eyeball and you'll find that the l4 interpedicular distance here for example is shorter than the l5 i am mean, l3 interpedicular distance okay even all that other features and variations of achondroplasia if you see this you are sure that it is achondroplasia because this is not seen in a condition called as hypochondroplasia now that's a sort of a waste basket diagnosis but many people make the diagnosis but in hypochondroplasia you will not see this interpedicular rule uh, which you see in uh, achondroplasia so this is something that you have to remember can be a spot no other condition produces this okay no other condition produces l4 interpedicular distance smaller than l3 okay so this is what i call gestalt you look at these images and you know that this is the diagnosis when you can't make a gestalt or diagnosis you look you start dividing and ruling like in bone tumor bone forming bone destroying primary malignant so on and so forth so you have not been able to make a diagnosis just looking at that based on what i showed you just now so you look at where the locations of the abnormality are and you know you look at epiphysis metaphysis diaphysis so on and so forth now this one is again a spot diagnosis you have something called the erlen meyer fast deformity all of you have heard this word erlen meyer fast you have to find out what is erlen meyer fast why is it called erlen meyer fast now this is an important feature here because the diaphysis and metaphysis are widened if you have more pictures of that you will see that the diaphysis is also widened the diaphysis is widened here and the metaphysis is widened here now this is an extremely important sign of a skeletal dysplasia and i use the word many people use the word not tubulation that means the bone is narrowest in the center portion is sort of flaring out and then it flares out in the metaphysis now when you have non tubulation you don't have the metaphysis tubulating like that it should normally but it is flared out like that so that's an extremely important sign of any dysplastic bone non tubulation of the metaphysis keep looking you'll see it off and on like for example your child with the uh, slip capital epiphysis or sometimes even in perthes disease a tubulation does not occur because bone disruption does not occur as it do as should normally so when you see something like this the diaphysis is primarily abnormal you look at the metaphysis that means the region of the metaphysis here is not particularly abnormal it the diaphysical area that's abnormal diaphysical area that's more abnormal and these are called these lines are called did you say growth lines jump in a lake these are not growth lines they are growth arrest lines and that's logical because at some point in time growth stopped calcification kept on happening growth means the formation of the osteoid but the calcification kept on occurring and there is dense calcification and there is no resorption of calcification that should normally occur so these are called as growth lines they are also called as arrest lines they are also called as park lines and they are called as harris park line there's a whole lot of politics 
but why it's called Harris and Parks? Okay, also interesting story. But these are not growth lines. They are growth arrest lines. This is also something that you'll find in skeletal dysplasia off and on. This is similar to bone within bone appearance, but this is a much diluted variety of bone within bone appearance. So here you have abnormal tubulation of bone. So looking at this, you know that this is some form of diaphyseal dysplasia. And you look, at, at least you should pick it up as a dysplasia. That's important. You can say it's diaphyseal, you can say it's metaphyseal, so on and so forth. But this is predominantly something that grows up. So this, when you say diaphyseal dysplasia, the diaphysis is abnormal. When you say metaphyseal dysplasia, the diaphysis is by and large normal, nearly normal. The predominant abnormality is in the metaphysis. And all of these are spectrum. And the, the bone doesn't know that I should be abnormal here. I should be abnormal there. It does what it wants to do. And we give it names. So there is a whole lot of overlap here. And if you look at the skull, this is what you see. This looks like osteopetrosis, right? The difference here is that the skull ward is equally abnormal. And the skull ward is hugely widened out. And this is classical of what is called as cranio diaphyseal dysplasia, uncommon condition, not common at all. I must have seen maybe three, four cases, I mean, non-repeat cases of cranial diaphyseal dysplasia. The reason I'm showing is for this, you make a diagnosis of a diaphyseal dysplasia, look at the skull, and this is a spot diagnosis. Cranial diaphyseal dysplasia, this is not osteopetrosis because the skull ward is also abnormal and completely widened. It is not just sclerosis, but it is widened. Okay, now, so that was in the diaphysis. Now, if you look at this X-ray of baby gram, call it what you will, you'll see that everything is abnormal. Every single metaphysis is abnormal. And because metaphysis is abnormal, you'll call it a metaphysial dysplasia. But this is not rickets. So that differentiation is extremely important because children with metaphysial dysplasia will get tons of vitamin D tons of calcium, so on and so forth. I repeat, by the pediatrician, by the endocrinologist, by the orthopedic surgeons, all of them. Before somebody says that this is not a metabolic bone disease because bone density is normal, the bone texture is normal. If you mag and see, you'll see the bone texture is normal. Bone texture is abnormal, means usually metabolic bone disease. Forget bone texture, the bone density is normal. And then you have rickets like up here. Like I showed you in that other example, you magnify, do I have a magnified picture? Okay, look at this one. There is no brush border here. It's well defined. Bone density is normal, but there is cupping and as if there is widening. There is no fraying. Fraying is brush border. You don't believe me, next time you see rickets, compare that with a metaphysical dysplasia from the textbook. And you see what you mean. The bone is short. Every single bone is affected. Look at that. Okay, you don't get an appearance like this. Dense bone, no brush border appearance, normal bone density, something that looks like rickets but has normal bone density is metaphysial dysplasia or metaphysial dysostosis. Common. Uh, I think perhaps more common than sclerosing bone dysplasia. You see it off and on. Many of these virtues have gone traveling from one doctor to another doctor, completely distressed. So nothing seems to work. They spend a lot of money doing vitamin D levels again and again. I'm telling you again and again, there's a whole lot of human suffering associated with skeletal dysplasia that you will not see somewhere else because it goes beyond one child. It goes beyond the mother. It goes beyond the father. The whole family is running around making a diagnosis and being told something can be done, something cannot be done. So this one is a simple moral in the story. Bone density normal looks like but it looks like rickets, it's not rickets. Look carefully when you see on MAG, you will not see brush border type of appearance. Oh God, I got 15 more minutes. I'm, I'm 90 minutes is painful, but let me go through it. So this is metaphysical dysostosis. This is metaphysical dysostosis, okay? You have this modeling defect here. This looks like rickets, this is not rickets. This is classical metaphysical dysostosis. Metaphysis is abnormal looking like rickets, not rickets, normal bone density, is there are seven varieties of metaphysical dysostosis. So you can imagine this is just peripheral skeleton and a whole lot of stuff happens in appendicular skeleton. Okay, you can read it before the exam because 
you might be asked because it's a common skeletal dysplasia. I rarely use text slide, but this is something that has to be said in big, big letters, okay? It's often mistaken for rickets. So there are multiple varieties of that. The next thing that's important is trying to differentiate metaphyseal dysostosis. So in the clinical exam, some varieties of MPS which don't have higher function abnormalities versus metaphyseal dysostosis, they have some similar common appearance. And normal mentation, small children walking around familial history. And so you don't know till you get the MPS spot test whether this is a MPS related syndrome or whether it is metaphyseal dysostosis or even spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Okay, I may show you some examples of that. Now, just one hand, one x-ray, the hand x-ray. On the hand x-ray, you may have all sorts of abnormalities on the hand, but you look at the base of the metacarpal, they are not pointed. What do I mean by pointed? See these examples. On your left is metaphyseal dysostosis, or call it even spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, the base of the metacarpals are white. Here, they are pointed. This is MPS, this is SCD. Every single time, without exceptions, you compare both hands. I mean, you see both hands, look at it carefully. If you get an appearance that it is pointing, then you know that this is MPS. For example, the rest of the changes can be similar. That's why I'm saying just one hand and you can tell the difference as well as MPS spot test. More examples of the same. Still more examples of the same. You're pointing of the, uh, of the base of the metacarpals. Okay, MPS, especially morphio, is fairly common. So you have to be aware of MPS, the sclerosing bone dysplasias, and metaphyseal dysostosis. Now, a whole lot of pictures, findings are there in the, in the vertebrae. Most of them have the ring apophysis not developing properly. So you have bullet nose type of vertebrae like this. In some, the vertebrae is pointed backward. Forget all that for the time being. To make a diagnosis, you don't require vertebrae. You can tell that by looking at the hand x okay? And if you want to get deeper into classification of metaphyseal dysostosis, you will spend a lifetime on that, okay? So I'm not getting into that. It's big territory. There are classifications and classifications to forget. I just want you to know how to tell metaphyseal dysostosis by looking at the metaphysis and saying that it's not, it's not rickets and how to look at the hand x-ray and say that this is either metaphyseal dysostosis or spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, but this is not uh, an MPS. So these are the vertebral anomalies. Anomalies of that, I want you to look at just one and two of these. So look at the hand and you can tell that this is an MPS, okay? Pointing at the base of the metacarpal. Doesn't see, see in any other condition, any other. A normal looking child, I mean, a normal mentation of the child can be morchios. In morchios, you'll have plat platyspondyly. All vertebrae are flat. And the thing about morchios is that these are normal running around child who have an atlantoaxial dislocation. Therefore, if you recognize that as morchio by looking at the metaph, I'm sorry, looking at the base of the metacarpal and looking for fondue, uh, platyspondyly, universal platyspondyly, normal mentation, Hands showing features of MPS is morphous. You don't get platys fondly in any other MPS. Okay, so this is something you have to remember. Morphous is not uncommon. You will see it off and on. The important thing is that the moment you recognize that this is likely to be morphous, you do a lateral view of the skull with the cervical spine, not like this, but shoot through like that and look for atlantoaxial dislocation. That's life saving or it's at least limb saving. The child is running around falls, gets worse atlantoaxial dislocation, can become quadriplegic. So one of the things that you should caution to your referring physician is that this child has atlantoaxial dislocation. I feel that this child will need a call. Do it on the spot. Otherwise, the child trips and falls, going out of the hospital and becomes quadriplegic. Nothing can be more tragic than that. So there are times when you can really, really help in patient care. This is one example giving a collar to a child first recognized by you as an MPS. Okay. Okay, now, uh, 
osteogenesis imperfecta, all of you have heard, and there are classical features, is osteoporosis like this. And the compression of the vertebra is like that. The vertebrae are compressed like this. In other conditions, for example, spondylofficial dysplasia or MPS, they are abnormal looking vertebrae. They have this beak like appearance. So looking at this and looking at that, you know that this is not uh, osteogenesis imperfecta and that this is not an MPS or a spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. In both of these conditions, the vertebra is structurally abnormal. <clears throat> so when you have severe osteoporosis in a child and flattened vertebrae like this, you do a skull X-ray. Now the skull is usually big. I mean, the child is standing in front of you. You look at the sclera and they are blue sclera. Now blue doesn't look blue. I mean, they look really, really light blue. And you have to look at it in the view box slide, and then you'll see the blue line. And the child is used to it. 100 people have asked, show your sclera. You know what they will do? They do like this and show you the sclera. They know it. So you see it in the light, and you'll see faint shade of blue. In fact, it's bluish gray, in fact. But you see an X-ray like this. What do you see? A big head, normal child, otherwise normal child, a big head, thin skull wall, no increased bone density, looks osteoporotic. I mean, if you can use a word there, and you see a lot of vermian bones. See that? So there are multiple sutures and there are vermian bones. What is the spelling of vermian bones and why is vermian? Why are vermian bones called vermian bones? Homework for it. Do it today. So they are also called intersutural bones, but I think vermian bones is, is more appropriate for this, giving credit to whatever, whatever, whatever. So you have a normal looking child who is short stature, who has had multiple fractures on falling, trivial falls, and all the fractures healed by abundant callus formation. These are other masala with OI. Normal mentation, multiple children affected, trivial, I mean, fractures with trivial falls, all the fractures heal well, have blue sclera, large skull, multiple bone. They may even have wide open fontanel, okay? But the classical thing is sutural bones, also called as vermian bones. And these are fragile bones, thin bones. I mean, OI is common in our country and that's easy diagnosis. Most everybody makes a diagnosis of OI because these children have multiple fractures and uh, everyone knows that this is one of the conditions that you think of. You learn about it in third MBBS. So OI is no big deal, though it's common, it's simple. Okay, now I'll pass on to this. Now this is something different and not common, but you have to pick it up. You have something looking like metaphysical abnormality, but you have these striated margins here. This is peculiar I and mean, you have to recognize this. There are these striated borders and bones that look abnormal. Let's not describe this. Striated borders, bones that look abnormal is enchondromatosis. It doesn't look like any enchondromatosis that you have in your mind. You expect multiple enchondromas. No, not an enchondromatosis. You have this brush border type of appearance, and then you may actually have enchondromatosis. Just like in diaphyseal ecclesia, osteochondromas, multiple, the bone is abnormal. Enchondromatosis, the bone is basically abnormal. That you'll see enchondroma or not see multiple enchondroma is beside the point. You recognize this as abnormal bone, and therefore this is syndromic. And there you had abnormal looking bone and small, small outgrowths of osteochondromas. Here you have coarse striated margins of the, of the metaphysis. Okay, now we'll discuss this. So we'll go through this also. And this one is a classic example of multiple, 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 multiple fibrous dysplasias. Okay, so this is syndromic. Uh, the Albright syndrome of multiple fibrous dysplasia. This has the classical ground gas appearance. Moral of the story, you see one fibrous dysplasia. For the first time, you do a skeletal survey, especially if the patient looks abnormal, especially if there's a family history of Albright syndrome. And you look for multiple, even if you have two lesions in desperate different bones, you start thinking whether it is my Albright syndrome. So the thing is to recognize that there is this ground glass opacity in fibrous dysplasia and don't stop looking. Look elsewhere in the film 
and you'll see more lesions. So that, like osteochondroma, changes the picture. Remember this multiplicity of the lesion makes it from a simple lesion to a syndromic lesion with all implications as far as the family is concerned. Similarly here, once you say it is <coughs> Albright syndrome, the prognosis changes completely. Okay, now, this is another example, and I don't know if this is a misplaced slide, it should have come earlier. You see the brushboard appearance, small, small holes within that. This is an appearance. Now, enchondromatosis is not an easy diagnosis. You have to have this in your mind this type of brush border appearance, and you can then call this one enchondromatosis. I, I wouldn't mind if you didn't make a diagnosis of that, you call it brain bone tumor, that's fine. Because that is one of the difficult diagnoses to make. Now, these are spots that I want you to have a look at. These are outgrowths. Now, that's an outgrowth here. More bones than one affected, there's an outgrowth there. And there's an outgrowth here. And these metaphyses look abnormal. So you have metaphyses that have non-tubulation, multiple outgrowths anywhere in the human body. This makes it the official ecclesia. The reason I'm showing it out of context is that wherever you see, whenever you see, you should be able to make a diagnosis. This diagnosis is hard here because you have in your mind uh, a picture of, of, of osteochondroma. You have a picture like this. You don't know what the hell is going on here. Why do you call this an osteochondroma? Because this same osteochondroma, when seen from here, call it end on or on end, is actually on end, it's not end on. We all the time say end on. So this is the base of the osteochondroma. It's projecting out like that. Similarly, this is the base of the osteochondroma. So sometimes you see something like this in a patient with a fracture. Call this osteochondroma and you'll be right every single time. You understand this is the base and but you have trouble calling this as an osteochondroma or even imagining this as an osteochondroma. It's like a bottle, small bottle, medicine bottle, seen off us and seen end on. It looks completely different. If you want, you can do that. Take, a, take any bottle, take a picture like this and take an end on, they look very, very different. Okay, uh, let's bypass this. Uh, I'm, I'm closing time. So the summary of this is these last few slides. Remember the gestal that I told you, if you will, you can read about them, read the full spectrum, they are common. They are the ones that constitute, the ones that I showed you today are the ones that constitute 80% of skeletal dysplasia that you will see in practice. The key thing is metaphysical dysostosis. Don't let someone call you, call that as rickets. The other ones is osteopetrosis, Recognize that as different from pycnodysostosis and cleidocranialis. These are the two things that you have to see because the many others, you will have other features you can make a diagnosis fairly easily. This is the summary slide. So when this happens, what about the rest of the 20%? Okay, what are the big 10? I mean, we went through all of these. Uh, we didn't talk about craniosynostosis. That's something which comes in a different topic. Rib vertebral dysplasia, you will see it often in congenital heart disease some rib fusion, some uh, vertebral fusion, hemivertebrae, so on and so forth. So these are some of the things that you have to look at. MPS, what do you do? You look at the base of the metacarpals. They are pointed. SAD, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, it looks similar, but the base of the metacarpals are not pointed. Metapicial dysplasia looks like rickets, but not rickets. Fibrous dysplasia, close your eyes and call it fibrous dysplasia because it has a ground glass appearance. Achondroplasia, not difficult at all. Look at the interpedicular distances. Osteopetrosis, Akash syndrome, so simple. Akash is a ward boy in my in department. I call it Akash syndrome because he makes the right diagnosis, but sometimes misses the other findings. And here you look at bone density is abnormal. Look for bone within bone appearance. Look at the skull, no open fontanelles. No vomian bones, you call it osteopetrosis. Craniosynostosis is a different. Clipple file is something, again, vertebral anomalies. I'm not showing that. Diaphyseal ecclesia, we talked about that. Multiple echondromas that don't look like I'm sorry, multiple osteochondromas that sometimes don't look like osteochondromas, but the bones are deformed. Read about bumpy bones, okay? And of course, the rib vertebral dysplasia. Often happens to me, I'm 68 years old. I've been doing skeletal dysplasia close to 30 years. 
per agent. Okay. Often it happens to me because they come on referral, referral, referral. I always say, I don't know. I simply don't know what it is. What do I do when I don't know? The first thing I do is I say, I don't know. Then I used to look up this book, yeah, Pushing Tabi. I know I, I now make my butchus to look it up. So I tell them that these are the features in this condition. These are the radiological findings. These are the phenotypic findings. That means this is what the child has got. This is the family history. You put everything together in this book, Pushing Tabi's book. You have tables after tables. If you say big skull, this is a DD. If you say sclerotic bones, it's DD. And then you mix and match and come to a list of differential diagnoses which is right about 20-30% of the time. Sometimes there are so many variants that you can't tell what exactly is going on. Often, after all this is over, when you don't know what is going on, you will refer the patients to specialized center. Most of there's one person in Chennai and one person in Velo, who two ladies, I forget their names, who are very, very good in skeletal dysplasia, or volume of work. And they keep lecturing about it uh, everywhere in the country. So you can refer it to them and ask them what exactly is going on. So easy to send by email. Now, what I don't want to happen is this. I get emails after emails, off and on, maybe 10, 15 times a year. When say, sir, what do you think? Sir, what do you think? Why should it come to me? Why can't there be other people who are good at skeletal dysplasias. Uh, I'm not saying everyone should. I told you, a figure of one in a hundred is good enough for me because this is what happens. These are virtues with skeletal dysplasias. You can imagine what's going on in their minds. You can imagine what happens in their schools and you can imagine what happens to their families. How can this child ever grow up as a normal child? It's completely normal medication. Not just one child. One of them is a brother and they have this problem. And then you look at this bachu, maybe smiling, but look at the anxiety on the face of the mother. This will want to come. And when this is all over, when you have written the diagnosis, when you explain what is going on, the last question the mother will ask, Doctor, mera bacha tik ho jayega na? Answering that question is not easy. But I do it all the time. I tell them the truth. I have that type of relationship with the referring doctors where I can talk to the patient about prognosis. It's important for them to know. And of course, I know the clinical uh, parameters and so on and so forth. But that is what is heartrending about it. And it's like mammography. Doctor, is there cancer? It's like ultrasound screening for a fetus. Doctor, the fetus is all right, no? What do you do when the fetus is dead? What do you tell when there is breast cancer? Addressing some of these issues is important because radiology, I repeat and repeat and repeat, is not about images. It's about patients. It's high time that we change our attitude to be concentrating on patients because images will be read by machines and you will be out of business if you don't change your whole approach to radiology of patients rather than radiology of images. Preeti, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, we will now have our next session. Our next speaker is Dr. Ashwin Lavande, So. Sir is consultant radiologist at Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital and Research Center at Mumbai. And Sir will be giving a talk on basics of musculoskeletal ultrasound. We welcome you, Sir. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Sharing my screen now. Yes, Sir. We start with basics of musculoskeletal ultrasound. And in this... What we do on musculoskeletal ultrasound is we image various structures right from muscles to tendons to nerves, joints, and various other things. So 
because these structures are superficial we can optimally image them by ultrasound we, because of dynamic examination we can move the various structures and see the relationships with uh, the masses or abnormalities of these structures and because uh, the ultrasound resolution of the high frequency probes is very good that's why we are able to observe fine architectural detail so whenever we do an ultrasound for a particular structure we have to know the underlying clinical history of the patient the examination findings or you the you do your clinical examination and ask the history to the patient which the orthopedic surgeon may not have asked so this helps us in target doing a targeted ultrasound examination to achieve the diagnosis so these are the various probes which we use this is the commonest one which we use which is around say 13 14 megahertz dropping down to around 7 8 megahertz wide footprint probe which is usually used for all the pathology uh, all the pathologies where you scan the bigger body parts like the shoulder calf ankle then these are the small footprint probes which we use for fingers and the places where the bigger probes don't fit and then we use these convex probes especially when we do guided interventions in deep seated joints like the hip joint or the shoulder joint where the patient's body part is quite thick the patient is huge and you cannot uh, penetrate that much up to the joint so that's why the convex probes are used but for diagnostic purposes the linear free, uh, the linear probes are used and uh, the convex probes are not used because you get various artifacts so now we start uh, right from the basics how we see various structures on sonography and then we identify pathologies of these various structures so you scan with a transducer which is 7 to 15 megahertz and with in in every machine you have you can drop or increase the frequency to the to the maximum or drop it to the minimum you typically use the default factory preset which is the musculoskeletal one or you can make your own preset either smoother for a smoother or a coarser image whichever way you are comfortable and obviously the focal zone which you have to put it at the structure which you are imaging and whenever you are uh, imaging small structures like the fingers or the wrist you have to magnify your image so that it fits up the fits up the screen and the lower two thirds or one th uh, half of the screen is not blank all structures imaged in short and long axis done with dynamic testing uh, given with extended field of views images and a contralateral comparison is the must so this is how an extended field of image uh, ex uh, field of view image looks where you are sc uh, scanning the posterior aspect of the shoulder you show the infraspinatus muscle with the muscle tendon junction and the tendon going and inserting on the greater tuberosity when you do a contralateral comparison <coughs> for example in this you are seeing an intact cuff on the left in the left shoulder whereas an absent cuff in the right shoulder because of a full thickness supraspinatus tear involving the full width of the tendon with a retraction under the acromion so this is the deltoid muscle lying on the naked tuberosity and here you see the cuff with the de uh, deltoid muscle on top of it so now we start with how a tendon appears on sonography tendon is basically a compact structure which is ecogenic a bright structure which is arising from a bone or inserting on a bone which you can identify and you can see this is the tendo occlus which is ecogenic in the short axis sorry in the long axis you can see nice bright fibrils of the tendon which is coming and inserting on the bone so this is the enthesis and when you do this dynamic examination you can actually see the tendon uh, on flexion and extension of the ankle you can see the tendon movements that's the muscle which is lying underneath the tendon that is the flexor hallucis longus and that's the soleus inserting on the uh, tendo achilles so this is how a muscle tendon junction appears and as the tendon goes higher and higher up up to the muscle belly the tendon thins out so that's the area where the muscle fibers insert through the aponeurosis into the tendon then when you have the when you are scanning the tendons especially where the tendons are curving and are not at right angles to the probe you see these artifacts where the tendon appears hypoechoic at the places where the angle is uh, the probe is not at right angles at right angles and the tendon appears ecogenic 
so these are the areas where you have to keep in mind that these are artifacts and they are not any abnormal areas so tendon is the echogenic part compact now the proximal portion of the tendon is your skeletal muscle so each skeletal muscle is a hypoechoic structure and you see the entire bulk of the muscle along the periphery periphery of the muscle you have the fascia which is echogenic and underneath that is the echogenic epimysium then you have the muscle fiber bundles so each muscle fiber bundle is a hypoechoic structure which with intervening echogenic perimysium or the intermuscular septae and each hypoechoic muscle fiber bundle is consist of, consists of multiple microscopic muscle fibers so this is the entire muscle of medial uh, lateral head of gastrocnemius you see the uh, epimysium or the deep fascia on top of it and then you have the intermuscular facial plane here and uh, in between the soleus and the gastrocnemius so when you are dealing with muscle injuries or you are scanning muscles you have to especially keep uh, be alert and uh, scan these facial uh, facial areas along the periphery of the muscles where you can get a clue about the muscle injuries so this is how a tendon appears which is coming and inserting on the bone that's the soleus which is hypoechoic as compared to the tendon and this is the muscle tendon junction of the flexor hallucis longus along the posterior ankle where you see the tendon which is forming within the substance of the muscle <coughs> then we come to ligaments how does a ligament look or how to image ligaments when you are doing an ultrasound you have to know, understand the anatomy of the area first which ligament you are identifying you read about that ligament first which is connecting various uh, dif uh, different two bones and then you keep the suppose if you are scanning the tail anterior talofibular ligament you know that it's joining the fibula and the talus along the lateral aspect of the ankle so you keep the probe along the long axis of the ligament exactly joining the two bones as you see here and then you see this echogenic fibers of the ligament so ligament again can show anisotropy depending upon how you image it so we have to see it, uh, image it at right angles and then you do this dynamic examination of pulling the other bone away and you see the intactness of the ligament there with the joint space widening a little as you stretch the ligament but yes if the ligament is discontinuous the joint space will be mo widened more and you will see the discontinuity of the ligament fibers and then you can differentiate whether whether it's a partial tear or a full tear of the ligament then we come to bone and cartilage now this is a scan done at the base of the left middle finger and you can appreciate that this is the joint metacarpophalangeal joint and what you see here is the hypoechoic hyaline cartilage on top or the head at the head of the metacarpal and you see the echogenic fibrocartilage of the volar plate which is located along the anterior aspect of the mcp joint and that's the tendon which is moving on top of the joint when you flex and extend the finger so when we see for arthritis or synovitis what we are seeing is we are seeing for any joint effusions synovitis which is hypoechoic tissue we are seeing for cartilage erosions or bony erosions then we come to bursae bursae are thin hypoechoic structures located between the layers of fat and this is one such typical bursa the subacromial subdeltoid bursa which is this thin line which you can appreciate between the layers of fat over the supraspinatus then a peripheral nerve how does a peripheral nerve appear on sonography peripheral nerve appears on sonography in short axis as a cable like appearance where there are multiple black dots or like a honeycomb where each black dot is a nerve fascicle each nerve fascicle contains multiple nerve fibers and you can see the intervening echogenic area which is nothing but the perineurium and the entire nerve is covered by the layer of loose areolar tissue which is the epineurium so this is your sciatic nerve in the thigh 
and you can see the nerves always run along the intermuscular fat plane. So they are very easy to identify on sonography. One has to trace the nerve in the short axis and then wherever you want to see the nerve in the long axis, you can turn your transducer 90 degrees. So a nerve is somewhere in between a tendon and the muscle. The muscle is the most dark. Then your slightly brighter is your nerve, which has a cable-like appearance. And then you have your tendon, which is completely bright and shows a fibrillar appearance. Now let's go to pathologies. So we start with a normal tendon first. That's how a normal tendo occults will appear on dynamic examination. The muscle tendon junction somewhere above the ankle of the soleus with the inserting on the anterior surface of tendo occults. And then you do your flexion extension maneuver to see for the tendon. So this is how a healthy tendon and a muscle will appear. Now, whenever a person comes with pain along the posterior ankle or some bump or lump felt along the tendo occults by the surgeon, he will send for an ultrasound. And when you see this bump, you can actually see that the tendon is hypoechoic, it's enlarged here, it is showing a calcific density there, and then suddenly the tendon thins out, and then you have the tendon inserting on the calcaneum at the enthesis. So there is something wrong happening to the tendon here, so you feel that there is definitely a reduced thickness, so you are thinking of a tear, you think of a partial tear, and then you are... Uh, having a doubt whether this Kager's fat pad underneath the tendon is herniating in between the ruptured tendon fragments. You want to confirm it that it is a full thickness or a partial thickness tear and then you do a dynamic examination by doing this and what you see here is that the tendon fragments are actually separating from each other and that's a full thickness tendo tear with opposing tendon fragments and the Kager's fat pad herniating in between. Next case where what you are seeing here is the full thickness tear of the tendo occults. The proximal tendon has retracted higher up and you can see that wavy appearance. That's the complete gap between the tendon and the enthesis. And you can actually see that the Kager's fat pad is herniating there. There's hardly any tendon tissue there and you can see some fragments of the enthesophytes going into the proximal tendons. Then you have cases where the tendon is intact, but is enlarged and painful just above its insertion. So here you see the enlargement of the tendon, diffuse, which is like a diffuse fusiform enlargement. You see an area of calcification there along the anterior fibers, and the tendon shows intrasubstance vascularity, which is abnormal. This is how a normal tendon looks and that's the comparative abnormal tendon on the abnormal side, which is painful. So a normal tendon will never show vascularity like this. So whenever you see vascularity in the tendon, that means that indicates that there is some neovascularity which is going on, which is secondary to an inflammatory change, a recovering inflammatory change, and this is quite painful. So this is a degenerative change within the tendon, which is all called tendinopathy or tendinosis. And in this, the tendon gets weakened. And if it's not treated adequately, then it can lead to a tear subsequently. This is a, a little later stage where the tendon degenerates even further, shows two fusiform enlargements of tendinosis, one above the calcaneum and other slightly higher up in the calf. And you can see these oblique tears in the short axis. Then in certain tendons, we develop calcific deposits, which are like a degenerative change, which incites uh, inflammation within the tendon and around the tendon. And these are quite painful. They are very common in the rotator cuff. And you can see this is the infraspinatus tendon, which is inserting on the greater tuberosity. That's the glenohumeral recess with the posterior labrum there, and you can see the calcific de deposit there within the tendon substance. Now you can see actually there are some movements of the ecogenic material which is there, which you can see here. You see the other video and you can actually appreciate that this is a deposit which is semi-solid. It's not that typical hard mature calcification which, is, which you'll see in the next slide. And you can see some movements of the calcification here, which is like the toothpaste-like material. So these increase the pressure within the tendon, giving rise to pain. And 
sudden onset pain within the calcium. So you can see that movement there. So these calcifications are easier to do a barbotage and aspirate, which may do, which we may do sometime in future when we do intervention talk. This is another uh, case where you see the mature calcification in the supraspinatus. These calcifications are typically not that painful, but yes, when you have such a chunky calcification in the supraspinatus, you can have a problem of impingement where the patient will be, the abduction will be limited because this calcification goes and hits the undersurface of the acromion. Then you can have anterior impingements because of calcific deposits in the subscapularis. That's the subscapularis the tendon inserting on the lesser tuberosity. And this is the coracoid process. You see the calcific deposit impinging on the coracoid there and giving rise to pain to the patient. So calcific, uh, calcifications anywhere in the body can give rise to acute onset pain where there is no history of trauma and such cases where the patient developed sudden onset sharp pain after uh, one uh, overnight after getting up in the morning without any trauma, especially in uh, shoulder cases, rotator cuffs, you should think of calcifications first. Then you have another uh, commonest tendon pathologies, what we call as tenosynovitis. What is tenosynovitis? The tendons which are covered by synovial sheath, for example, the tendons along the extensor aspect of the wrist or anywhere else in the body, the hypoechoic synovial tissue develops around these tendons, gives rise to swelling, movement restriction, and pain. So these typically sometimes show increased vascularity on Doppler if it's an acute phase of inflammation or subacute phase, chronic phases, you don't see vascularity, but there is pain and movement restriction. So once the sinovectomy is done, the tendons are free and the patient is able to do good movements. So when you do a sonography, you are telling the surgeon that yes, it's not a ganglion, which is a cystic lesion, but it's a sinovitis. You differentiate that it's a sinovitis from a ganglion and you give the correct diagnosis to the patient. Another case of synovitis in cases of rheumatoid arthritis where you see the synovial panis going all from the, uh, in the radial bursa from the distal forearm up to the uh, flexor pollicis longus insertion in the thumb. You see these rise bodies and the fluctuating fluid going from the distal forearm up to the insertion. Then we come to muscle pathologies. Typically, muscle pathologies, we see muscle injuries. And for muscle injuries, there are various classifications which have gone right from 1962 onwards till date. But the commonly used classification is the Munich consensus, which is very important. And in this, what we see is anything where there is a muscle fiber tear, we start from grade three onwards. onwards. So we differentiate on the basis of this classification that yes, there is a partial tear of the muscle fibers or there is a complete tear of the entire width of the muscle with retraction. Or sometimes when there is a contusion, direct injury to the muscle, we see for any intramuscular hematomas. So examples are, this is a grade one injury where the tendon fiber disruption is not there, but because of the intervening hemorrhage around the muscle fibers, you can actually see that there is a lumpish feel with pain at that particular side, which is not there on the opposite side. And this was a grade one strain injury in the mid thigh, right mid thigh of a footballer. If it's a severe injury, then you will see tear of muscle fibers with the intramuscular hematoma. So now this is because this is a partial tear, the rest of the fibers on top are intact, but you can see an intramuscular hematoma with retraction of these fibers. That's the proximal stump and that's the distal stump with an intramuscular hematoma. So this is like a grade two injury where the muscle fiber, uh, the, the entire muscle fiber, muscle is not retracted. Then again, another grade two injury where you have injuries at the myoaponeurotic junctions. Like for example, this is the lateral head of gastronomius inserting on the tendo achilles where again the soleus is coming and inserting. So this is the muscle aponeurosis and the tendon. So this is the myoaponeurotic junction and this is the myotendinous junction. So this is a tear happening at the myotendinous junction, but it is extending proximally slightly into the myoaponeurotic junction as well. So when these tears are on the uh, tears are severe, you can actually see the uh, muscle fibers which are 
undergoing a tear at the muscle tendon junction as well as a as the as well as at the myoaponeurotic junction so the aponeurosis extends proximally between the soleus and the gastrocnemius so depending upon the tear you have to describe the tear this is a grade 2 injury which typically heals with uh, a conservative management and you see the hematomas extending underneath the muscle then in grade 3 injuries you have complete detachments of the muscle fibers from the origin or from the insertion and you can actually see here the adductor origin injury where the entire adductor longus has undergone a complete retraction with a hematoma large hematoma forming in the groin there then when you have muscle pains muscle lumps these are very common occurrences which happen in our country the cystic circus cysts and here you typically see the scolex along with the cyst and because of the inflammatory change around the cyst you see uh, you have the patient has severe pain in ligament pathologies always happens because of a sprain or altered biomechanics leading to the underlying structures getting impinged so in cases where trigger fingers in case of trigger fingers you typically have the thickening of the a1 pulley which is a ligament at the mcp joint keeping the tendon flexor tendons in place so when the ligament thickens the because of the tendon getting rubbed underneath the pulley you uh, the tendons develop an inflammatory nodule there just proximal to the pulley which undergoes locking and unlocking on flexion and extension so this is how a normal tendon is there in the finger and that's the a1 pulley at the metacarpophalangeal joint and various respective pulleys when we scan the finger in the short axis so you can see this thin black structure is your a1 pulley and that's the flexor tendon going smoothly underneath the pulley now what happens when there is a pulley thickening see the normal pulley per, first it's 0.3 mm in thickness normal pulley see the abnormal pulley you see the thickness is almost 3 3 times it's 1.3 mm and you see the fluid distally in the flexor sheath you do a dynamic examination and see that the deeper tendon is moving properly but the proximal tendon is kind of getting stuck there so this is what typically happens in triggering because of the tendon getting inflamed forming a nodule there underneath the pulley and that nodule undergoes locking and unlocking because of the tendinosis and distally because of the inflammation of the flexor sheath you get a distal tenosynovitis hence the fluid in the sheath distally so in such cases you either if if the problem is mild if the pain is mild if it's uh if the patient doesn't want to get operated you can do a steroid injection under ultrasound guidance in the sheath or during pulley release this is how the pulley appears thick pulley and this is how they do a pulley release and on table the per person gets a nice movement of that particular digit in cases of sprains like ankle sprains typically lateral ankle sprains you get the, the patient develops a swelling around the area, uh, that particular area and what you see here is that the ligament is and has undergone significantly thickened it is showing a hypoechoic appearance but it is continuous as compared to the opposite side normal side where you see a nice proper echogenic ligament so this is a partial tear of the ligament with continuity maintained and this needs conservative management same case calcaneofibular ligament is also involved normal calcaneofibular ligament which is normal then you have tears of the ligament this for example this is the normal ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb when you scan along the thumb base and this is the injury of the radio uh, ulnar collateral ligament where you can appreciate now this is the intact radial collateral ligament then you go along the dorsal aspect of the mcp joint of the thumb and you see the normal epl tendon there and then you come to the ulnar aspect and there you see the ulnar collateral ligament which has undergone a full thickness tear that's the distal fragment proximal fragment you see the gap and the joint space widening when you give that valgus stress 
but because both the fragments are underneath the adductor aponeurosis there this needs a conservative management it's not a stenous lesion because in stenous lesion this particular ligament will retract on top of the adductor aponeurosis so we have to diagnose ligament tears in this fashion and tell the surgeon whether they need a conservative management or a surgical intervention then in bursal pathologies like for example subacromial subdeltoid bursitis you get fluid in the subdeltoid bursa there the patient has difficulty in abduction so what you are doing what you are doing on ultrasound is you are confirming that there is a bursal pathology there is inflammation of the bursa which is why the movement restriction is there and the underlying rotator cuff tendon is intact so the surgeon has sent to the, this patient to you for a rotator cuff tear but you see that the rotator cuff uh, rotator cuff is intact but it's the bursal pathology or the inflammation of the bursa which is giving rise to this particular pain and movement restriction then we come to the joints so ultrasound is very good for inflammatory arthropathies especially for diagnosis follow up multiple follow ups so what you are doing is you are assessing the global inflammatory activity and structural damage so this is how a normal joints appear on sonography you don't see any fluid or hypoechoic synovial tissue over the joints and when you see something like that it is acute or subacute synovitis if you see vascularity increased vascularity lot of pain then it is an acute relapse acute on subacute synovitis or acute on chronic synovitis and you don't see any erosions along the bones which may have been missed on an x ray but yes in chronic cases you do see erosions of carpal bones and so uh, this chronic synovitis here which is not showing any vascularity so in uh, cases of follow ups after uh, doing therapies you can see this is on day 0 you see increased vascularity in the synovial panis but once the treatment happens post 3 months when you do a scan you see that the panis has significantly decreased in volume and the vascularity is low the patient is painless currently in cases of inflammatory arthropathies like the gouty gouty arthropathies you can actually see a gouty tophus in the knee joint of this patient with reactive synovitis the same which is confirmed on the mr examination then you have your crystal deposition disease where you have the cartilage uh, cartilage dep uh, crystal depositions in the cartilage appearing like a calcification and you see the vascularity in the synovium there coming to the facial pathologies for example you have this plantar fascia there which is thin normal thickness is around 3 mm but when you have pain you have to do a scan and see for the increased thickness of the plantar fascia there so this is typically more than 4 mm and it is painful in such cases we do ultrasound guided injections you can see the needle coming from there you can do the in plane approach and that's needle coming from there and injecting over the plantar fascia there so you can see that's the needle over the plantar fascia and this is the injection done over the plantar fascia you can see that's the dose of steroid which is released around the fascia so you can do this either from a short axis view or you can from the long axis view which we can do later on when we do the talk on interventions so this is how a facial pathology appears normal fascia is thin ecogenic abnormal fascia is hypoechoic thickened sometimes you can see facial tears then we come to nerves so in nerves a typical you have seen that the nerve shows a cable like appearance now this is the median nerve in the carpal tunnel and you can see the ecogenic flexors lying underneath it whenever a nerve goes through a narrow space it can get compressed and lead to those compression neuropathies carpal tunnel being the commonest so what happens is the nerve gets compressed in the distal portion of the tunnel and either the proximal portion or the distal portion of the nerve gets enlarged so we have to measure the cross sectional area here in the distal forearm cross sectional area here just proximal to the tunnel or within the proximal tunnel at the site of enlargement and another cross sectional area here distal to the tunnel now whenever 
the difference between the cross sectional area here and at the site of enlargement if it's more than 4 mm square then it is significant and then we call that there is some distal compression here so in this what here what we do is we do the flattening ratio where we measure the transverse diameter divided by the ap diameter and if it's more than 3 it is a significant compression that's like an ancillary sign and this is how we see the uh, the nerve getting compressed because of the flexor synovitis within the tunnel with proximal and distal enlargement and giving rise to carpal tunnel symptoms sometimes you may not get flexor synovitis there may not be any space occupying lesion but still still the nerve is compressed because of the biomechan biomechanics in the, the tunnel and the bulges which are seen proximally significant compression warrants a surgical decompression where they open up the entire tunnel and the nerve is allowed to breathe so this relieves the patient symptoms but before doing any carpal tunnel release the surgeon has to ask for a emg to confirm that there is functional delay and ultrasound tells us about the structural compression that is the compression of the median nerve within the tunnel and also rules out any flexor synovitis because if the surgeon does this procedure blindly without doing an ultrasound but doing an only an emg then what happens is if there is flexor synovitis within the tunnel he will miss out on it and then the patient won't be relieved of his symptoms completely so that's why an imaging is important in cases of carpal tunnel then in cases of nerve trauma this was like a footballer with a injury to the thigh uh, thigh and the knee and there were a lot of internal derangements cruciate ligament injuries on mr but the nerve injury was missed so ultrasound helps us in tracing the nerve in short axis in the short span of time and is better for nerve imaging as compared to an mr especially in nerve trauma and here you can see that this is the posterior tibial nerve that's the common peroneal nerve and you can see how the common peroneal nerve enlarges and shows a different kind of a dimension it's not a normal caliber you don't see the normal cable like appearance because the cables have undergone a tear but the nerve sheath is intact the continuity is maintained so this is like a stretching kind of an injury to the nerve where the uh, where the nerve will not recover and this patient will need a kind of a tendon transfer in the in the future so that's how a nerve injury is stretching kind of a nerve injury is seen on sonography so that's why it's very important to trace the nerve in the short axis and then turn the nerve at, uh, turn the probe at 90 degrees to see the stretching kind of this injury if the patient has a sharp object injury then you will see this is the normal uh, along the distal forearm this is the distal portion of the median nerve this is the proximal nerve which is normal but here you see that the nerve has undergone a complete tear with the uh, neuroma formation there and the nerve ends are opposed and you can also see a foreign body that the glass piece which is lying there and when you do uh, do a doppler you see the vascularity within the neuroma there and when you do a dynamic ultrasound is all about dynamic examination you see that's the normal nerve you see the cable like appearance there and when you see the distal nerve again you can see a cable like appearance but this is the place where the nerve is injured completely torn you see the glass piece there so the surgeon will have to shave off this neuroma remove this glass piece and do a end to end suturing of the nerve if the gap is more than 2 cm he has to take a sural nerve graft and do the nerve grafting there this was another case where there was a complete transection of the nerve this is like the acute injury where you actually see the proximal nerve that's the area where there is a complete transection of the nerve the surgeon has attempted a primary suturing but it's not successful and you see the distal stump located here so this is the gap between the two nerve segments where there is a complete transection then when you have these chronic inflammation uh, in, uh, in, uh, infectious diseases like this hansens what you are seeing is uh, thickened nerves for example this is the median nerve which is thickened in the carpal tunnel you see the thickened nerve proximally as well you see complete vascular destruction and you see the neuritis which is there with which where there is increased vascularity in doppler which is so typical of lepromatous leprosy so the nerve vascular destruction happens later on if, if the patient is not treated there will be abscesses which form within the 
areas of the nerve breakdown. So such nerves are biopsied, diagnosis is confirmed, and then they start on treatment. Sometimes if the, if the nerve is getting compressed within the tunnel or the area there, it has to be released. So then they do a decompression uh, surgery for the nerve so that the nerve can breathe and recover. Last few cases. Suppose if a patient comes to you with a lump like this, what, what information are you supposed to give to the surgeon? First of all, the size of the lump, the extent of the lump, which particular muscle is it involving? Is it in between the muscles or is it involving the muscles and the relationship of the structures that is the neurovascular bundle around the lump? So when you do keep the probe transverse there on the mid forearm, what you're seeing? You're seeing a hypoechoic, well-defined solid lesion. Most important is whenever you're telling the surgeon, you have to say that whether it's ill-defined or well-defined because that completely changes their uh, th uh, thought process if they have to operate if they are well defined they are very comfortable and this is a well, so this is a well defined solid lesion it is located between in the intermuscular fat uh, fat plane between the fcu muscle fdp muscle and the fds muscle you see the ulnar artery located along the deeper portion of the lesion you see the ulnar nerve along the medial border of the mass in next, you will see the in the long axis, you see the ulnar artery go coursing along the deeper portion. And you see the vascularity, which is not much significant. And then when you do a dynamic examination, proximal to distal in the short axis, you see the ulnar artery pulsating the nerve, the FCU, the FDP and the FC, FDS. And then you see how the nerves place the neurovascular bundle. That's the ulnar nerve going along the periphery but it's, it's maintaining the normal cable-like appearance. It's not getting destroyed. So it's like a nerve sheet tumor, which is arising from the sheath of the nerve, which was our diagnosis. On surgery, these are the images. So what you see here is, that's the ulnar artery going posteriorly along the mass. The ulnar nerve is separate and you can actually see that the nerve, the lesion is, the tumor is not arising from the main ulnar nerve trunk, but it's arising from the branch of the ulnar nerve trunk. So this was a schwannoma and it was arising from the branch of the ulnar nerve. Last but not the least, ultrasound guidance for injections. We you typically use this in-plane approach where you have to see the needle, the entire length of the needle along with the needle tip going at the target site. And this is a subacromial injection where you see the deltoid muscle, the supraspinatus tendon inserting on the greater tuberosity. This is the subdeltoid bursa. And there you see the needle coming in the plane. And you see the tip of the needle going exactly at the place where you want to go. Then you release a inject half an ml or one ml and see if you're at the correct space in the correct spot. And then you do your rest of the complete injection when the entire bursa will distend. So this is how you do your injections accurately with by using ultrasound guidance. That's the glenohumeral recess injection, the glenoid, the posterior humeral head, and that's the needle coming along the long axis of the probe the needle tip going into the joint there underneath the infraspinatus, that's the posterior labrum. You don't have to inject within the substance of the labrum, you have to inject within the joint. And when you are in position, you can inject and you can see that this particular joint capsule, you can see the needle, you move the needle first and then you inject and you can see the nice distension of the joint later on. See now the joint is distending, the capsule is distending, the labrum is stationary. So you know that you are in the joint space. So this is how you do an injection where you first release a small dose after confirming your needle tip and then release the dose. If, if you don't see your needle tip, you are not supposed to inject. Similarly, we can do tendon sheath injections. This is like an impingement which happens in DQ1 stenosynovitis. You see the thickened extensor retinaculum over the radial aspect of the wrist and 
the patient is not able to do this particular bending this the deviation of the wrist under words it's very painful you see the thick retinaculum there and you inject in the short axis and when you inject it you actually see the fluid around it and you see this movement here see how much badly it's impinging and it's painful you see restricted movements once immediately after the injection you see the movement of the tendon how free it has become you actually when you're injecting you can feel that pop sound where the sheet distends and the patient gets a lot of relief so now you see this particular movement how smooth it is and this how restricted it is and painful it is so this is how you give relief to the patient which usually extends for a longer term depending upon how the patient takes it so summarizing the most important thing is to know your anatomy first if you know and uh, if you don't know your anatomy you have to open your book read the anatomy examine that part do a targeted examination and once you have achieved your diagnosis you can talk to your surgeon and discuss uh, discuss about the case so that even if you want to do some extended uh, uh, extended examination further you can keep the patient there do extended examination and give all the possible information which the surgeon wants so this is how you can develop your uh musculoskeletal ultrasound practice and obviously things like dynamic examination contralateral comparison are most important and they will give you clues to come to a diagnosis and the most important thing which ultrasound gives us is a guidance to intervention thank you very much for your attention thank you sir for that informative session it was great to have you thank you thank you very much thank you I would now like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Mohit Shah. Sir practices at Abhipraya Center for Advanced Ultrasound and Seven Hills Hospital, and has been imparting training through various CME programs and delivering lectures as faculty at various state, national, and international conferences. And Sir will be speaking on basics of Doppler ultrasound, NT scan, and renal Doppler. We welcome you, Sir, to our webinar. Good afternoon, on a Sunday afternoon, and um, you know, post lunch is a time when you really need to, your brain needs to relax. But I'm going to make you think, in because all these three talks are extremely important, and more important is this talk, which actually tells you about the basics of how you want to analyze a Doppler waveform. If you understand this. You will understand Doppler, and you will understand the terminologies that we use to analyze and interpret a Doppler waveform. So, a spectrum basically, when you say a, a Doppler, there are two types. One is a color Doppler, and the other is a spectral Doppler. So, color Doppler, uh, you get a box when you switch on the color button, and that box gives you a global information, and it tells you everything that is included in the box. But it tells you only two aspects of that blood supply. First, is it present? So, is there a blood supply? And second, what is the direction of the flow? If you switch on the spectrum, the pulse Doppler, it's an entirely different thing from color because it examines flow only at one side, but it gives you a detailed analysis of distribution of flow. It provides you physiological information in the form of hemodynamics and quantitative flow information. This is necessary to calculate velocity and indices. So we analyze the physiology by spectrum and the pickup of color and the color direction by using a color button. So when you use the pulse Doppler, it is an analysis of Doppler shifts versus time. So basically velocity is plotted against time for all that practical purposes. So when you say Doppler shifts, the machine calculates it into velocity. So all practical purpose it is velocity is plotted against time. But before we proceed further, this is important to know the Doppler equation because it uh, tells you what structures is going to eventually uh, determine the Doppler shifts. So when you say, I want a good Doppler shifts, practically means I want to see the flow better. So the better the flow, the better will be my appreciation of the pathology. And hence, Doppler 
equation is a must to understand. So Doppler frequency depends on a numerator. The denominator is constant, so forget the denominator. The numerator is two times transmitted frequency multiplied by velocities multiplied by the cos of theta. The theta is an angle in which the ultrasound hits the moving RBCs. Now, that means it is dependent on the transmitted frequency, the velocity at which blood is flowing, and the cos of angle. So, if these are directly related, that means the Doppler shift will increase if I increase the transmitted frequency. And I will increase the transmitted frequency by switching on to a linear transducer, high frequency transducer. So therefore, when you're looking at superficial structures like carotid and all, if you switch on a high frequency transducer, you realize that you see flow better because you're directly increasing the Doppler frequencies by switching on to higher frequencies. Similarly, flow is better seen when the vessel carrying the flow has higher velocities. For example, if you see flow in the carotid in a much better way than you would see in a jugular because the jugular has a lower velocity. And similarly, cos of theta, cos of the angle of insinuation. So the cos of zero is one, but cos of 90 is zero. That means the more parallel you are to the flow, the better will be the color pickup. But if you are perpendicular to the flow, you will see absolutely no pickup. So therefore, when you're, whenever your beam is directly perpendicular to the vessel, at that point in time, you will see zero flow. There will be no flow in that vessel because your cos of 90 is zero and anything multiplied by zero uh, becomes zero. So the size of the Doppler signal is dependent on velocities, and frequency and the angle of insonation. Now, remember that though we know the higher velocities give better Doppler shifts, but at times we know that if we need to identify a deeper structure, it's always a compromise between a frequency and penetration. Higher frequencies don't give adequate penetrations. Lower frequencies don't give so much of Doppler shifts. So ultimately, when you want to look at uh, say, for example, a distal uh, superficial femoral artery, uh, artery in a very obese patient, your high frequency probe may not yield the Doppler signal simply because it is the artery is too deep for it to interpret it. In that case, you have to compromise on the Doppler signal by switching on to a curvilinear or a lower frequency transducer. So remember that. Uh, the choice of frequency is always a compromise between better sensitivity to flow or better penetration. So the Doppler waveform basically tells you about the versatility of the waveform and the flow at that point, which is in turn related to the cardiac event. So if the heart is functioning normally, we see this kind of waveforms. But if the heart is if has a poor ejection fraction, Again, that would be reflected in the spectral waveform. So it is entirely dependent on the cardiac events. Uh, there is this uh, uh, technique called fast Fourier transformation, where, which actually analyzes the moving RBCs in the blood and actually converts it into dots, which are then plotted on your monitor in the form of a spectral waveform. So the spectral waveform is plotted by actually measuring the mean velocities of the moving RVCs. So when I say that the disease, the other, the vessel is undiseased, then it has a laminar flow pattern in the sense flow in the center is moving faster than in the periphery. So as you move from the center to the periphery, you will have a a group of RBCs moving at a constant speed. So from center to periphery, it may be 100, 90, 80, 70. So each mean of velocities, like 100, will form a dot on the uh, monitor. 90 will form a dot. 80 will form a dot. 70 will form a dot. So the lesser number of mean 
velocity boxes there the more crisper will be the waveform the more and the number of mean velocity ranges created there will be more dots on the waveform and therefore it will appear fuzzy so this is what i mean by the laminar flow in an undiseased artery the flow in the center is moving faster than in the periphery and therefore you will have lesser number of mean velocity boxes created which then makes the waveform extremely crisp you see it's a well marginated waveform you have a good systolic peak and one of the ways to know that the flow is quite regular and moving smoothly is to look at the space underneath the spectral trace this black space is called the spectral window so when the artery is undiseased and the flow is moving unhampered you will have an empty spectral window or a black um, area under the spectral trace however when <clears throat> rbc's encounter a plaque because <clears throat> they are moving with force secondary to the ejection fraction so once they <clears throat> strike the plaque they are dispersed and they are dispersed in all different angles so you have more number of bins created now see what was initially 190 80 70 moving out to the periphery now can have 120 110 and every velocity range like 90 91 92 more number of bins are created so the number of bins that are created actually reflect as dots on the spectral waveform so the more the turbulence the more the dispersion of the rbcs the more number of mean velocity ranges created more the dots on the uh, spectral waveform and therefore the spectral waveform appears quite fuzzy it is not well defined you see lot of dots there and the spectral window which otherwise should have reflected as a black area is now completely filled up this is what uh, uh, you mean by a turbulence now broadly when we talk of types of waveform we talk of three types high resistance medium resistance and low resistance so uh, again uh, a point to note is when we talk of resistance we are talking of peripheral resistance that is happening at the arterial capillary level between the arterioles and the venules at a capillary level <clears throat> in a normal artery it does not require flow throughout the cardiac cycle so the peripheral resistance is always maintained at a very high level and you have to understand the equation between peripheral resistance and diastolic flow so if the peripheral resistance is high the diastolic flow is reversed very low in fact you will see it on the other side of the waveform and therefore the extremity artery reveals a classical triphasic high resistance waveform you have tall narrow sharp systolic peaks absent but mostly reverse diastolic flow and this itself says that the because the peripheral resistance is high the diastolic flow is reverse and this indeed is a very important marker to exclude ischemia and the third peak is basically for the aortic valve to close so you have three phases in a high resistance flow the first forward systolic peak second is a early diastolic secondary to the increased peripheral resistance and the third is a reflection of the closed aortic wall during late diastole but sometimes when you have a diseased artery this was a normal triphasic flow in a normal artery as the artery gets more and more rigid the high resistance flow may not always be triphasic it can at times be biphasic now biphasic means you see first peak you see the second peak but you don't see the third peak so use the terminology is very correctly so you are seeing the first two phases makes it biphasic and this is due to acute vasoconstriction distal to the sampling site so if you have um, a biphasic flow you probably have an arterial constriction distally and that is what you need to watch for and if the artery is very badly atherosclerotic sometimes you can see this kind of monophasic flow 
you see only a single phase. You don't see the second and the third phase. But a point to notice, these phases are standalones. So you see the systolic peak standing alone. There's a gap between the two systolic peaks. And this is called a monophasic staccato waveform. Now, when I say monophasic, people generally assume it to be dampened monophasic, but that's entirely different from what I'm, I'm talking now. This is a monophasic staccato flow. And this happens when there's severe uh, arterial constriction proximal and distal to the sampling site, basically seen in bad atherosclerotic arteries. Moderate uh, resistance waveform is a combination, as the name suggests, between the high and the low. So like a high resistance waveform, it will have a tall and sharp systolic peak. But unlike a high resistance and more like a low resistance, it will have forward flow in diastole. Now forward flow in diastole means the diastolic flow is high. <clears throat> so when you say the diastolic flow is high, that means the peripheral resistance is lesser. So unless the peripheral resistance decreases, the diastolic flow does not increase. And therefore, you will have a forward flow in diastole, albeit with a catch here, that because this is moderate resistance, you will have a notch in the early diastole. And classically, the ECA, the external carotid, and the superior mesentic artery are classical signature waveforms of moderate resistance pattern. So here you have an ECA, which shows a tall, sharp systolic peak, a forward diastolic flow, but you see that there's a sharp notch. Here the SMA, sharp notch at the start of diastole. This is called a pre-diastolic notch before the diastolic flow. So you have a systolic and the diastolic flow on the same side of baseline. Now this is generally seen in low resistance circulation, but to differentiate it from a low resistance circulation, you have this classical pre-diastolic notch that makes it a moderate resistance waveform. And the classical examples or the only examples are the ECA and the SMA. Whereas the low resistance waveforms means you're entirely talking of decreased peripheral resistance. Now a word about diastolic flow. Diastolic flow means flow throughout cardiac diastole. So when, uh, for example, let's take renal arteries, placenta, umbilical arteries, internal carotid arteries. These structures supply to vital organs like the brain, the kidneys, the placenta. So at no point in time should their flow ever be zero. Okay. So therefore, their resistance bed is always maintained at a low resistance circulation. And because of that low resistance circulation, even when the heart is dilating, the flow in these organs is towards these organs to maintain organ perfusion. And therefore, you get a broad systolic peak and a forward flow throughout the cardiac cycle. And all the major organs or the vital organs will always have a low resistance waveform. So you will always have <clears throat> <clears throat> tall systolic peak but broader and a good forward diastolic flow. This flow from the end of systole to the beginning of next systole is a diastolic flow. So all low resistance circulation arteries will have a good forward diastolic flow which indirectly says that the resistance is low. So what happens when you have <clears throat> injuries, uh, or in a, uh, in a pathological conditions. So when you have <clears throat> um, an occlusion and you are sampling proximal to the occlusion, as I said, you will have a biphasic and a monophasic staccato flow, which indirectly talks of significant atherosclerotic changes. And you need to closely watch for any changes of occlusion. Times when there's an end artery which is occluded and you're just sampling just proximal to it. For example, this is an internal carotid artery and I see the flow there. There's a wall of thrombus there and I'm sampling it just proximal to the wall of thrombus. I will see a very dampened systolic peak and 
a reflected tiny wave and this is absolutely like a third when you see the audio signal it's a very minute third 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 that's called a pre occlusive thumb and this happens because a, a very faint systolic peak is reflected at the maximum arterial pressure and the flow goes strikes the wall and comes back and is reflected on the other side of the baseline so pre occlusive thumb is seen just proximal to complete occlusion of a walled off artery of a end artery <clears throat> so what happens at a stenosis we know that the velocity is increase and they have to increase because if the same number of rvcs have to pass through a narrow channel they have to increase their speed and this is directly proportional to the severity of luminal narrowing so more the luminal narrowing more is the stenosis <laughs> more is the increased velocities so i see two spectral cases here one of the right and the other of the left common iliac artery origins now iliac artery is also extremity arteries so traditionally they should be showing me a triphasic flow but what i see here is i see a monophasic pattern i see that the systolic peak is sharp but there is marked increase in velocities coming almost to 500 cm per second which is extremely high the waveform is not well demarcated there is too much of fuzziness of the waveform the systolic peak is obliterated so i know that there is turbulence <coughs> so increased velocities and turbulence makes it stenosis but a important parameter for me here to say is is it hemodynamically significant means is this kind of occlusion causing distal ischemia and i can say that purely on the basis of not being able to see the diastolic flow in fact i see a forward diastolic flow here that means tells me <clears throat> that the normal high resistance peripheral bed is now become low resistance peripheral bed secondary to vasodilatation there is a reflex vasodilatation because the distal tissues are begging for blood and therefore you i can with one spectral trace i can say that this is a hemodynamically significant stenosis and distally there has to be ischemia <coughs> so there is filling up of spectral window so that's what happens in cases of stenosis you see the normal renal artery <clears throat> very <clears throat> broad and the sharp systolic peak and uh, good forward diastolic flow and the fuzziness and the increased velocities in all of these cases normal ica ica stenosis normal sfa sfa stenosis <clears throat> post stenotic turbulence is seen for an area of maximum 1 cm beyond the point of the stenosis that happens uh, uh, as a white distorting image you can't make the head and tail of it you all you see is lot of shrill noise and lot of uh, sort of whiteness on the monitor without any proper diastolic or a systolic waveform and this happens because the blood is squeezed to a narrow channel and as soon as it comes out of stenosis the rbcs are thrown in all different direction into the larger vessel and therefore the, the more number of bins that get created because of different velocity ranges actually get reflected as dots onto the waveform and therefore it becomes more fuzzy but this is just seen 1 cm distal to the occlusion the more important changes that will tell us whether this signif that the stenosis is causing distal changes is when you actually look at the tardus parvus pattern so if there is a hemodynamic significant stenosis or if there is an occlusion and there is a distal collateral deformation if you see increase acceleration time that means that there is dampening of flow distally and what is acceleration time acceleration time is time taken from the start of systole to achieve peak systole so this is the acceleration time so when i say that the acceleration time gets prolonged distal to hemodynamically significant stenosis 
it means that my systole is peaking somewhere here. If my systole peaks somewhere here, my systolic peak does not is not sharply rising anymore. It becomes slanted. So slanted systolic peak, in fact, is a reflector of proximal occlusion or stenosis. And this happens because there is loss of kinetic energy as the blood flows through a tight area of stenosis and therefore overall the velocity becomes low. And distally, you have the capillaries which are begging for blood because of ischemia. And that ischemia causes the flex vasodilatation and the high resistance extremity peripheral resistance becomes a low resistance circulation, thereby increasing the diastolic flow. So you will have a tardus parvus waveform. Tardus means late or delayed with a slow systolic acceleration and parvus means of low amplitude very low velocity ranges with forward diastolic flow. So this is a hallmark of uh, a distal circulation, distal to hemodynamic stenosis or occlusion. And at times, the flow uh, loses its so much of its kinetic energy that it can also appear almost venous type of flow pattern. So that's uh, a kind of renal artery stenosis and the tardus powers in the distal circulation that tells you that the uh, uh, stenosis is hemodynamically significant and is causing severe dampening of flow. Now, this type of waveform is also called dampened monophasic waveform because the velocities are dampened and it is a monophasic flow because of higher diastolic flow. This should not be mistaken for a dampened staccato wave that I discussed previously. At times, changes of flow direction in collateral points to significant uh, changes in the arterial circulation. And therefore, let's just uh, scan through them. So when you have a subclavian steel, the first thing that you need to look for in carotid artery is you should have the same flow direction in the carotid as well as in the subclavian. If you have a different color flow direction, you know that you're dealing with a complete subclavian steel. And this usually occurs when there's a complete occlusion of the subclavian artery. So example here, you have an occlusion of the left subclavian artery. So the left vertebral artery shows reversal of flow, which supplies the rest of the hand arteries. And this is in turn provided by the contralateral vertebral circulation. So there's a complete vertebral reversal and therefore it's called a complete steel. In partial steel, you don't have the waveform completely on the other side of the baseline as you would expect in a complete steel. Rather, you would see a notch in the systolic peak. So at the maximum point of systole, you will see a nadir a depression there and depending on how depth how deep is the nadir you have type 1 type 2 is where it touches the systolic baseline type 3 is when it touches the actual baseline and type 4 is when it reverses the so type 3 and type 4 are called the funny bunny sign the point to note is unlike diastolic reversal this happens during or at the point of maximum systole and the physiology is that there is no complete occlusion there. There is probably a partial occlusion, stenosis of the uh, subclavian origin. And that means some amount of flow is going into the hand arteries, but that is not enough to keep it going. And therefore, the ipsilateral vertebral artery at the peak systole divides its flow. Some part of the flow goes to the brain, some part goes to the subclavian artery. And therefore, in the peak systolic, you will have a division there. And that describes or uh, matches the depression in the systolic waveform. So all of these waveforms are types of uh, partial subclavian steel. And when you see this kind of waveform in the vertebral arteries, you're supposed to go and look at the subclavian arteries to look for changes. So what happens when there's further increase in resistance, the systolic as well as the diastolic components decrease. This typically happens in compartment syndrome or cold stimulation test. The further increase in the higher resistance circulation will further dampen the systolic as well as the diastolic flow. 
uh, as opposed to uh, con in, uh, in inflammations and in ischemia, because this reflex vasodilatation, the higher resistance now becomes lower resistance, and therefore the systolic the systolic peak does not get altered, so the diastolic flow becomes higher, and therefore you see a forward diastolic flow, which will make you to think of distal ischemia. In moderate resistance, uh, some uh, like an ECA can actually almost look like an ICA. This is called internalization of ECA. And this happens because one branch, the middle meningeal artery, supplies the brain. So when the ICA gets occluded, the middle meningeal artery of the ECA dilates and starts replacing or sort of cross compensating for the loss of ICA and supplies the brain. In that cir circulation, the moderate resistance becomes a low resistance circulation. And at times, you have to actually try and do a temporal tap. Temporal tap is where you tap at the front of the tagus to tap the superficial temporal artery. And as you're altering the resistance there, it will be reflected as reflections in the diastolic component of the external carotid artery. Uh, low resistance circulation can become high resistance circulation uh, when you have uh, pathologies like uh, glomerulosclerosis, uh, which actually happens in diabetes, glomerulonephritis, where the glomeruli get compressed and the peripheral resistance increases. So as the peripheral resistance increases, the diastolic flow goes down and it can even be absent. And that itself is a very classical finding of medical renal disease, where the velocities remain the same, the systolic peak is sharp, the only thing that alters is the diastolic component and diastolic flow. And that is a true reflector of medical renal disease and severity depends on severity of disease. Um, these are again examples of uh, increased flow. Um, it's like uterine arteries are supposed to have a very uh, high diastolic flow because they supply the placenta. So if they start showing notching there, then it is a sign that the flow is inadequate and therefore these patients can land up with growth restrictions. So uh, I will not discuss the venous because it's really beyond the scope here. Let's come to aliasing. Aliasing is an um, ambiguous display of velocity which have excluded exceeded Nike. So every, we have this figure there, which tells us about the mean velocity at that setting in time. Suppose you have a 20 centimeters written here, but you are sampling a velocity uh, vessel, which has almost 100 centimeters per second. So in that case, what is going to happen is your waveform <coughs> will be inadequately represented on the given space and it will start coming from underneath the baseline. And therefore, this is called spectral aliasing. And to remove the spectral aliasing, you have to either increase the velocity range, take the basement down, or <clears throat> uh, then convert uh, from higher frequency to a, a lower resistance, a low operating frequency. So it's same as color aliasing. It's just that you need to know to like, uh, the spectral aliasing. So proper interpretation basically needs to understand the characteristics of the vessel, that is the signature of the vessel, and the physiologic status of circulation. Cardiac function, of course, needs to be taken in mind because if the ejection fraction is poor, the velocities are obviously going to poor, be poor. One of the cardinal mistakes that we do is the space that is given on the machine below uh, the image is meant to be filled up by the spectral trace. So here we have the same patient who actually has a normal triphasic flow and which is coming to about 100 centimeters per second if you see the velocity range there. But because we have kept the velocity range very high there, it looks foreshortened. And because it is so foreshortened, it looks like a dampened waveform with a biphasic flow pattern, which actually it not. So you can avoid most of the interpretation errors by actually making the waveform 
uh, by accommodating waveform in the given space. Um, I think that's that's uh, um, one aspect to it. So if I have to summarize, I let me summarize by saying that <clears throat> if you have changes in the systolic peak, then you're talking of a proximal event. If you have changes in the diastolic uh, flow, you're talking of a distal event. So if the systolic peak is slanted, there is plasma stenosis. In a high resistance circulation, if the diastolic flow comes on the same side of the systolic flow, that means there is distal ischemia. If you understand one Doppler image, you can interpret the entire physiological scenario of that limb. Okay, so that's about it. Uh, comes to uh, I come to renovascular hypertension. So if you have understood the physiology of flow here, this is what is going to be reflected in this lecture as well. So uh, renovascular hypertension and essential hypertension are two different entities. Renovascular hypertension is because of a renal cause. The cause lies in the renal vascular supply to the kidney and which accounts to almost 15% of all the hypertensive patients that you see. Whereas the essential hypertension constitutes the majority of hypertensive patients that we see. And very often um, these patients are incidentally picked up as small echogenic kidney and then are, refer are referred for color Doppler to exclude renal hypertension. The whole idea of excluding renal hypertension is because it is a correctable cause of hypertension. Unlike essential hypertension where patients are put on long-term hypertensives, if you identify renal artery stenosis and if you correct it, you can completely reverse the hypertension in the same uh, setting as that of an intervention procedure. So there are certain groups where you suspect these patients to have a renal cause for the hypertension. One is juveniles in the range of 16, 17. This is the range for aortoarthritis, where aortoarthritis is quite common as a cause for renovascular hypertension. And the other range is beyond 50, when these patients have atherosclerosis and therefore atherosclerotic related complications. Of course, all uh, the comorbidities exist, patients who are poorly controlled diabetic obese have a higher predisposition towards renal artery problems and therefore these become high risk patients. Hypertension which is severe, poorly controlled or rapidly worsening. Now that is a bad sign and therefore these patients need to exclude a renal artery stenosis in spite of hypertensive if they don't respond to it. If they have any other peripheral vascular or cerebral vascular disease then they have a higher chance of having renal vascular disease as well. And very often, you, these patients sense are uh, seen as unilateral left uh, small kidney. So a uh, Doppler has its advantages and disadvantages. The do Doppler, the best advantages is an excellent screening test. And there is a learning curve, but if you see, uh, uh, if you get used to it, it gives you a good depiction of the anatomy as well as the physiology of the renal vascular tree. There are basically two ways that people have done Dopplers, the direct and the indirect, and I'm going to discuss both and stress which is better here. So uh, never start the renal Doppler without looking at the aorta. So the aorta is extremely important to see the pulsatility. That's the pulsatility of the aorta, and this aorta has to be pulsatile like this throughout its length. So, if you do not see pulsatility, or if you see focal loss of pulsatility, then it is a sign that this is there is an uh, aortoarthritis. And aortoarthritis has a propensity to not only involve the aortic wall, but to also involve the origins of its branches. And therefore, any branch, in fact, can get involved and get stenosed. So you have to, in that case, assess all the branches of the aorta once you depict a loss of pulsatility of the aorta. Renal artery are seen from the aorta 
extending to the hilum and they have a very classical as I said depicted uh, sharp systolic peak and a good forward diastolic flow depicting a low resistance circulation. Intrarenal arteries have again the similar type of waveform. Sometimes they may show duplication of the systolic peak. That's okay. That's one of the features there. But again, interesting to notice that the diastolic flow is still forward depicting that this indeed is a low resistance circulation because it's a uh, vital organ. So when you switch on power Doppler, you can actually see flow going right up to the capsule. And that's an important feature to note that all the kidneys should have good flow reaching up to the capsule and that depicts a good normal vascular vascularity of the kidney. So we do that very often. Previously used to do with power settings, but now even the color is, uh, of all the machines are quite sensitive to depict slow flows reaching up to the capsule. And this sign, mind you, is very heartening or reassuring to know that the kidney, the perfusion of the kidney is extremely good. So we have various approach to see the renal artery. In thin patients, you can do the transverse approaches where you can see the aorta in transverse and see both the origins, uh, both the renal arteries originating from it. But this approach is slightly um, in a sense, um, inconvenient to take spectrum velocities because you have to adjust the angles. And this becomes slightly difficult to adjust the angles. So we prefer, traditionally, I would actually go in for the normal left lateral decubitus flow where I can see the entire artery coming towards us. So I can see the entire renal artery coming towards me. And this setting, and actually, if I switch on the color, my angle automatically gets adjusted. So whenever you got to measure accurate velocities, your angle correction has to be good. And it all depends on your angle. So if you angle it well, then your velocities would be accurate. If your angles are wrong, your velocities could be overestimated or underestimated. So do remember that angle correction has to be between zero and 60. And in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, left lateral decubitus view where the artery is naturally coming towards you, angle correction becomes easier. And therefore I prefer the left lateral decubitus as a favored position to look at the renal artery. And in fact, because it is coming from the aorta towards the kidney, it is completely seen in one go. And that's the advantage of doing it. An interrenal artery, uh, the technique is simple. You you see the kidney as you see in uh, a B mode when you're looking at a kidney in longitudinal section of the B mode and you switch on the color and you will see the three interrenal arteries, the upper, mid and lower. Now, what is important to know is that it is important to sample all the three interrenal arteries, but make sure that you sample them just after they have bifurcated from the main renal artery. If you sample it, further down towards the cortex in the lower arteries, then you are going to sort of naturally have some amount of dampening as the flow goes peripheral. So if you have to actually correctly characterize pathologies, you need to sample them as close to the bifurcation as possible and always sample three arteries. That's because you have not, very often you have normal variations to the arterial anatomy. For example, you can have an accessory upper polar artery and the main renal artery will supply the mid and the lower pole. And it could be that the accessory upper polar artery could be stenosed, but the main renal artery may not be. And how will you pick this up? You will pick this up because you will have a tardis parvus waveform in the upper polar segmental artery, whereas the mid and the lower pole segmental artery will have a normal flow. And that is the a sense of having, uh, you know, interrogating all three interrenal arteries. It could also be vice versa, where the accessory upper polar artery will show normal flow, but the mid and the lower segmental will show tardis powers, thereby saying that indeed it is the main renal artery which is stenosis. And this information is essential to correct the renovascular hypertension. And therefore, the moral of the story is always sample 
all three intradenal arteries just distal to the bifurcation. That is what you need to look at when you look at the intradenal arteries. <clears throat> so what are the signs of renal artery stenosis? Narrowing of flow channels. So when the flow channel becomes narrow, you have a lot of aliasing. Aliasing is when you see, start seeing color from the other side of the baseline. So in this red, you see a lot of blue and green. And that itself says that this indeed is a higher velocity turbulent flow that is uh, with flow channel uh, narrowing is a reflector of renal artery stenosis. And uh, at times when it is severe, you can actually have difficulty to demonstrate intrarenal flow. Uh, direct criteria of velocities are important to know. Uh, you have a range of 180 centimeters per second beyond which you call it renal artery stenosis. Or you can use renal artery to aorta ratio, which is more than 3.5. So if your renal artery velocities are 3.5 times the aortic velocities, then you're talking of a renal artery stenosis. These ratios are essential in comorbid patients who have poor ejection fractions. As I discussed in the previous lecture, this is reflective of the cardiac status. So if the patient already has a cardiac failure, his main velocity in the aorta is going to be low because of poor ejection fraction. So yet he may have a renal artery stenosis without having a, a, a PSV of 180 centimeters. That is because in these cases, we prefer to use the arterial velocity ratios, ratio of renal artery to the ratio of aortic velocities, more than 3.5. Even if your PSP is not above 180, you're still talking of a renal artery stenosis. So coming to classical conditions there, renovascular hypertension diagnosed by uh, focal flow channel narrowing, aliasing, uh, very high velocities, turbulent flow, lot of uh, disturbances in the systolic flow, systolic a spectral window is obliterated, very high velocities, and internal tardus spirals waveform. Very classical signs of hemodynamically significant renovascular uh, renal artery stenosis. And that's what's seen in the color image as well. And as you see, the flow in the kidney is much lesser than you would anticipate. And this happens because the flow is severely dampened at the stenosis level and the, uh, it does not go into the kidney as you would like to. So this uh, was a young patient who had a stenosis of the SMA origin and uh, there was a lot of post stenotic turbulence. And uh, renal artery. So this was, to no, this was, I'm sorry. This is not what is a very old slide. Uh, renal artery stenosis, a uh, direct way is a fantastic way to look at the entire artery, right from its origin to the hilum and the bifurcation into the renal system. The problem comes is uh, you need a learning curve to get the hang of getting that entire artery from the aorta to the hilum. And obesity and excessive gaseous distension make it all the more difficult. But over a period of time, I guess uh, the more you practice, the more you will get the hang of it. There are a lot of indirect parameters that we rely on, but the most important parameter that you discuss is the accession time. And this gets prolonged in cases of uh, proximal stenosis. So any flow in the distal circulation which shows an increased accession time automatically says that there is a proximal stenosis. So if you see the intrarenal arteries or segmental arteries, which show a tardus parous waveform, that is an indirect indicator that the main renal artery is already stenosed. So we have a acceleration time of 0 0.7 seconds, uh, milliseconds. So if you have more than that, then we are dealing with a tardus parous waveform. So to summarize, a normal artery should have a good forward systolic flow, a tall, sharp systolic peak, 
and a good forward diastolic flow. So that is going to make your RI lesser because the diastolic flow is high. So your RI will be low. At the point of stenosis, you will have a tall, sharp systolic peak, but the velocities will be high because there is a stenosis there. And depending on the degree of stenosis, your velocity will be accordingly higher. And because the diastolic flow also passes to the point of stenosis, it will also rise in proportion to the systolic velocities. And therefore, your RI remains the same. Distal to the stenosis, in the intrarenal segmental arteries, you will have a tardus parvus waveform because of loss of kinetic energy. So here we have a right MRA origin, which shows flow channel narrowing and aliasing with very high velocities and a classical tardus parvus waveform seen even at the hilum. At times, however, you can see that in this case, the renal artery is not seen at all. You might see one or two flows in the uh, kidney. And if you sample that, you will get a pulsatile kind of waveform. Now, this is seen when there is a complete occlusion of the renal artery. So when you have a complete occlusion of the renal artery, few flows that you see are actually dilated veins and that reflect the right atrial pressure. And when you sample them, you get a pulsatile waveform. That is an indirect indicator that the renal artery on that side is completely occluded. So if you go to see indirect assessment, that is assessment only of the intrarenal arteries is easier. It is less time consuming. And if it shows a tardus parvus waveform, you can be sure of a stenosis. But the problem comes is, if you are looking only at the intrarenal arteries, then even if there's a stenosis, you don't know what level the stenosis is. Is it at the uh, mid portion? Is it at the renal artery origin? What is the cause? Is it autoarthritis? Is there atherosclerosis? Is there fibromuscular dysplasia? Is the aorta the cause? Because if, if you see that bilateral intrarenal vessels are showing uh, severe tardus powers, that means it all doesn't always mean that there's bilateral renal artery stenosis. It could be bilateral artery stenosis, but secondly to an aortic problem like aortoarthritis. So site and nature of disease cannot be predicted. 50% of the renal artery stenosis uh, cases will be missed because your uh, if you have a hemodynamic significant stenosis, generally it is considered 60 to 70% diameter reduction. So if you have a 50% diameter reduction, that fellow will still have a renal artery stenosis or renal vascular hypertension, but still it may not be hemodynamically significant. And therefore, we insist that to avoid all of this, you should always rely on the direct method where you can actually look at the, intrarenal, uh, the, the entire artery from start to the end. Now, this was a case of aorto arthritis where you can see that the SMA shows stenosis, the left main artery artery shows stenosis, the right has two arteries, one uh, which supplies the upper pole shows tardus powers, whereas the mid lower pole is normal. And therefore, putting all together, this is a classical case of aorto arthritis. Sometimes in bad atherosclerosis where you have significant aortic narrowing, you can have segmental stenosis of uh, one of the segmental arteries, and that can also lead to an hypertension. So in medical renal disease, uh, as I said, there is increased peripheral resistance in a low resistance circulation. So the glomeruli get uh, narrowed by infiltrates, inflammatory, inflammatory in infiltrates, and that compresses the glomeruli, thereby increasing the peripheral resistance. So in a case of medical renal disease, you will find that the systolic peak is sharp. Okay, It is tall. The acceleration time is normal. The velocities are normal. The only thing that will change is the diastolic flow. So the diastolic flow will go on decreasing. And as the diastolic flow decreases, 
the RI index increases. So if your RI of 0.75 to 0.8 is a borderline and anything with more than 0.8 is definitive of a medical renal disease. And same is reflected when you switch on the slow flows color. Normally, as I said, you have to see the flow reaching up to the capsule of the kidney. But if you see that the flow does not reach up to the capsule and stop short, this sign is called peripheral cutoff of cortical perfusion. And this peripheral cutoff of cortical perfusion is a reflector of higher peripheral resistance and therefore this is a sign of medical renal disease. So sometimes depending on the severity, the diastolic flow can even be absent in the kidney. The same can be transiently seen in acute obstructive nephropathies where the kidneys increase in size, become echogenic and is reflected in higher creatinine levels at that point in time. But this is transient and you will eventually get over with it. Sometimes, however, you will find that you see the arterial waveform and it shows a good systolic peak. So the diastolic uh, flow is funny, like extending from one systolic peak to the other systolic peak. This is called a pan-diastolic reversal. So pan-diastolic reversal means reversal through the entire diastolic component of the uh, cardiac cycle is a hallmark of renal vein thrombosis, an acute renal vein thrombosis or a page kid kidney. That is a large subcapsular hematoma compressing the renal cortex. These two conditions cause acute um, pan-diastolic reversal of a renal artery waveform because there is inflow. There is renal arteries are patent, but the veins are absent to take the flow back and therefore throughout the cardiac diastole, the flow remains very high and that's a pan-diastolic reversal. The most important question that a clinician wants to know is, is renal vascular hypertension causing, uh, is renal artery stenosis causing renal vascular hypertension? And you've got to remember that normally the RI in the renal flow is low because of low resistance circulation. But when you have renal artery stenosis, the RI on that side drops further because that becomes a tardus power circulation. And therefore, you have a larger negative uh, uh, RI difference. And this is a sign that right, uh, the renal artery stenosis is the cause for renal vascular hypertension. If in fact, the RI on the side of the renal artery stenosis remains high, then it is a, it, this patient will not do well even with a renal stent or a, uh, angioplasty. So measuring the RI on the involved side is of extreme um, you know, clinical significance to the clinician to decide which patient will benefit with renovascular hypertension. And this is, as I said, Immediately reversible. So the moment you open up the stenosis, the, all the indirect parameters, like the tardus powers returns back to normal. The acceleration time returns back to normal. So returning back to normal is a better clinical response, but a failure to return to normal means a poor clinical response and these patients will not do well. Moreover, this is where Doppler comes into play because it serves as a new baseline to follow up or to detect recurrence. So stints are more commonly used because they have a better longevity versus angioplasty, which have a higher rate of restenosis. Angioplasty generally tend to restenose within the first five years. So people now prefer stents, but stents can also get uh, stenosis because of uh, poor anticoagulative therapy or just progression of bad atherosclerosis into the stent uh, um, uh, orifices and therefore causing these uh, stent stenosis. The commonest causes of uh, renovascular hypertension obviously is atherosclerosis, but you can in uh, middle-aged females also have fibromuscular dysplasia. You can have uh, aortoarthritis in the juveniles. So depending on the age and what you see, on uh, ultrasound, you can actually characterize the cause. So in this case, 
you see the IVC and you see the aorta, both should be cystic, but the aorta is more echogenic, and that is because there is an irregular narrowing by plaque disease, thereby saying this is atherosclerosis. Here you have a long segment, beaded appearance of the uh, proximal end of the renal artery, thereby saying that this is a fibromuscular dysplasia. This is a uniform, regular constriction of the aorta with renal artery st stenosis, thereby saying that this is a smooth narrowing of the aorta secondary to aorta arthritis. This is uh, a coarctation of aorta where uh, the aorta in the upper abdominal aorta itself shares a tardis powers waveform, thereby saying that there has to be a proximal occlusion. And there are only two causes of proximal occlusion like this, the coarctation of aorta and the interrupted aortic arch where the aortic arch beyond the subclavian is not formed. And therefore, the collaterals that open and drain into the aorta actually give a tardis powers waveform. So thank you again. I think I've finished in time. And I go to my last lecture now. On uh, nuclear scan. Now, I want to take nuclear scan in the uh, point of view that we need to do it properly because this is what the screening protocols say that the nuchal scan is essentially helpful to identify patients who have a risk for Down syndrome. Aneuploid is for most of our Down syndrome because Down's is one uh, syndrome which does not always get reflected on ultrasound. In the sense, uh, even when you do an anomaly scan, only 33% of uh, Down's baby can ever be show si some signs of ultrasound. 67% of Down's babies can have normal ultrasound scan. And therefore, it is tricky. And therefore, the screening should start in the uh, first trimester during the NT scan. And this is the person responsible for starting all of this. And we follow these protocols that you need to remember that apart from your knowledge, your machines are also helpful. And we can at times, uh, we should be rather using transvaginal uh, examinations to get better details. <clears throat> the whole idea <clears throat> started with how are you going to increase the detection rate of Down syndrome? <laughs> so we all know that beyond 35 years, the chances of Down syndrome increase. But then <clears throat> if we just take age into consideration, only 33% uh, prediction value is for Downs. That means if you go rely only on age criteria, you can predict Downs only by a 30% predictive value, which is poor. But if you do a good biochemistry, that is a double markers, that is <clears throat> maternal age with alpha fetoprotein with beta HCG <clears throat> and estradiol at 15, 16, it increases to 60. If you, in, if you do a good double marker screening of beta HCG and PAPE, you increase it by 60. But if you include all soft markers of ultrasound and you include <clears throat> the double markers and combine it in maternal age, you can <clears throat> predict Down syndrome up to 97% with a fall positive rate of 5%. What I mean to say is, so in today's times, what is important is to calculate <coughs> the nasal lucency in the most accurate way and combine all the soft markers of ultrasound and in it with the double marker study to increase the efficacy of screening method. So what we are trying to do here is we are trying to screen which patients fall into high risk category and the patients which fall into high risk category then need further investigation. But it is applied in a general population. So this is a statistical analysis. It may not always hold true that having a, a higher uh, risk does not mean that the patient will have downs. It just uh, you know screens patients and selects patients which are of, uh, supposed to have high risk so that these are the patients who can then be subjected to amniocentesis or CVS rather than applying amniocentesis or doing amniocentesis and all. 
we just screen patients of general population risk. That is a baseline risk. The baseline risk of the mother is a age-related risk. It is called a priori risk. And if you look at this figure, the a priori risk suddenly changes at 35. So it becomes 250. 250 is a cutoff from beyond which the risk keeps on increasing. So the lesser the figure, more the risk. So at 35, when the patient achieves 35, that's one landmark that we need to mention in, in while giving the blood for the double markers and while con computating the uh, nuchal scan as well. So normally the beta SCG decreases with gestation, but it always is high in trisomy 21. Similarly, the PAPE, that is the second uh, protein that we analyze in the double marker, normally increases with gestation, but is decreased in trisomy 21. And these are all reflected as multiple of median values, mom values. So when you look at the double marker report, you look at the mom values. So if the beta SAG is more than two moms, or if your PAPE is less than 0.5 mom, that is we've got a very high risk for trisomy 21. So higher beta SAG, lesser PAPE, higher the risk of trisomy 21. And remember that early biochemistry is the word. We, what we do in our center is we collect blood at 10 weeks and then call the patient between 12 and 13 weeks. That's the best sensitive time to do the, these tests. And then we combine the two tests to calculate the more accurate risk. So patients who have had previous uh, pregnancies with trisomy 21, they have a higher a priori risk. Remember that the uh, a priori risk is a baseline risk. So the baseline risk increases beyond 35 years, but it can be high if she has had a previous child with Downs, even if she is not 35. But if she has a previous history of Downs baby, her a priori risk increases. And these are the factors that need to be factored when you actually calculate the risk in, um, in such cases. So uh, a good statutory warning is that you need to practice it the right way. If you have to do it, you have to have a proper accreditation to it. And that we follow the FMF guidelines. We are registered as FMF operators. And uh, you have to understand that there is a methodology to do it, to standardize uh, analysis of waveform. And this is where it matters the most because what patients come to us very often as high risk are actually improper measurements of nuclear translucencies, which actually overestimate the risk. And therefore, I advise each and every one to become FMF certified to do the uh, NT scan the right way. So the aims of nuclear scan is to date the pregnancy and most importantly, to diagnose major fetal abnormalities and assess the risk of Down syndrome. So why 11 weeks? Because severe sample is safer after 11 weeks, but you at 11 weeks, you will uh, see the earliest anomalies. For example, acrania, you will need at least 11 weeks to, uh, you know, very physiologically, uh, very confidently say that this indeed is a acrania. Physiological herniation ends by 12 weeks. Uh, unibladder is seen at this point in time. So all these parameters make... Uh, just about closer to 12 weeks an ideal site. And 14 weeks is a where you can option of first termination, termination uh, first trimester termination becomes easy. But more importantly, the accumulation of nuchal fluid is lesser beyond 14 to 18 weeks. So therefore, what you need to understand is to, if you have to uh, pick up increased nuchal translucency, it is before 14 weeks, you have better chance than picking it up later. Because beyond 14 weeks, even if the baby is chromosomally abnormal, there will be a, a absorption of the fluid uh, or the nuchal fluid, thereby making the diagnosis of increased lucency that much false negative. 14 weeks, uh, after 14 weeks also, the, the problem comes is the baby becomes vertical. As we will see, 
why we need a horizontal baby at 14 weeks a vertical baby poses a lot of problem to actually measure it the right way and we are going to look at uh, the nasal bone the nt the ductus venosus and the tricuspid regurgitations more important is to have a perfect measurement of crl because ideally we are supposed to do nt scans between CRL of 45 millimeter to 84 millimeter. But I generally prefer to do it somewhere in between because a CRL of 45 millimeters, the baby is very small. You may see the nasal bone, you may see the NT, but we prefer to do a lot uh, more than just looking at NT and NB. We go much more beyond it. We actually try and look at all the structures at this point in time and therefore somewhere around 65 is a good way where it, it is between 12 weeks five days is an ideal time to do the nt scan so for a correct crl measurement you have to have a good magnification the fetus should be filling up the entire screen it should be a mid sagittal section the profile should be very clearly seen the rum should be visualized there should be a neutral position of the fetus that means they should not be acutely bent there has to be some amount of amniotic fluid between the chin and the upper thorax and the fetus has to be perfectly horizontal that is the ultrasound beam has to be exactly 90 degrees to the fetus the crown should be very well seen the rump should be very well seen and the calipers have to be placed on the outer edges of the crown to learn in a straight line and that's what is extremely important and the fetus keeps moving so you wait for the fetus to come in its ideal position till you actually wait and take the CRL in the right section. This is important because you will be dating the pregnancy and all your subsequent measurements in the third trimester will be based on your CRL measurements done now. So if you have to calculate growth, you need to calculate the CRL perfectly at this point in time. NT is a fluid that is seen beyond the behind the neck. Now, when I say NT, I, uh, it is not restricted to the fluid surrounding the neck. Even if the fluid is enveloping the entire fetus, it is still called nuchal translucency. Even if it is septated, it is still called nuchal translucency. That's the terminology that we need to use that the NT, uh, the nuchal translucency is thickened. So it is seen as a clear gap of fluid between the two calipers, between the two echogenic lines that you will measure from inner to inner. You have to measure it in the right neutral position and a hyperextension or hyperflexion, both are going to overestimate or underestimate the NT value. And an NT is directly linked with aneuploidies. So when you have a value, you have nasal uh, nuchal translucency more than 95th percentile. So you also have to get used to this percentile substance. So fifth percentile and 95th percentile are the boundaries of your measurement. When I say 95th percentile, I'm talking about upper limit of normal. When I say fifth percentile, I'm talking about lower limit of normal. So when I say that NT is beyond the 95th percentile, is my, what I'm trying to say is if your NT is beyond the upper limit of normal that is thickened, you have a higher chance of uh, trisomy 21, 18, 13, Turner syndrome, and triploidies. So you got to remember that lucency is not always 21. It could be 18, it could be 13, it could even be Turner's. In fact, Turner's would have a much thicker NT, and it could also be triploidy. We also should remember that your normal nuchal translucency is in relation to your CRL. That means it grows with the CRL. So if I have to have a mean value and a 95th percentile at a CRL of 45 millimeter, it is 2.1 millimeter. So an NT of 2.1 millimeter or more at 45 millimeter is the 95th percentile is abnormal. Whereas in the upper limit of 84 millimeter, an NT of 2.7 millimeter or more is the 95th percentile and is abnormal. But if you have to take one figure, irrespective of the gestational age, it is 3.5 millimeters. So if your NT at any of the CRL 
between 45 to 84 is 3.5 millimeter or more it is abnormal okay so 3.5 millimeter is the 99th percentile and therefore it is definitely abnormal so there are ways that you measure the nt similar to your um, um, crl except that you have slightly more zooming there and it has to be in a neutral position there should be no gap uh, no, there should be a clear gap between the nasal bone and the maxilla and you can see that you see the intracranial contents well the brain stem then you see the intracranial transparency and you see two equigenic lines there the first equigenic line is the occipital bone the second equigenic line is the outer skin and in between that hypoechoic and echoic space is the nuchal translucency. So what we are interested is for the fetus to come in that perfect position where we get the perfect mid sagittal view and freeze it to get the right uh, nuchal translucency. And when you get that right section, you have to put your calipers on the inner aspects of the lucency and measure it at the maximum point. And this is extremely important. This is what is going to be computed by the software. And this computation is all multiplication. So if you measure it wrong, it gets multiplied. So any multiplication is going to further complicate or uh, sort of worsen the situation or worsen the risk. So remember to have a perfect section and a perfect way to measure the NT. It should be properly zoomed to, to measure the uh, to, till the upper torso, just about seeing the heart. It should be a proper mid satch section where you see the nasal bone and you see that there is a clear gap between the nasal bone and the palate. And you see that you see the midbrain, the thalami, the brain stem, the intracranial translucency, and then you, the cistern magna there. And then this, these two equigenic lines first is the uh, occipital bone and the second is the skin and in between lies the nuchal translucency on to on. So what is important is to note that if you are measure it in the right section and if you're certainly getting a value which is more than 95th percentile, then you know that this is definitely abnormal and this can be then integrated together with the double marker to calculate the exact risk to have further assessments. So you got to uh, understand that when you take the uh, FMF certification, it gives you a software to use. And if this software allows you to calculate the risk for um, the ultrasound risk for having an abnormality. So for example, in this patient, if I have a NT which is calculated and it comes about the 95th percentile, the software allows me to assess the risk for um, this baby on ultrasound. This is not even integrated with the blood yet, but even in ultrasound, it shows that it has got a very high risk. Now, this gives you two tables. First is the background risk and third, second is the adjusted risk. Background risk is the a priori risk. This is the risk that the mother has secondary to her age. <clears throat> so if you see that one, the mother is probably very young because her a priori risk for Downs is 1087. We know that at 35 years, it is 250. So it is 1087, it is probably she is in her 20s. But if I look at the figure there, then there is a nasal bone which is absent and the NT which is thickened, which automatically then increases the risk to 1 is to 50. 250 is a cutoff and it increases the risk to <clears throat> 1 is to 50. And that is extremely, extremely high. So this is an advantage right away. You know that the patient comes in a high risk category group. Then you combine it with the double markers and you can suggest karyotyping for these patients to detect trisomy 21. <clears throat> now, also a point that you should remember is that patients with thicker NT should not be terminated. That's the very wrong thing to do. They need to be worked up. Okay, you can work up these patients to find karyotype abnormalities, do a karyotyping. If karyotyping is normal, 
these patients still have a higher chance of cardiovascular defects or skeletal dysplasias. So you follow them till 20 weeks because you anyway have a margin of 20 weeks for termination, but do not terminate them right away. Simply looking at this table will tell you that though, <clears throat> see, the NT, <coughs> if the NT is less than 95th percentile, you just have a 0.2% chance of chromosomal abnormality. Between 95 and 95th, 3.7%. But once the NT increases beyond 19 percentile, that is beyond 3.5 millimeters, the risk of chromosomal abnormality increases exponentially. But a simple uh, calculation here will tell you that even if your NT is as high as 6.5 millimeter, only 64.5% can have a chromosomal defect. And even in this group, 15% can be alive and well. So it does not always necessarily mean that all thick NTs will have abnormalities. 15% of them can still be normal beyond an NT of 6.5 millimeter. And hence, these patients have to be advised and counseled for karyotyping and for subsequent scannings to exclude skeletal and cardiac malformation. We use the same protocol that we used for the, 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 the NT. I mean, fortunately, in one section, you see the nasal bone as you see it in the NT. We are supposed to treat three echogenic layers in the region of the nasal bone. The first one is a nasal tip. The second is an overlying skin. And the third one below it is a thicker one, which is a nasal bone. So these two kick together, the skin and the nasal bone form an equal to sign. And if you see two echogenic layers, then you know that there is no nasal bone. And a nasal bone can be absent in, again, uh, the chromosomally abnormal feti, more so almost 60% with trisomy 21. And therefore, it is a strong marker of aneuploidy that needs further evaluation. So if you have a thicker NT, and if you have an absent nasal bone, that further increases your risk for having a abnormal tie. So your software helps you analyze uh, situations in a much better way. This is, of course, not yet integrated with the double markers, but uh, this is just the ultrasound finding that you're seeing there. If this patient is a young primary who is 18 years and with a normal nasal bone there and a normal NT of 1.6 millimeters, my um, calculations here, see this background risk, that is the age-related risk is 1 is to 1, 1, 3, 1. But after I have done a good NT scan, her NT is normal and therefore her risk further decreases. If the value increases, the risk decreases. So from 1131, the, the value is now 4912. And it tells me that the myonuclear translucency comes at the mean between the 5th and the 50th percentile and therefore it is perfectly normal. And therefore the risk of trisomy 21 is extremely, extremely low. So this is an advantage of having software there. So you outrightly know that you're dealing with a low risk fetus there, which needs, of course, combination with a, a double marker. Uh, as opposed to it, you have a same young primary who is 18 years, but who has a higher NT there. Uh, so at that high NT, now when I computed the software, I know that the background risk is 1107, but because the NT is so exponentially high, much beyond the 95th percentile, the adjusted risk is now extremely high for 21 and 18. So from 1107, it is almost one in 10, and that is an astronomical figure that you need to take into consideration. And this obviously needs further investigation and uh, uh, probably a CVS or an amnio straight away. So having a software allows you to objectively categorize this uh, risk assessment and counsel the patients there and there 
rather than referring it to some specialist. You can do that too. And this is what my mean to say by showing you these figures today. Hyperspeed regurg is done with a hard facing up, apical four chamber, zoomed image. You have to have the gate wider and um, the gate should be placed across the tricuspid valve. The, you should increase the sweep, sweep, keep maybe five waveforms. Normally, you will see the E and the A wave as a small and a sharp upstroke. You will see, if you see a tricuspid regurg, normal minimal amount of tricuspid regurg is okay. But if you get a tricuspid regurg, which is more than 60 centimeters per second, it is definitely abnormal. And it usually suggests some cardiac abnormality or it could be just a normal phenomena. Isolated tricuspid regurg is of no significance, but if you see a tricuspid regurg, you need to follow up these patients to uh, in 16, 17 weeks to specifically look for any cardiac malformation. Ductus venosus flow <clears throat> is seen in a sagittal view where you have a low filter, smaller sample volume, and a high sweep speed. Sweep speed again should be high, and you will see that these are two waves, three waves, S wave, D wave, and the A wave. The A wave is what goes down. And the A wave should not be touching the baseline or going beyond. If the A wave is going beyond the baseline, that means there's, there's a pulsatile ductus venosus. And this again, in isolation doesn't mean anything, but if you have an NT, thick NT, or if you have an absent nasal bone with thick NT and a pulsatile ductus venosus, you could have an associated cardiac abnormality. So when you see a pulsatile ductus venosus, uh, you, you should be able to uh, follow these patients at 16 weeks and see that they don't have any obvious cardiac abnormality. So this is what you need to understand. So pulsatile ductus venosus um, can be seen in trisomy 21, but if you only if you have a thicker NT. Now, FHR uh, is not a very diagnostic criteria, but you got to remember that fetus with trisomy 13 have tachycardia. So if you get a very high FHR, it can point towards trisomy 13. But as I said, trisomy 13 has ghastly anomalies. You will have holoposin cephalis, you will have craniofacial malformations that will further substantiate your diagnosis. You need not rely entirely upon FHR, but it is one of the uh, marker that you incorporate into the software. So remember that if you have a very high velocities, then you are certainly worried of trisomy uh, 13. But FHR is also something which you got to remember that uh, at six weeks, the FHR hovers around 100 and between six to 10, it increases exponentially till about 180, 185, and then sort of stabilizes around 150 at the end of 14 weeks. So at 13 and 14, you generally have a, a 150 to 160 range for FHRs that you need to incorporate. Your software will tell you whether the FHR is coming within range or beyond the range for NT. Uh, uterine artery PI is extremely useful to identify patients with preeclampsia, early preeclampsia. Identification is important because these patients need to be followed very meticulously. If you identify a patient who is going to develop early preeclampsia beyond before 32 weeks, then you can monitor these patients more frequently. You can start them on blood thinners like aspirin, uh, you know, flexin, and monitor, monitor, monitor to prevent growth restriction. Or if you are still going to growth restriction, you still need to monitor till the point you can sustain the viability of that fetus. And therefore, picking up uterine artery PI at this point is extremely, extremely crucial. So preeclampsia basically um, is calculated not only on uterine artery PI, but uterine artery PI is extremely important. And you al calculate the uterine artery PI on the right uterine and the left uterine, and then add up to get the mean. So if you get the mean, you use the mean artery PI in all calculations. And for all practical purposes, a single cutoff of 2.35 is extremely useful to say that the mean artery PI is high. So if you have a mean artery uterine PI, which is more than 2.35 in the first trimester scan, it is definitely suggestive of a very high uterine PI. That 
will go into calculations. Now, if you remember that just by saying that the uterine PI high is high, you are not saying that this patient will definitely have uh, early preeclampsia. It's just about 30% accurate or based only on ultrasound. To increase the accuracy or to increase the positive predictive value, you have to again take into consideration a lot of other parameters like the baseline risk of the mother. If she is very obese, how is the mean arterial pressure? Is, uh, include the pap into the figure. And more importantly, we have now the placental growth factor that can be incorporated. So having incorporated all of these findings, you can increase the detection rate of early preeclampsia to almost 94%, to a 94% uh, you know, positive predictive value. And this is an important fact to remember that just by saying that uterine arteries have high PI doesn't make the patient completely vulnerable to preeclampsia is about 30-40% efficacy. You can still start the patient on aspirin, but more important is when you do a double marker on these patients, always include the previous risk of preeclampsia, maternal age, maternal weight, mean arterial pressure, and placental growth factor, and that will uh, positively tell you whether this patient has uh, a very high risk of preeclampsia or not. That is the single most uh, message that I want to give you. And it is always taken at the level of the internal loss. So measure the <clears throat> uh, uterines at the level of us. Don't measure it too beyond or too early. At the level of the internal loss, when you sweep the cervix to the right and the left, and you should have a very crisp waveform because you are, it's all automated by the machine. So at the level of the internal loss, just put a spectrum there, get a very crisp waveform, and that is going to tell you an accurate PI, and you add the team and take the mean, and that is the correct way of taking the mean artery PI. So even at the end of it, as I said, if you have an abnormal uh, lucency or an abno absent nasal bone, you do a karyotyping. If the karyotyping shows an abnormality, you can safely terminate the fetus. But if the karyotyping reveals no abnormality, you follow this patient at 16 weeks, do an early anomaly scan, do an early echo, do an infection screen for torch and parvo. If nothing is found here, still continue till 20 weeks. If you find major abnormalities there, then you do a termination. Otherwise, continue forward because the fetus is chromosomally absolutely normal and is likely to have a normal outcome. So thank you so very much. I, I, maybe it was just too fast, but I think I tried to cover all the pertinent points. Thank you so much, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, sir. That was a very informative session. And uh, we have a question for you in the Q&A section. So could you please kindly look into it and text and put your answer in the text box. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohit. Hi, right, thanks, dear. Uh, <laughs> Very nice session. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, see, the question is, uh, can nasal bone be seen at NT scan at 13 weeks and absent in anomaly scan? This is never possible. Because uh, you got to understand that, I, as I said, you have to look at three layers there in the nasal, in the uh, nuchal scan. The first is the nasal tip, the second is the skin, and third is the na nasal bone. In fact, the nasal bone, can look absent in the NT scan, but can be seen in anomaly scan because it develops later. What is important to note is an unossified nasal bone at 12 weeks is a soft tissue marker. And that is more important. Vice versa cannot be true. If you have seen the nasal bone at NT and documented it well, it cannot disappear. If you are not seeing it in anomaly scan, that means you have actually uh, taken into account the the skin reflection to the nasal bone, incorrectly uh, in, interpreted as a skin reflection. Look for the equal to sign. And that equal to sign is the one that tells you that there are two lines there. First is a nasal skin and the second is a nasal bone. So if you make a habit to look at the equal to sign in each every patient, this kind of errors will not happen. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.
for the next session i would like to welcome back dr malini ma'am ma'am will be taking a session now on basics of musculoskeletal mri over to you ma'am malini you need to unmute yeah yeah, yeah sorry good afternoon and hi mohit okay so what we are going to do now is kind of continuation of what we saw in the morning we looked at mr physics we looked at basic mr sequences and now we'll try to look at basics of musculoskeletal mri so which are the sequences that we use and which are the how exactly do we use them in routine musculoskeletal practice so i'll just share the screen whenever we are looking for musculoskeletal imaging what are we trying to look at we want to see the anatomy we want to delineate the meniscus the labrum the ligaments all these structures well and we also want to look at signal on abnormality is there edema is there calcification what is the signal of the cartilage we want to look at these things we also want to look at the marrow because marrow is a part of musculoskeletal system and you want to see is there any marrow abnormality and last you may need to give contrast sometimes and then we need to look at the pattern of enhancement on giving gadolinium as contrast so now that we know what we are trying to look for it's always important that you know the anatomy of the area that you are imaging you need to select the correct coil morning i showed you the different types of coils so depending on the joint that we are scanning we need to choose the right coils because otherwise you will not get the good quality images you also need to select the correct sequences in msk there are different sequences for internal derangement while if we are looking for tumors or infection the sequences are slightly different so you need to know what you are looking for and sometimes after you start the scan the patient may just come with knee pain and somebody suspecting meniscal tear but when you start the scan you see there is a lesion or there is some marrow something which looks like an infection so then you need to change the protocol and make sure you are doing according to tumor or infection protocol and obviously artifacts are a part of all imaging and we need to make sure we avoid them or decrease it as much as possible if not completely avoid it so we need very good spatial resolution by spatial resolution i mean two points the closest they are that we can still distinguish them as separate that's the spatial resolution and we need very high spatial resolution to look at very fine structures to look at the cartilage structure and we also obviously need to look at the pathologies again is does it contain fat if there's a tumor is it containing fat is it containing fluid does it have calcification hemorrhage and for that we need to have the right sequences whenever you obtain mr images there is always signal and some amount of noise noise can never be zero so we need to make sure the signal to noise ratio is high signal is as much as possible high and noise is as low as possible and we have to kind of balance all of this with the speed the timing of the scan has to be reasonable somewhere say not more than 15 20 minutes usually otherwise it is not practical if the sequences are too long most of these patients would be in pain so they'll not be able to cooperate there'll be moment artifacts and the whole thing is not going to be of use so it's a fine balance between these things and what we need to know is time short high spatial resolution will not always go together and high signal to noise ratio all these three will not go together you will have to balance it so based on the particular case based on the indication you may need to strike a balance and general guidelines but especially more important for musculoskeletal system you always need to know the history before the scan in msk you need to put a marker so you can use we use a routine vitamin e capsule so any oily substance a vitamin e capsule is fine or you get uh, specific markers which are more costly so at the site of the maximum pain because patient will just come saying leg pain it's and we know leg is such a large area to be covered if i keep a large field of view and try to cover the entire leg i'm losing on the spatial resolution i'll not be able to see finer things suppose somebody has an osteoderma which is such a small lesion so i'm losing out on that so what do i do i need to keep the field of view less 
And for that, I need to make sure I'm covering the area of the patient's pain or if there is a swelling. So put a marker at the site of swelling. Select the best possible coil for that particular area and keep field of view as minimum as required. You can begin with one large field of view stir image to screen the entire area. But after that, try to concentrate on the area that you want to look at. Different coils that we use. So again, surface coils. So these surface coils are receive only coil. They don't send the radio frequency pulse. They only receive the signal. But they give you very good signal to noise ratio. They give you good resolution. But obviously the area you can cover is lesser. For example, knee coil, you can include only the knee. You can't include the leg. You can't include much of the thigh. Positioning is important. If the tech does not position the joint properly, then in this coil also, you may not get good images. So this is, for example, the knee coil. The size is small. The shape is kept so that it conforms to the knee joint. And inside that, with adequate packing, you have to position the patient properly. Shoulder joint, you can have different types of coil. Like here, this is a fixed coil. So this rigid coil sits on the shoulder and advantages the respiratory movement of the chest will not affect it. You'll get good images. But you can use it only for shoulder because the shape is like that. You can't use it for anything else. Or you may use a flex-like coil which you wrap around the shoulder. Now here, the disadvantage is sometimes patients are apprehensive. Sometimes they are breathing heavily. So those respiratory movements will get transmitted and you can get artifacts. But advantage, you can use it for various things. A single hip joint, you can use it for elbow joint. So you may use it, it's a multi-purpose like coil. So based on that, you can select which one works for you. And also these coils cost quite a lot. So maybe some centers, instead of something like this, where they'll have to invest in a coil only for a one particular joint, they may want something like this, which would have multi-purpose utility. Phase direct coil, here what happens, you want to cover a large field of view, but still maintain the resolution. So how do we do that? You combine multiple small coils into one single large coil. So now, if I want to scan the cervical spine, I'll activate only the top elements. When I'm looking at thoracic spine, I'll activate the middle elements. When I'm scanning the lumbar spine, I'll activate the lower elements. So again, Sometimes, depending on the patient's height, if it's a very short patient, so for that person's lumbar spine, you may need to activate the mid and the lower rather than only lower because that may not work. Similarly, this is a phase direct coil which can be used for both the hip joints, pelvis, abdomen, all of that. So larger field of view, but still giving you good signal to noise ratio and resolution. Coming to sequences, we already looked at this in the morning, T1, T2, proton density. Two more, stir, short tau inversion recovery, or fat saturated T2, or you can say, or T1 also, you can suppress fat in any of the sequences. When we say stir, it's always T2, but a fat saturated sequence can be T2 or it can be T1. So, what do we use T1 for? I told you one, to look for the anatomy and second, to look for the marrow abnormality. When a child is born, the body has all red marrow, entire bone has red marrow. Slowly, the red marrow starts converting into fatty marrow in an orderly and predictive fashion. It occurs from in the distal skeleton first and then in the axial skeleton. So adult patients will always have fatty marrow. On a T1 weighted image, fat is bright. So normal marrow in adult patient looks bright on T1 weighted image. But here you can clearly see there is a lesion involving the lower femoral condyle and you have the soft tissue component here also. So this is clearly abnormal marrow. This was metastasis in this particular patient but it tells you that the marrow is normal or not. Here this child came with uh, hip pain and the child had fallen off a swing in the school uh, some time back. So they were attributing the hip pain to that. And what we see, this here is normal hip joint, which should be seen in this age child. I think this child was maybe about five, six year old. So this is how it should look. 
you start seeing this fatty marrow in the ossific nuclei you start seeing fat in the diaphysis but here you can see this apophysis greater trochanter it's not yet fused so they are still hyper this is normal but in this child can you see everything is so dark the epiphysis should never be so dark it's that means the marrow is completely abnormal once the ossific nucleus has appeared it's always fatty here at the same age instead of looking like this this is what the marrow looks like so there's diffuse marrow abnormality and this turned out to be leukemia so look t1 helps you in looking at the marrow next coming to stir or fat sap t2 which is a t2 weighted image where fat has been made to look dark so as i told you on t2 fluid looks bright and so does fatty marrow so you suppress that fat by using the stir sequence or fat saturation and it all becomes very dark all the bone marrow is all dark so now if there's anything abnormal in the marrow which shows marrow edema you will pick it up here in this patient you can see tibia upper diaphysis there is marrow edema you can see this little periosteal reaction out here this is very classic of a stress fracture here in this patient you have marrow edema femur you have marrow edema tibia and this was following the road traffic accident so this patient had ligament other injuries and this is all the marrow contusion so these marrow contusions are micro trabecular fractures there is no fracture on x ray but mr shows you all this marrow edema which will explain the patient's pain this example i already showed in the morning just reiterating t1 weighted image tells me there is an expansor lesion in the calcaneum it tells me this black line of cortex is all maintained it's not eroded but it doesn't tell me anything else inside it why do i see the cortex so well because there's fat outlining all around so i can see anatomy well but on t2 weighted image i can see the internal structure of the lesion i can see that it has multiple fat uh, cystic areas with multiple blood fluid levels in dependent position so this is an aneurysmal bone cyst t1 shows you anatomy and extent well t2 shows you internal pathology better next coming to proton density so proton density is used very useful in internal derangements of joints because you can see the anatomy you can see pathology and you can see the cartilage all together so good we need one fat sac t2 or stir essential to look for marrow edema but other sequences are predominantly proton dense so here i told you the signal depends only on the intent the density of the proteins okay so what do we see we clearly see the meniscus here here we can see the cartilage so remember one thing all tendons all ligaments and all fibro cartilage are always dark on all mri sequences why because the hydrogen protons are so tightly packed there is no place for the protons to move around the fibers are all densely packed there are no mobile water protons but when you look at high line cartilage you can see this articulate articular cartilage this gray color thing so there you have little more place for the water molecules to move so it is more gray and then fluid you can see is very bright because the water molecules are obviously moving around very easily and this is fat fatty marrow still looks like this so you can see the ligament the tendons the cartilage the menisci or the labrum which are fibro cartilage all very well in one sequence how do i see it clearly you can see here this is the normal anterior labrum of the shoulder black triangular structure and you can see so clearly you can see a posterior labral tear very well and you can see this whole gray outline here black is cortex this whole gray structure is the articular cartilage so see how well you can look at the cartilage this is little is the joint fluid so these are all proton density image here you have normal anterior horn of medial meniscus seen as a black triangle and here very clearly you can see a signal within it reaching the articular surface so this is a meniscal tear again you can see the entire gray articular cartilage very well you can see the cortex very well so if there is any kind of cartilage abnormality that can be seen here in this patient in hip joint 
you can see this black triangle here is the labrum this black triangle you can see how it's showing bright signal it's all torn and you have fluid coming out forming a small paralabral cyst so proton density is very good to look for ligament tear tendon tear meniscal tear labral tear right? tendon tear now you can see the supraspinatus tendon here is not continuing you can see this full big gap where this green arrows are there so that is the supraspinatus tendon full thickness tear and here you can see these are two bundles of the anterior cruciate ligament anteromedial and posterolateral posterolateral is dark it is normal this is the lateral collateral ligament which is dark this is semi membranous tendon which is dark this is patellar retinaculum so they are all dark but you can see this anterior portion of the acl anteromedial bundle is showing bright signal and is torn so it can be seen very well so again tendon ligament fibrocartilage dark on all the sides hypointense and whenever in mri i am like in brain when you talk hyperintense hypointense you mean with respect to the white matter unless you specify otherwise in msk when i say bright hyperintense or dark hypointense or isointense i mean with respect to the skeletal muscle so anything which is more bright than skeletal muscle is hyperintense hyaline cartilage is intermediate signal intensity we can see here you can see this thin gray outline so that is hyaline cartilage muscle we saw is gray marrow red and yellow marrow look different yellow we saw look bright on t1 and t2 here you can see this anterior cruciate posterior cruciate ligament seen as a dark structure you can see the meniscus as dark structure and you can see the articular cartilage as gray structure again here you can see the same structures very well so how do we see pathology on mr whenever there is pathology it may be either a tear or before that it may be tendinosis degenerative so in a normal tendon like you can see here it looks dark because the collagen fibers are all tightly packed there is not much place for the hydrogen protons to move around but as tendinosis starts so compare this look with this you start seeing brighter signal this is subacromial bursal fluid in shoulder this here is brighter fluid because now the protons have started to move around it has more space the collagen fibers are getting degenerated same way here this black triangle you can see it is torn here there's a defect so there's a labral tear also inferior labrum is intact superior labrum is torn here you can see there is real bad tendinosis now the tendon is all thickened showing very bright signal and you can see the stair a whole split going all the way like that so here the fibers collagen fibers have got so disrupted that the water molecules are moving around jumping around freely and now you can start seeing a tear you can start seeing this defect in the tendon which will later increase and it can cause a full thickness tear so mr can tell you all the stages very well anterior cruciate ligament normal looks black you can see here how this whole anterior cruciate ligament is thick showing bright signal and you can see striated appearance something like a celery stalk appearance and this bright area is fluid so there's a ganglion formation so this is mucoid degeneration of anterior cruciate ligament this is the normal patellofemoral cartilage okay so this is how cartilage looks you can see the cartilage so very well you can it has three zones superficial central and deep and this is the cortex so any defect in the cartilage any degeneration can be seen very well on these proton density images now examples of cartilage issues you can see here this is intact gray cartilage and here can you see this large defect let me just get this option yeah so here can you see this area there is a clear cartilage defect here can you see cartilage fissure there is a clear cartilage fissure and subchondral cystic changes same thing here there's a cartilage fissure this is all the intact cartilage this is intact cartilage here can you see cartilage delamination so this patellar cartilage has just come off delaminated off a flap has come off 
So cartilage can be evaluated so well. So different ages, I can evaluate the marrow. Child, older adolescent, and in adult, you have all fatty marrow. Same on stir. The red marrow looks a little bright, but then in older patients, it all becomes fatty. So that's normal appearance. Spine in a child has all red marrow, looks something like this on T1 weighted image, seen in an adult. The vertebral bodies show bright signal compared to the disc. Okay, the vertebral bodies are more bright, that is normal. If the vertebral bodies become darker than the disc, then something is abnormal and you start thinking what it is. MSK, a very important thing we need to look at is cartilage. And it's very difficult also sometimes because you want to look at its thickness, you want to look at changes in the cartilage, whether it is just softened or it is fissured or it is defect. And you want to look at subchondral, is there any marrow edema changes because that will cause pain. Challenges are cartilage is invariably thin and it's always along a curved surface. Cartilage is always in joint, usually a curved surface. This leads to artifacts. So what sequence is best? If I look at T1, fluid is dark and so is cartilage is gray. So I can't really make out anything. T1 is very bad to look for cartilage. If I look at T2 fat sat, a T2 image, yes, I can see cartilage, but the outline of the cartilage with the fluid and the rest of the bone is not that very clear. But look at this proton density. I can see the cortex as a clear black line. I can see the cartilage outlined by this fluid very well. So proton density is best sequence to be looking at cartilage. Do I use fat sat or non-fat sat? I need both. I need fat sat to look at subchondral any changes in the bone, but cartilage itself, same patient this is. If you look at the cartilage, here I can see cartilage well, but here I'm not seeing cartilage that well in fat sat. But in non-fat sat, you can see cartilage as a gray structure extremely well. So a non-fat sat is good. Earlier we used to use these kind of gradient sequence I told you where fat, fluid, everything is made to look dark so only the bright area is the cartilage. But looking at defects in bright cartilage is not always easy. So nowadays we don't really use this. We do only proton density images. So these kind of high resolution proton density see how well you can see the patella cartilage. And examples. Here you can see there is softening. So this cartilage is still intact. There is no defect, but this part has become bright. So that means this cartilage has started degenerating. It is softened. Grade one chondromalacia, you may call it. Here, if you see, I can clearly see cartilage is abnormal. There's a fissure here, here it is all degenerated. And there's a cartilage fragment out here. Here you can see a cartilage flap has come up from the patella. This is cartilage, which is all softened. See, this is normal cartilage. So this patient, the entire cartilage is already degenerated. It is soft. And this portion is coming out like a flap. When I look at bone tumors, I need to image in three orthogonal planes. Field of view should be kept as low as possible. You always need to include a joint. See, I can't image just, just this middle leg. The surgeon needs to know how far from the knee joint is it, how far from the ankle joint. So one joint has to be included, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Place a marker, I told you, wherever the patient has pain. Sometimes the tumors can be very small, so you need to look at that area carefully. And always remember the scale should be left on during printing. Surgeon may need to take various measurements to plan his surgery, to plan the size of his implants. Common problems in MSK. Fat may not get suppressed homogeneously. When I do fat sat T2, fat may not get suppressed. So here, if you see, this area all looks bright. Fat, everything looks bright. So this is artifactual. But when I do homogeneous fat suppression or I do stir, everything gets suppressed. So it's important when there is large field of view, stir is better than fat sat T2. Or nowadays you have newer sequences called ideal, Dixon. One sequence you run and you'll get four images. One in which water is suppressed, uh, fat is suppressed. One in which water is suppressed, in phase, out of phase. I'll not go into these details, but it gives you homogeneous fat suppression and helps you look at marrow much better. Phase wrap. 
just like you have aliasing in Doppler, you can have problem with MR. Here, this patient, the FOV has been kept small, but the coil includes the full foot. So now this part of the foot, the toe has got overlapped here. Sometimes it may be overlapping if it's depending on how it's positioned, it may overlap on the area that you're scanning. So then I need to apply a particular thing called as no phase wrap to avoid this particular artifact. Positioning becomes important. Here I can see the subscapularis tendon anterior labrum so well because the shoulder is externally rotated. Here we have somebody has positioned the patient very internally rotated. See how everything is getting bunched up here. So now I'm not clearly comfortably able to see these various structures. You have newer sequences nowadays, propeller. I cannot remember the full form, periodically rotated, overlapping, parallel lines with enhanced reconstruction. What does it do? Here is this patient in routine sequence, not able to cooperate. Old lady has got a uh, supraspinatus tendon tear. She's in severe pain. So there's so much of this motion blurring artifact. In this patient, I can little compromise on the resolution, but I don't want motion artifacts. So what do I, I'm not looking at some very fine cartilage fissure here or a very fine labral tear. I'm looking more at the rotator cuff. So I can apply this propeller sequence and you can see you get fairly good sequence even though the patient is moving. Same here, here is a patient routine sequence. I apply propeller. Yes, some bit of resolution is getting lost, but I'm still able to get good enough images. So nowadays you have lots of these newer things that you can use. Yes. Metal. So when there is metal, can we do MRI or not? Yes, you can do MRI. So the only absolute contraindications to MR is cardiac pacemaker, unless you have a MR compatible pacemakers, which are very costly and not that frequently used in India. So pacemaker, you can kind of think contraindication. Cochlear implants are uh, contraindication, but if really badly needed, MR has to be done due to some reason, the ENT surgeon comes and they deactivate some portion of the cochlear implant and you can still do it. If there is anything external metal fixator, if there is halter monitoring, so any kind of electromagnetic device, you don't want it to be going inside the magnet room. But if there is an internally fixed intramedullary nail, screws in the bone, K wire, sutures, mesh for a hernia surgery, staples, it's perfectly fine and safe. So MR, it's not as if that's going to come out and fly out. In newer three Tesla machine, yes, there can be some heating issues sometimes based on what material it is. So you can instruct the patient that if they feel any kind of heating, they can inform you, but otherwise it is safe. But what it will do is it will give you artifacts. So you may not be able to evaluate that area well because there's so much of artifact. So then either, but in that same patient who has a, intramedullary nail in the femur for fracture. Can you do his brain scan? Yes, no problem. What if you want to image the femur only for whatever reason? You can do these various things. Decrease the bandwidth, receiver bandwidth, increase frequency. You can do those changes. You can use stir image. You should not use gradient echo. I told you gradient exaggerates inhomogeneities. So obviously it's going to even further exaggerate made everything look bad. So we routinely do knee arthroplasty patients by modifying or you may have something called as MARS, metal artifact reduction sequences. You have these Maverick, uh, CMAC, these kind of special sequences. They reduce the artifact and now you can clearly see everything in spite of the arthroplasty. So that becomes an advantage and you can still do MR. Here, there's this big nail in the humerus, but I can still do MR and I can see this patient had been operated for some tumor and you can see all this tumor has recurred. Again here, there is metal out here, but you can still see. So titanium, titanium, this is titanium, doesn't cause any artifact. Titanium is MR compatible plus no artifact. Other metals are compatible, MR safe, but not compatible. So images, if there might be a lot of artifacts, you do not know that unless you have artifact reduction sequences. So here is a sequence without metal artifact reduction. You can see all the artifacts so much. So again, Maverick is multi-acquisition, variable resonance image combination. With Maverick, you can see how clearly you can see the structures well. So I think uh, that uh, I would like to conclude by saying that 
there are a different number of sequences available know what you are scanning for plan your sequences accordingly use the right coil place a pain marker so that you know which area one has to scan and then if you follow these principles reduce the number of artifacts by using the things which i told you and you'll be able to get good images in msk and interpret them thank you thank you ma'am that was a very informative session truly great thank you so much ranesh next session i would like to invite dr asif momin sir so is consultant radiologist at prince ali khan hospital and has done research in onco radiology and sir will be taking a session on ultrasound of lung we welcome you sir to our webinar okay good afternoon everyone and uh, thanks for this opportunity i thank uh, dr preeti kapoor for giving this uh, opportunity to me we'll be talking about uh, the lungs i think we all know because of the covid that uh, the color of the covid has changed the global map completely and we feel nice that it is becoming less now that you know we can at least now start breathing a little bit easily now lung has become the global word and stay safe has become the new mantra and ct has hogged the whole limelight and this is one picture i just took because there was so much time i could do my photography hobby also i mean we could do little justice to it so this is how a global phenomenon has come but silently as you understand from here is the ultrasound has crept in very nicely and intensivists those who have used this ultrasound in their covid care had made the difference not that they were not using it before but all of a sudden there is a huge demand to lung imaging be it uh, in the icu or be it before the icu but as and when when we talked about ultrasound chest and we always had it was a sort of something which raised your eyebrows and we knew that lungs are invisible ura was barely visible to us and we never really tried to see it heart was almost untouchable because we thought it's not our job and media stenoma was something which was avoidable with that we really never thought about doing chest ultrasound or lung ultrasound as such but when we see all these images and you can imagine that everything is really seen there and you can see these are the panoramic view of the chest wall and it gives you nice picture about the chest wall the ribs and the pleura is quite well seen so we understand from rib 1 to rib 7 to zip sternum everything is really seen there but we have to make an attempt to see it but the certain sound is used for specific purpose like we most of the radiologists would use it for pleura in their day to day practice lungs as we saw and we'll see in uh, lung care and intensive care mediastinum when we do some specific biopsies thoracic inlet when we want to know whether the lesion is coming up or going down that kind of thing heart is also one of the specific purpose which we can investigate intensive care screening is a specific uh, you know uh, sub uh, modality intervention as and when you require you would use ultrasound and we'll touch couple of those example because this is where the radiologist will make the difference and as a, as an extension to abdominal imaging now let's see what all things we can really see we saw the pleura and this is a nice pleural line which is seen in a intercostal space very nicely you can see and it really moves very well and this is one particular image which we should keep in our mind that how a pleura really moves and the pleural sliding is the basis of the lung ultrasound now this is the second video which i want you to see this is a child's video you can see here the pulmonary artery the aorta and the svc here that is a three vessel view of our fetal imaging and you can see the pulmonary artery is dividing well and that is the fatty tissue which is the thymus and that's your sternal area so you can nearly see everything so clearly because the there is a good amount of tissue differentiation which is very much there because of the different you know tissue characteristic and refraction which occurs as against that through the diaphragm we really don't try to see the lung but 
we know that sometimes we'll see these B lines or B rockets or lung rockets when there is some kind of subpleural problem or consolidation or some fluid accumulation occurs. So we do tend to see this kind of images and sometimes these may be related to your lung nodules as well. Coming to the cartilage part, and you can see here, most of the time, the rib would be bony, which will be completely obscuring the ultrasound beam and you will not see the pleura through that area. But if it is through costal cartilage, the cartilage is a radio, uh, it is radio lucent as well as it will be allow ultrasound beam to pass through. So this is our chest wall, that is our cartilage, that is our cartilage, and you can see the complete pleural line through that. Moment to come towards the rib, the part of the pleura will be obscured. And this one, two, and this three, these three picture, uh, three uh, lines would make a bad sign. And that is another important sign of knowing what is a lung ultrasound is to deal with. I mean, you have to create a bad sign to know what we see as an echogenic line is the pleura, and what you see as two wings will be actually the cartilage, uh, the uh, rib, which is causing the shadowing. So we understand from here, we saw refraction, uh, reflection, we saw true transmission, and we saw partial transmission, and we saw complete, you know, obscuration of a ultrasound beam. And this is how ultrasound is used effectively, knowing all the principles are used in lung ultrasounds. So lung ultrasound is effectively becomes a game of artifacts. But there are some limitations of portable chest X-ray, and that's when the ultrasound was being used in the uh, ICU setting. Pa patients cannot hold breath correctly. There is reduced resolution. There are difficult to assess pleural effusions, consolidation, pneumothorax, etc. So in such a scenario, sometimes we really don't know what is happening here, and that's when those who started using ultrasound, they really made the difference. And who did that? This was a guy called Dr. Daniel uh, Lichtenstein, and he's the, considered as the father of ultrasound of intensive care because he formed a protocol. I happened to meet him in Taiwan some years ago. It was a very pleasant meeting. And he has this whole book on ultrasonography of the critically ill. And there they showed something which even radiologists were not using was the blue protocol that is bedside lung ultrasound in emergency where they showed how a lung ultrasound can make effective difference in such scenarios where there is a lot of things which are obscured or we needed to assume them considering even the endotracheal tube placement and other situation pneumothorax all this needed to be highlighted by one more modality and this is the man who really came out with lots of paper and then he has become now the almost the name synonymous with the lung ultrasound. Now coming to the bad sign, which we discussed earlier, rib, rib, and that is the pleura. Because of the refraction, I mean, the, the way we understand from bats movement, the same principle is used, the ultrasound beam hits here, and then it creates a little bit of artifact. These are called as the A lines. And this is a normal appearance of a uh, lung beam which traverses through. So rib, rib, shadow, that is the bat wings, and this is the mouth which becomes synonymous with the um, multiple refracting uh, reverberation lines which are called as but equally at equidistant they are very nicely seen but not very bright so this is the a line and we'll see how it differs differs from the b line so in fact we understand it's a game of artifact we don't rely so much on artifacts in ultrasound we don't want too many ultrasound uh, artifacts in generally in the abdomen but here we would be happy that we can play with the artifacts. Now, what are the advantages? I think we all understand supportable, quick, no radiation, creatinine cannot be our, you know, complaining factor, size of the unit. It's very small, but there is a disadvantage. And I think the reason why <clears throat> we radiologists would probably are a little bit going away is because one radiologist would remain engaged. And this is why I would say this becomes very important that in at least institutes, a radiologist can take interest in lung ultrasound by which they can prove their worth and in association with intensivists, they can make the difference. There is always suboptimal patient position in ICU, which makes your life a little difficult while doing ultrasound. And there is always a limited window because there are too many tubes and other you know, positional abnormalities which are going to be there. 
in addition to that i think we understand <clears throat> the situation due to covid that you would be taking utmost care of your own uh, you know safety by using ppe which makes life little miserable so coming to that now we saw this uh, you know anatomical images i think i will not repeat that one just additional point which we should know that there are intercostal vessels and neurovascular bundle which occurs generally beneath the rib as you come ahead anteriorly in the chest it may go little midway but in the till the mid thoracic or mid axillary line this is how the relationship is though here you don't see it and here you have to show it by a cartoon but if i really make use of ultrasound in such a good fashion i'm sure we can see it we saw that cartilage is seen very clearly pleura is seen very clearly so why not intercostal vessel yes we can see intercostal vessels this is the rib this is the rib this is the uh, uh, tuberculous lesion which is the costochondritis or um, cold abscess which is coming out and just touching the pleura here that's your pleura pleura that's the rib shadow and this is one vessel this is the another vessel so importantly i think we would know and as a radiologist you would puncture correctly avoiding this neurovascular bundle while you are doing those procedures going through intercostal space so this is a good anatomical cor correlation and yes we can see intercostal artery even in longitudinal on a high frequency ultrasound provided you make an attempt so we can see it very well equipment i think any basic unit which has m mode or doppler will be useful uh, we understand that this is how generally the icu intensivists work they sometimes work from far from the machine and they just needed to sometimes puncture the jugular and they really don't operate these machines uh, really that much but as a radiologist we are used to having this machine on this side and that's how we would make a difference with this kind of vision will not be very useful so coming to the value of doing lung ultrasound is we understand when we compare the x-ray chest with lung ultrasound and ct as being the gold standard we understand pleural effusion diagnosis is very high specificity specificity consolidation also very high interstitial syndrome it can pick up very well because it will pick up those b lines and we'll discuss that complete pneumothorax also has a very good understanding on x-ray uh, compared to x-ray chest the ultrasound in icu shows pneumothorax in a better fashion and we'll see how we can diagnose it occult pneumothorax i think there can be a little bit of uh, difficulty because part of the lung is attached and part of the lung is detached from the uh, chest wall so that's when we can understand from this that ultrasound in reality has a very good high sensitivity and specificity in all those signs and i'm sure you would agree with at least pleural effusion and consolidation but not really you will think too much about pneumothorax because we rely on a uh, erect x-ray chest now this is how the generally the probe is placed and these are the chest wall intercostal probe placement in anterior lung field you can go into the intercostal axillary line and that's how you would place the uh, uh, you know um, probe and do the ultrasound now because of the covid <clears throat> lot of thing has been uh, you know highlighted by using bedside ultrasound and we understand they generally use 12 point lung exam protocol and my colleague dr kedar and my dr aziz they were using this quite often and we learned something from them also that how a quick ultrasound can make the difference in their practice one placement two placement third fourth fifth sixth that was the one sided placement and same would be replicated in the opposite side and generally we understand the red here denotes the uh, covid involvement and that knowing that where it involves their placement or would somehow corroborate with their understanding and they would get the picture by analyzing the artifact to know what is happening in the lung these are the basic sign i don't want to go into each but as we move forward we will think about it we have seen couple of signs here but i will go further to avoid the uh, 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 to save some time and we'll see one one thing pleura is our main hallmark when we use ultrasound to know it's easiest thing is to know the pleural effusion whenever there is in doubt on x ray chest easiest thing is you'll do is the do the x ray chest uh, after that you'll do the ultrasound and see the where is the pleural accumulation fluid accumulation and how we know what is the normal pleura is described as it is described as a shimmering 
sign, which is called as Y, because something like this, you know, when we see these blue algae, which are highlighting the seashore because of their inherent shimmer, same way you can see the when the pleura actually moves, it really shimmers and we can, it will be almost unmistakable that you would not understand how, how a pleura moves. And why we should know that? Because the chest wall and pleura is in good opposition. Moment it loses this opposition or something additional comes here, we can understand there could be a pathology which is occurring there. Some minor B lines are naturally there in any lung, so we can ignore them in reality. We need not report these B lines because we are seeing them, because they can be some small amount of B lines may be there. And what is the seashore sign? We'll come to that. Now, when we see a moving pleura and we use the M mode, we get a sand-like appearance here. When we can see here, the ocean is on this side and this side is the sand on the beach. Because the pleura moves, it forms a granular kind of uh, M mode pattern, which gives rise to this typical seashore sign. So that shows that when you see a nice seashore sign, which will be considered as a normal pleural movement. And this is why uh, a, a normal uh, pleura is described as seashore sign. So this is how it moves here. But does it really work in our practice? So have you, I mean, have you been able to diagnose a pneumothorax in reality in ultrasound department when it was not suspected? Yes, sometimes you'll get those opportunities if you are unlucky on certain days. Suppose this was a breast mass which was biopsied by one of our colleagues and what happened after some time, this right breast mass biopsy went very well, but about in one hour's time, patient was very breathless and she came back. Moment she came back, what we did is the we did the ultrasound and we could realize because of her symptoms, we thought there may be a pneumothorax. So this is the right side, this is the left side. We have done the biopsy on the right side, so we suspect something could be wrong on the right side. And you can see nothing moves here. We can see the bat almost without the moment which occurs due to pleura here, and the pleura is not moving between along the other intercostal spaces also, and you're seeing the exaggerated A lines. So there is exaggerated A lines and no pleural moment. See this and compare it with the just opposite intercostal space on the opposite side. So you see both the sides together. Now that I have shown it many times, you know how pleura really moves. That's the card, uh, rib and it is really nicely seen here. See this vis-a-vis, -vis, you can't see the pleural moment here. And just by this, you are sure that there is a pneumothorax and this is how a pneumothorax can be easily diagnosed by using ultrasound when it is complete pneumothorax you would not ever miss it and that is what one important point you should keep it in mind so this is the confirmatory picture because the juniors never believed that ultrasound could be used then and we could show them take one ct section so that we are happy to have this as a teaching picture and this is what it looks like you can see here uh, absolutely everything is looking fine Okay, now moving ahead, just one point, portable x ray sensitivity in detecting pneumothorax is 50%, but accumulation of air is anterior to the lung in the supine position, so you can miss it. Mechanically ventilated lungs do not collapse even in the presence of pneumothorax. So the slide will be, uh, you will not uh, understand a sliding sign on X-ray chest, but on ultrasound, you can see that, and that's when you will realize how it would move. So coming to this, I think you can see now one picture of a normal lung, which is showing a normal pleural movement. Again, again, I'm showing this because once or twice you see it and you would never have any problem seeing this. So this is a normal sliding pleura. There is uh, exaggerated, uh, no exaggeration. That's a normal A pattern. But as you can see here, you can see here a pleura comes in and stops short of some, you know, point. You can see a pleural moment only occurring here, but nothing is moving here. And this is called as the lung point sign where it tells you that the pneumothorax is limited. It is not complete, but it is a partial pneumothorax. So that is when the lung point sign will come in picture. That means part of the lung is moving and part of the pleura is not moving. That means till this point, the lung is opposed to the chest wall and beyond that it is not. Moment you see an abnormal pleural uh, 
you know thick band which occurs here you can see here m mode you can see what happens here as you go on to the thickened pleural band like thing which occurs here which is due to absence of the pleural sliding which occurs here so i think from this view i'm sure you all know that this is can tell you the pneumothorax when it is partial also that is but what you need to know is you have to use this uh, maneuver by doing ultrasound at various spaces only then you would be able to pick up and that's when the sensitivity will be little less compared to the uh, uh, complete pneumothorax so i think this we saw absent lung sliding this is the internet picture which was initially given by uh, you know these nice articles which were there way back in 2007 and that's why i have kept this written because you can see even the intercostal probe which is the small cardiac probe can give rise to this diagnosis you can see here uh, pleura will not really move here i'm sorry this video is not moving okay i think let's move ahead you can see here again the difference you know the lung point sign is something which moves and something which doesn't move when you see this together then that is the area where lung is approximated at one point and it is not approximated in the opposite point okay now coming back to the same uh, m mode picture you can see part of the lung is moving and part of the lung is not moving so this is the lung point where there would be pneumothorax and how i confirm this in this picture you can see if it is like this that the pneumothorax occurs here and there is a effusion here here you'll get the lung point sign that means the pleura will slightly move here but nothing will move here and that's when you get that picture so i think coming to now next sign which is called as curtain sign curtain sign i think we tend to use it in ultrasound guided procedures quite often when we know that we don't see part of the liver very clearly because the pleural reflection obscures the visualization of this area of the liver and that's when we know that we have to adjust your probe in such a way that you can see this from this angle you can try and throw a little bit of ultrasound beam and see it so the pleural curtain sign shows you till what point the curtain or pleura is reaching down towards the liver uh, dome because the liver is uh, underneath the dome of the diaphragm and our job is to understand while doing this procedure is not to transgress this curtain sign because you would create a pneumothorax so this is why sometimes by mistake patient develop pneumothorax because we tend to choose the wrong pathway we tend to transgress the pleura by not understanding what is the curtain sign and you would probably try to aspirate this abscess but create a pneumothorax because you are going through the pleural space if you are going intentionally especially in procedures like rf ablation it is a good idea to create artificial pleural effusion or artificial ascites to uh, you know when we try to go through this because this can be used for a therapeutic purpose when there are no other approaches but this kind of approach then you can create artificial pleural effusion here by injecting and then go ahead and hit the lesion or ablate the lesion so i think we should understand the importance of curtain sign pleural fluid estimation we tend to ask and we used to always take those three measurements we know that ultrasound will pick up fluid which is less than 20 ml x ray chest will pick up fluid in a pav more than 300 ml and decubitus will pick up fluid which is around 25 ml so decubitus was our mainstay but ultrasound really picks up the smallest amount of fluid by and large this is one uh, book formula which says that when the patient is sitting and this is the column height of the effusion that how much fluid is going up from the uh, diaphragm upwards that height and this thickness can give rise to using this formula you can definitely uh, estimate the effusion but i think what we really do in reality is the we do the eyeballing and we tell them the how much is the fluid now there is a fluid which is there for long standing can have some debris proteinaceous material and this rise gives to plankton sign which tells you that definitely this is a abnormal fluid but when the fluid has debris which is settling you may suspect a proteinaceous material like blood or pus and you can report it uh, likewise coming to the next point in our country we do see pleural effusion so common in the tuberculosis etiology that we needed to probably understand which is the 
effusion which we can call tuberculosis because it is lymphocyte rich exudate it tends to form multiple septa and then we are sure that this is likely to be tuberculous effusion and this is one of the good sign to tell you that the tuberculous effusion when we see a lot of septa you may get a diagnostic material but it will not be very good to get a lot of therapeutic material pleural nodules can occur and we can see them very well in such scenarios and they are seen so nicely because of the background fluid here you would be probably doing the fnscs or biopsies of that nodule very easily like in this case this is a ca breast patient with a nodule and you can see it quite clearly and get the tissue sample pleural thickening can sometimes cause confusion whether it's really a fluid or thickened pleura and we would not know what is happening here to understand what is effusion and what is just thickening and what is encysted fluid we would use this sign described nicely in a journal of ultrasound way back in 1995 and it says that fluid color sign is a useful indicator for discrimination between pleural thickening and pleural effusion and see what's that now if you see this is a picture you can see when the fluid takes the color that means it is a fluid and not the thickening and again i'm showing you one more example there is a thickened pleura and there is a bit of fluid here you can imagine here see that only the fluid is taking color because the fluid really moves the fluid particles move and it moves like a any blood movement and it creates a doppler signal here so this gives you idea that this is the thickened area and this is the fluid area same way you will be able to identify that whether particular area is thickened pleura or effusion if it is moving moving fluid you will put the needle and get the diagnostic sample if it is thickened pleura you will probably do the biopsy and get the sample for analysis even if you are suspecting cox you would take out multiple cores from the pleural thickening and send them for gene expert and other test as and when required so i think understand that the movement of pleura will be shown as a very intense color on power doppler so whenever the pleura is intact we would and switch on the uh, color or power you will get this kind of appearance and that is how you will use the fluid color sign to understand when you note it is not a fluid color sign is absent in certain cases like cancer you may do the biopsy like we did the biopsy or fnc here and it is again a adenocarcinoma here high frequency scanning is especially useful in children because many consultants wants us to do the tapping and when we see on high frequency scanning what we see is only the septa and there are so many septa that you can't really would be wise to do tapping because you would get only little material there is no point putting icd also in such thing i think these are the patients who would probably require pleuro disease or pleural stripping and when ultrasound is done low frequency and high frequency you can see the difference how the strands are seen very well this is again typically commonly seen in uh, tuberculosis so you can see that indication of for pleural decortication and you will see whether it is pleura or lung that also can be very easily identified that's your liver that's your diaphragm and that's the lung bit of effusion consolidated lung and bit of pleural septa are seen here so high frequency scanning whenever you have doubt use them coming to now we do this hands free kind of pleural tapping because there is a machine which makes it uh, air leak proof and it aspirates the fluid at a very slow rate and we tend to aspirate the fluid first fluid can be so much that i mean this is our cartoon by dr morparia he can see a massive pleural effusion and so much so he started seeing the aquarium within so i think you can see we tend to get lot of fluid in our practice and when you put ultrasound probe you can sometimes get this uh, signs called a jellyfish sign which is seen here and you can uh, break the tags by your uh, needle you can pull them apart slightly so that the fluid uh, you know um, aspiration is easier and you can see this complete assembly and it is accumulated in a container by which you can send it for cytospin if it is suspected of malignancy so i think this is our general bread and butter procedure is the pleural effusion tapping what can go wrong is pneumothorax i think you have to take care while you are inserting the needle put a ice tubing along with that and a three way so there is no air leakage going to happen because pleural effusion per se is a very easy procedure but there are clinical scenarios where people have started questioning if you don't use ultrasound it will be considered as a medical legal problem so i think you will have to use the ultrasound 
but too rapid aspiration which can happen sometimes can cause problem and it is known to cause unilateral pulmonary edema so you it's a good idea to keep your saturation and uh, pulse oximeter ready on the patient's finger and this is one example where we really aspirated it fast and the patient really became breathless effusion has gone but you can see there's a unilateral edema i mean you can see the difference between the lung and you can see the unilateral edema now if i were to i have just taken this picture to show you the difference because the ct was done just for teaching purpose to show that how a unilateral edema can occur immediately after the tap but edema can be diagnosed on ultrasound also by knowing the what are the b lines so keep that in mind always unexplained x ray chest opacity we can think this is a hydropneumothorax but this is not this was a ivor lewis operation where a stomach has been pulled uh, pulled up after the esophagectomy and that is how there is such level as occurred so ultrasound will help you to understand what is this happening and knowing the surgery subpulmonic effusion can be a confusing picture you can see the diaphragm right is normal the left should be lower down but it is higher up here so we can understand here there may be effusion you keep a probe and you will get the diagnosis if not so you will have to do the decubitus view where is the diaphragm that can be the sometimes confusing issue that whether the fluid seen is ascites or no the difference is if the fluid accumulates between the spine and the crust of the diaphragm then it is a pleural fluid and if it is above the diaphragm uh, above the crust of the diaphragm and behind the ivc if it is going then it will be considered as the ascites but i think knowing now all the pictures you would not have this problem sometimes masses which are seen in paravertebral gutter can cause confusion and there such sign can come to the rescue and this is our actual diaphragm and this is the lesion which has extra abdominal extra peritoneal in the retro para aortic region which is causing and crossing the midline aorta and ivc are displaced anteriorly similarly a collection which looks like so called pleural effusion may be actually sub diaphragmatic collection and this is the splenic abscess which is ruptured into the subdiaphragmatic so you knowing the diaphragm is a very important and intensivist also uses ultrasound a lot in the lower intercostal spaces to know the diaphragmatic thickening and movements to understand the diaphragmatic paresis and the respiratory rate also so i think this is how the ultrasound is used so remember where is the diaphragm should be your buzzword now again where is the diaphragm that is your spleen this is the left sided intercostal picture with high frequency scanning that is your l is the lung no it is not lung it is the liver which is covering the spleen so this is called as that beaver tail appearance of the left lobe of liver which is covering so see the difference between the spleen echogenicity and the liver echogenicity is distinctly different and beyond that what we see is the diaphragm is here so then what is this this can't be the liver because liver is seen here the diaphragm is seen here the spleen is here so this is the lung pathology and this was a classic consolidation or collapse of the lung in a child which we could be diagnosed very nicely on ultrasound because on x rays it remained obscured and you can see there is on the opposite side also there is a small consolidation seen here and this is one of the easiest diagnosis which can mimic acute abdomen because consolidation is known to cause acute abdomen like symptoms so at the end of your acute abdomen examination it's not a bad thing to do your ultrasound and check where is the pleura if there is any effusion if there is any sub uh, i mean the lower lobe large consolidation and i'm sure if you do that it is your plus point and you are going to make diagnosis difference is the same patient when you see chon color you can see the vessels of the lung and this is the consolidation you can see the body mark which shows how nicely you can see because on the good machine the ultrasound has a very good uh, resolution uh, uh, near field resolution which by which you can distinctly see the difference between the spleen the lung and the uh, liver and the lung and you can make the diagnosis here you can see the air echogram and uh, which is called as air bronchogram in x-rays and you will make the diagnosis this is a, uh, sometimes you will have similar appearances seen whether this is lung whether this is pleural effusion you put the probe and you will get the diagnosis after the aspiration the lung has re expanded and you can now see the air bronchogram that means this is a still collapsed but it is expanded lung which is seen very well here now coming to pneumonia i think we understand 
diagnosis can be very easily made because the pneumonic lung will look like liver because there is hepatization occurring here. That's the liver and that's the lung which is now looking like liver. And actually, you see the air bronchogram which is moving. So it is a dynamic air bronchogram. That means the bronchus is open and this is a consolidated area. Here, you really can't see much here. Maybe you suspect there could be something here that the diaphragm is slightly flattened, but you see the ultrasound of the same patient, it gives you immediate idea. So need not do CT scan in every such patient. I think you get a good diagnosis. That's your liver, that's your diaphragm, that's the consolidation, that's the air echogram, and you have made the diagnosis very well on this. There can be sometimes distinguishing uh, you know, problem between compressive and obstructive atelectasis, we understand on B mode ultrasound, it is generally moderate to mark that's occurring with the pleural effusion. And this is without the pleural effusion. So it is no pleural effusion is seen, but there is large pleural effusion in compressive. It is generally triangular, like a fish shaped, like a pomfret shaped lung, which is seen because it's a collapsed lung and it's called as a peak cap sign while consolidation lung starts looking like a hepatization. And we saw one or two examples. Air echogram is generally seen and there is no obstructive or internal mass is seen in compressive, but there can be a central mass which can be causing uh, absence of such air echogram. And sometimes you can see this now, you can see the movements are very nicely seen. That means the bronchus is patterned and so nicely seen. This is given to me by Dr. Kedar Koroskar, who is an intensivist, and they use ultrasound probe quickly to understand it, whether it is fluid, whether it is collapsed lung, whether there is a compressive atelectasis or whether it is obstructive atelectasis. You can see here nice air echogram also occurring here like a uh, you know branch pattern uh, seen here very well. Even switching on color Doppler also can be seen here and which shows the uh, increased uh, vascularity which is the typical triphasic vessel seen in the obstructive atelectasis. So this is one uh, difference. Pre and post step I think we discussed this rarely when you're doing ultrasound of the breast you should keep watch on the where is the pleura because sometimes you need to do the biopsy so avoid the pleura but sometimes in such cases you can see there are sub pleural nodules which are seen here they are cutting the pleural interface at multiple places and this is when you would diagnose that this is some sub pleural deposits or pulmonary metastasis are already occurring you can see the rib rib and in between there is a lymph node so there is internal mammary node is also there plus there are subpleural deposits during breast ultrasound. So we knew that this patient may be having widespread lung metastasis. And yes, we could do the X-ray chest for our understanding. And immediately you realize there is a, already a lymphangitis carcinomatosa-like appearance, which will give rise to such deposits. There may be from other etiology that not necessarily everything is metastasis, but it shows that there is a compressive pathology occurring here. And that's when you see the deposits here. Okay, so I think we saw that. We see this one picture just to understand the difference between the normal pleural interface on the normal side. And suppose there is some interstitial fibrosis occurring, then you will see this broken line here. And this is what intensivists tend to use it. So I think coming to now this B lines, lung rockets and interstitial syndrome, we know that B line is cometal artifact. It arises from pleural line. It is well-defined laser ray-like appearance, which once you know, you will never mistake it. It is long, it does not fade away, and it will erase the A line and it moves with the lung sliding. So, if it is showing these features, then what we see is the B line, in which is a hallmark of knowing there is a replacement of lung air by some fluid or some proteinaceous debris. And this is how we'd see. So, that's our A line, which we saw earlier on. And this is what the lung intensivist would generally use. The ultrasound beam is reflected. So, only a bit of Typical reverberation artifact is occurring, which is called as A line. This is typical normal dry lung. B line, when there is fluid accumulation, you start seeing the fluid and you see those B lines as the rockets or lung rockets, which are uh, artifacts like laser ray, which are going to go down. When it becomes more thicker, it will cause consolidation and it will cause, it is now called as consolidation or C line because the fluid has accumulated and it has assembled together and it forms a uh, collapse unit along with the consolidation collapse. So this causes the C line. So understand A line, B line, C line, the difference, how it is seen. And this is what the 
most of the people would use it for diagnosing in the uh, uh, you know covid scenario or other scenarios also when the consolidation becomes more profound like from ggo to this kind of proper consolidation will start seeing the hepatization of kind of picture and this is the pneumonia how it is seen here uh i think tell me about the time i'm just going to go on till uh, you know i have time now we'll see b1 lines and b2 lines the difference inter and interlobular septal line and then when they occur and coalesce together they form the ground glass appearance of the covid lung and this is what a thin lung b line will start becoming a thick b line because it is coalescent so become b1 line becomes b2 line because the line is become much thicker and when they were diagnosing or we were seeing these lungs in covid initial pattern from here to here when it changes then you would say that patient is getting now more of consolidation or the pattern is worsening not improving something similar one more line we should know in our understanding is the e line which is the emphysema subcutaneous emphysema which is subcutaneous emphysema causes such lines which are called as e lines because they are occurring beyond the uh, chest wall or in the abdominal wall or anywhere else where the lung will leak so the additional false b lines are called as e or z lines just keep that in mind that they are describing it this way we saw this example earlier on this is our typical b lines how like laser ray like we can see them occurring here because this patient has had subpleural deposits consolidation and some pleural deposits also this patient had had so this causes are subpleural thickening atelectasis pleural nodules interstitial lung disease or interstitial edema all can give rise to this appearance so mind you most of the changes what we see in covid lung are not specific for the disease but because it was pandemic we could use it for our advantage otherwise b lines can be seen in various pathologies but once you see them they are very very striking they don't fade away they would go as a continuous uh, laser like sharp lines seen beyond the pleural surface now coming to the step wise protocol what we can use here is identify the bad sign you should know where is the skin and soft tissue then identify the moving pleural line which is the shimmering line identify the sliding of the pleural line if it is absent or present absent means pneumothorax pleural line if it is regular yes it's a normal pleura if it is irregular you can suspect multiple b lines occurring or consolidation occurring when you start seeing the pleural irregularity or even in insisted pneumothorax you will say that it's a thickening a line b line or c line understand there can be false b lines so identify which is the prominent profile and by which you can give the diagnosis and it will be fitted into a clinical syndrome by a clinician while doing this they would also use this ultrasound same ultrasound for doing the 2d echo to understand the right ventricular strain or the ivc diameter as well as they see both the femoral veins and the popliteal veins quickly to know whether there is any additional blood thickening or thrombosis which is occurring and that's when we realize that the people who use ultrasound in covid or in general in uh, icu setting they tend to give a better clinical care because they are doing a very quick 6 minute scan and continuously seeing the lung the heart and coming back to the ivc both the common femoral veins and they would probably not miss major thrombi also so this is how a protocol can help you to fit it into clinical syndrome and along with the other tests like d dimer and all they would start the uh, anticoagulant therapy or other relevant therapy even in pulmonary thromboembolism by knowing the additional echocardiography picture so it becomes a complete tool in reality i'm not going to talk about the differentials because we already discussed this we'll not touch upon too much of uh, covid now because we know ground glass opacity consolidation interlobular septal thickening peripheral and subpleural area these were the hallmarks and this is how we would use it in ultrasound by doing ultrasound of the same patient once they come to icu it may not be possible for us to shift them to ct every now and then and that's when the ultrasound was used effectively and you can see couple of example here that is our typical early 0 to 3 days nothing happening here in the lung and you can see the lungs are showing typical a pattern multiple parallel normal pleural line 
as you go ahead a little bit now we start seeing laser ray like appearance this is because now there is a b line sir which are occurring which shows you some kind of accumulation or subpleural pathology which is occurring here from here to here you can see now there is some subpleural pathology which is occurring here it becomes more coalescent because the difference between the two b lines is increasing so now we understand that it is becoming coalescent so it will become a more ground glass appearance as you can see here nicely that's the real time and that's the just the still image you can see very nicely quickly you can see the difference from here to here how the pleura is becoming thicker and more shinier here and because it corresponds to this you can come down further and you can see here now there would be a broken pleural line or blo uh, you know cons actual consolidation and that is how it would be seen on a still image and this is how a ct picture will look so from day wise the timeline of covid could change and this is covid is the buzzword but we can use the same principle for other uh, icu setting also so i think eventually there would be a lot of uh, more usage of ultrasound in reality would be occurring because of the great experience which people have had in covid so 0 to 3 3 to 7 and 7 to 4 days how a normal lung starts becoming multifocal b line showing subpleural consolidation which becomes a white lung and then eventually the white lung causes the consolidation here so i think i'm just touching upon this one a line come to the b line here how it changes how it becomes more coarser and how it becomes now broken and it becomes eventually consolidation so keep this in mind a line b line c line. i think not uh, going too much into detail how a b two line that means the b line with difference between the two b lines can become a very bright line so it becomes a b7 line or b coalescing line because it is now becoming a consolidation line and we saw this very nicely they use lot of uh, ultrasound in prone position because functional residual capacity improved in prone position regional diaphragmatic motion was better seen perfusion redistribution occur and there was clearance of secretion so even in uh, supine and prone you can see the difference between the you know pathology is more marked in certain uh, areas in prone position because that is where it occurred uh, more commonly during the covid time so prone positional ultrasound is also one of the common factor in this now i think uh, we as a radiologist also are now when we do biopsies we tend to see the covid lung itself was showing lot of uptake here as you can see here lot of uptake is seen in a covid lung and this is when we started using ultrasound also in some of the patient even who come for some other work that you can easily pick up covid lung during your day to day ultrasound practice so i think we'll skip this i mean just to show the difference between the normal lung and the abnormal uh, you know broken pleura and think keep that in mind because this will help you in some time in future now coming to some pathologies we can see from normal to consolidation how a covid pattern can change we all know i don't want to talk same again but knowing what was your ct data sometimes some machines even we have this machine where a fusion can be used not that we use this time or a wireless probes could be used where you could do ultrasound with more kind of safety to yourself and the machine because you need uh, you know nice wireless machine where you can create and you know uh, do the fusion by knowing which area of the lung is involved and which area the lung is not involved now coming to some other uh, aspects i think i have couple of minutes so we'll start about mediastinum mediastinum biopsies are very useful and you need not do ct guidance because you can see real time everything that's your pulmonary artery dividing into the two and you know this is your marker for your uh, you know angle how you can angle your needle and you can do a good biopsy this was a hodgkins disease in a 5 year old child it becomes much easier to do such biopsies sometimes there can be a thymus thymus like tissue but when you actually do ultrasound ultrasound is better to show that which is the fatty component here and which is the abnormal nodal component here and we can see the internal mammary artery is quite nicely seen here which is generally seen so nicely on ct so to avoid this artery and you can see to get a sample from here will not be very useful but to avoid the artery as well as to get the sample from this area would be useful 
and that's what ultrasound does better in some clinical scenarios. You can see the intermammary artery, you can avoid it, go into the particular lesion, and this was the uh, you know, typical abnormal tuberculous uh, um, necrotic node, which we got enough material for tissue diagnosis. Sometimes patients are having such a bad lung and bad pleural effusion that they would not lie down in a CT gantry. And especially uh, when you see the lesion very well on ultrasound, because there is no air and you can see the fluid, the collapsed lung and the mass, then using color Doppler, knowing where are your arteries, you can do the good bias here. I think one similar example, I think we can show here, use your correct biopsy uh, needle, correct size with the knowing what is the notch size, you would not exceed that limit and not touch any vessel. So I think this is one example where again, there was a complete collapse and this happened during COVID period. We needed a diagnosis. What we needed to do is understand how we can turn this patient, turn the patient, put the ultrasound and know where is your lung and this is the lung and this is the mass and that is your pulmonary artery which is seen here. So avoid all the structures and beautifully you can angle and get a tissue sample. So this is one area where you can use ultrasound by studying your CT scan in a good fashion and sometimes cavitation also are very well seen on ultrasound because the air will get trapped. Moment to turn the patient around the air will move and you can take a good sample from here. Always, always keep oxygen ready and keep your pulse oximeter correctly uh, uh, in place so that you don't really uh, miss the complication. Difficult CT guided definition is sometimes you can't go from here because there are vessels, there are cartilages, there are joints. You can't go from here because there can be lung. You have to use the subpleural dissection. But on ultrasound, you get a nice angled approach. And this is when you can use the such lung biopsies or mediastinal biopsy very well under ultrasound guidance. This is a very common scene that there's a pneumothorax then the whole evening gets fired. So our job is generally to avoid some, uh, you know, pneumothoraces that we tend to use ultrasound and try and go for some supraclavicular pathology which are representing the same infraclavicular abnormalities and we tend to get a better sample from higher up without causing the pneumothorax. So this can be one of the use. You can use small footprint probe and instead of going through this small notch on CT scan, you can do it same thing on ultrasound and you can do the justice. You can avoid this lung completely by putting the obliquely placed needle by you know seeing the lesion through the liver and you can see how nicely the you know, needle goes into the area without avoiding the pleural space here. And you can do a good kind of uh, diagnosis here. This was a neuroendocrine tumor, carcinoid tumor, you can see here. Uh, very uh, very nicely you can see the lesion with the necrotic component and you get a good sample from this uh, big lesion. Empyma pictal drainage, yes, we can uh, use ultrasound because you it's a very easy thing. Just put in a pigtail, drain it out and you follow it up over the X-ray chest. You can use it for pleural aspiration. This was poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Then we need to do pleural disease because they will keep on re-accumulating. So you will aspirate, put in a pigtail and then put some drugs like tetracycline and it achieves the pleurodesis. So by which now there will be pleural fibrosis will occur and there will be no reaccumulation. So this is a palliative procedure and sometimes done. Sometimes there can be confusion. Where is your ICD and the drainage is not occurring? Ultrasound can rescue you because in this case, the ICD looks to be in a good position, but in reality, it was it had gone inadvertently through the liver and that's why it was not draining. It is a very easy diagnosis for us on ultrasound. Diaphragmatic tear and diaphragmatic movement, ultrasound is very good. You can see here actually there is a rent, which is a leak of liver abscess, you can see, which is accumulating into pleural cavity. This was a splenic collection which has accumulated into the pleural cavity through the diaphragmatic rent in the, on the left side. So this tear can be diagnosed very well on ultrasound. Rift fractures are very easy. When you know for sure this is the point of tenderness, sometimes obliques can pick up or sometimes they miss it, but ultrasound will definitely with high frequency you can pick up a fracture very clearly. Similarly, external cox or metastatic lesion can cause break in the sternal line and same principle you can use fracture or any destructive pathology involving the bone very well by doing ultrasound. I think this is the same thing that rib and sternal fractures are easily diagnosed better on the uh, lung ultrasound than any other thing. 
whether the lesion is pleural based or extra pleural i think ultrasound will help you a lot so whenever in exam they ask you this i think one of the easiest answer you can give is i'll do the ultrasound and try to understand where is the lesion similarly tuberculosis being so common in our country it will form some masses which are pleural as well as extra pleural and this is a very common scenario which we see the rib uh, the, uh, you know are getting indented here by the collection here which is there some other uses of lung ultrasound to know intercostal nerve block they are used for some intractable pain like in um, viral diseases pulmonary thromboembolism foreign body detection endotracheal tube positioning and diaphragmatic movement when the tube is positioned in the wrong side if it goes only on one side so naturally the other lung will not be respirating and the pleura will be not sliding on that side or diaphragm movement we saw all these example diaphragm movements are used to know whether there is a paresis by knowing the m mode of the diaphragm and it's a very easy thing now if you see here that's the lung that's that's the lung that's the liver and that's maybe the diaphragm here which we can't see here but moment you uh, use high frequency probe you can see the diaphragm so nicely that typical triple layer appearance you can see here one layer two layer and three layer that's the liver and that's the lung and you can see the diaphragm very well if you use the m mode here you will be getting the actual m mode movements which are seen of the diaphragm and by seeing the thickness of the diaphragm intensivists will use it for the diaphragmatic movement analysis endotracheal tube location the tube itself will give rise to artifact when the patient breathes correctly pericardial effusion i think we can diagnose very well and once in a while you may be asked to put in a tube here because they want to avoid the tamponade so i think that could be one of the reason we can take ultrasound to ct scan to do some ablative procedures like in this case there is a lung lesion which is seen on ultrasound but to ablate it correctly sometimes you can use ultrasound and contrast ultrasound is also useful as you can see in this case this treat the lung metastatic lesion was treated by us by using two electrodes and this was the lesion which was ablated which was seen intensely enhancing before as you can see here before the rf you can see it completely enhancing but after the ablation you can see the post rf on table we using contrast not the ct scan we could diagnose that the lesion has been ablated very well you can see the difference clearly that lesion is not showing any uptake here and so you can be innovative with ultrasound and it will help us so i think with this finally ultrasound chest uh, and lung is not just the rocket science but it is full of shimmering effects i can say you can saw see a lot of seashore stratosphere signs along with lung pulse lung point and lung rocket as the machines are getting smaller we will definitely go closer to the patients for their benefit intensivists will use will be using it intensely so you have choice to join them or they may use it independently combined with other modalities almost forms a special effect so i think there are a lot of uh, covid related uh, you know um, protocols and uh, articles are available on net and some of them i have summarized here if anybody is interested i can give this to you so be elastic leap higher and uh, thank you all for your attention thank you so much thank you so much asif it was very interesting thank you preeti thanks a lot thank you sir for that great session we will now invite dr yogesh choudhary for the next session so is consultant at bhakti sonography clinic and will be giving a presentation on fetal echo systematic approach in detection of cardiac defects we welcome you sir hello everyone good evening to everyone and to all respected teachers all students and my friends i think it is a real testing time of your patients uh and salute to your patient that you all have logged in till the last uh, lecture of your volume is a little low your volume is low okay ma'am yeah. is it fine now hello yes sir yes sir it is fine yes ma'am is it fine now it yes fine it is fine sir uh yeah first of all i thank you to the radio con team for giving me this great opportunity for being here and sharing the screen with all my respected teachers uh, is really a fortunate and uh, you know great proud feeling for me so i like to dedicate this talk to all my respected teachers and i feel that even if i contribute 
just one percent of their cost and work of uh, teaching uh, and giving knowledge to the next generation then i will be a very <coughs> proud uh, student today so with that thought let us move forward to the uh, today's topic fetal eco systematic approach in detection of cardiac defects so we'll go uh, very slowly and simply and i will be giving you a simple overview to diagnose the fetal cardiac anomaly uh, in our routine practice so what are the learning points today so we'll be learning the normal ultrasound appearance of the fetal heart then we'll go through some documentation protocols we'll see some tips and tricks to pick up the abnormalities in our busy practice then we'll see a systematic approach uh, to diagnose and uh, prognosticate the commonly seen cardiac anomalies and indirectly we'll mm, be you know learning how to improve our detection rate so in our common practice we have uh, many difficulties you know there are different worries and queries whenever it comes to the fetal echocardiography we find it as a very difficult technically time consuming and definitely the anatomy of the heart is difficult to understand because it is uh, the rapidly moving uh, structure along with the fetal movements so definitely it is a challenge there are different queries like many time we are not sure whether the heart is really normal or not or if we find some abnormality we are not sure about what exactly is this and if you don't know that we cannot uh, counsel the patient regarding the prognosis so we should overcome all these difficulties and just move forward and start doing the fetal echo so what is our goal so we should achieve this excellence to diagnose such minor uh, anomalies like this small vsd uh, in our routine practice and i tell you if you follow systematic protocol it is not difficult so how we will be doing that so best way is to wait for the proper fetal position use proper technique while evaluation of the heart take your time properly till you reach the final diagnosis practice practice and practice keep patience keep patience and keep upgrading yourself keep reading listen to the lectures because unless you know what you want to see in the fetal heart then you will not be able to see that so general overview of the talk today is going through some background then documentation protocol and technical aspects then we'll see some normal versus abnormal cardiac sections and systematically we go through the abnormal fourth chamber view septal defects abnormal outlets and few venous anomalies and in last uh, part of the lecture we'll see one or two slides of miscellaneous anomalies first trimester screening you must have been covered in a uh, dr moise's lecture we'll see whether we can prognosticate uh, in simplified manner the different cardiac anomalies and try to take some valuable take home messages so considering the background you all know that congenital heart disease is the most common congenital malformation and it is very highly under diagnosed prenatally and even postnatally even postnatal diagnosis is more challenging than what we have and 90% of the time csd occurs in the patients without any risk factor so practically speaking each and every pregnant woman becomes uh, ha, uh, becomes uh, at risk and we should scan each and every patient irrespective of the trimester if you see the birth prevalence prevalence it is 8 to 9 per 1000 live births and according to this figure in our country every year around 2 lakh 40000 children are born with congenital heart disease and 40000 out of that are uh, severe form which need uh, definitive treatment in the infantile and neonatal uh, neonatal period so there is a big responsibility on our shoulder that we should do a early prenatal diagnosis which is very crucial in counseling decision making and deciding about the perinatal management so best way is to follow the simple guideline uh, different international bodies have uh, you know uh, uh, formulated the simple guidelines which can be followed in our routine practice which average uh, level operator so 
and they are, these guidelines should be uh, followed to scan in all patients in all second and third trimester fetal echocardiography guidelines uh, they expect us to uh, look into the heart especially more in detail especially when we detect the abnormality in the routine screening we should do a detail uh, fetal echo which uh, uh, expect us to see a uh, detailed segmental sequential analysis of the chamber then sec uh, axial and sagittal planes color doppler evaluation pulse doppler and rate freedom assessment biometry and few additional techniques like speak tissue doppler speckle track uh, speckle tracking these are some additional features uh, these needs uh, very uh, detailed training and experience but in uh, some cases like iugr and car cardiac function evaluation these are very important but routinely very difficult to uh, apply in routine practice so before you learn how to do the fetal echo we should learn basically the how to optimize your 2d and color images so we should know all the knobs on our machine like 2d uh, image optimization uh, which includes proper probe selection then preset selection we should know that there is always a, a cardiac preset given in your machine for fetal heart we should use that then depth focus scan range these are the uh, buttons we should uh, use to get a highest frame rate or in short you can put a box zoom and use uh, and optimize the 2d image in addition to that we have contrast speckle reduction compound imaging gains these can be used uh, as per the patient's requirement like in these images you can see this is the routine image and this is the optimized image so in this you have a very good contrast and tissue differentiation as well as you can optimize your color gains because at a time you are uh, seeing high velocity flows low velocity flows as well as a medium velocity flows so at least for basic cardiac evaluation you should optimize uh, the gain prf and wall motion filter and these three buttons sometimes you need to continuously operate during your um, examination uh, and balance and color maps are also uh, the very important things which uh, you should learn so how to screen heart uh, quickly so once you get the proper fetal position you take a cardiocranial sweep from the fetal abdomen to the upper mediastinum and take a overview of the fetal situs uh, for chamber view and outlet like here in this video you can see the fetal abdomen four chamber view three vessel view and the confluence view in a single sequence you can you know judge whether the heart is normal or not then you optimize select proper uh, preset and take uh, the uh, cardiocranial sweep and at least one sequence of the color doppler you should take so like here in this case we can see the four fetal abdomen four chamber view three vessel view right ventricular outlet and left ventricular outlet and in color doppler two uh, equal ventricular fillings and two outlets that is a v sign so this is the basic minimum requirement which uh, we should follow in the routine scanning now there are two different approaches uh, for the diagnosis simplest approach is you take sections and evaluate each section for the any abnormality the segmental analysis is more systematic it needs repeated real time time examinations and it is a systematic analysis of uh, venoatrial connections then the atrioventricular connections then the systematic chamber morphologies and the ventriculo arterial connections so basically in suspected abnormal cases and diagnosed abnormal cases uh, this segment sorry for the interruption because of the net problem so let's continue with the four chamber view so it's, uh, what we have seen it should be a parallel to the rib space so you can see you should see only one rib on either side or you should not see any you should not see a multiple ribs so that your four chamber view is correct what you look for is the two equal uh, ventricles two atria 
pulmonary veins, foramen oval, and the retrocardiac space. The important structure is the central portion, that is the crux, that is the confluence point of the tricuspid wall leaflet and the mitral wall leaflet. Normally, the tricuspid wall leaflet is slightly distally inserted on the interventricular septum, and that is the main feature of the identification of the right ventricle. Now, from four chamber view, we want left ventricular outlet view. So we need a slight probe maneuver in uh, to getting this uh, LVOT view. We rotate the probe 45 degree clockwise, and we do a 30 degree right left. Uh, uh, twisting of the probe to get this LVOT view. So what we see is the septo aortic continuation, that interventricular septum continues with the anterior wall of the aorta and the posterior wall of the aorta continues with the mitral wall leaflet. This is very important view in cases of the diagnosing membranous VSDs. And opposite movement of the probe, like anti-clockwise 45 degree rotation and the 30 degree tilting of the probes, which gives us a pulmonary artery long axis view with the bifurcation of pulmonary artery. The third, fourth view is the superior mediastinum axial view, which is parallel to the ribs. What we see is the three vessels. From left to right, this is pulmonary artery, aorta, and the uh, superior vena cava on extremely right side. The size should be descending from left to right and the space anterior to the three vessel view and the posterior to the sternum is occupied by the isoechoic uh, soft tissue, which is the thymus. And we should not forget to look for the confluence of aortic arch and the pulmonary arch, which is usually on the left side. In, uh, in cases of coarctation, interruption of aorta, this, uh, uh, this view is very important. So other sections which we should document are the M mode. Usually I uh, document the M mode to, uh, uh, to AV walls like mitral wall and the tricuspid wall and the pulmonary wall and aortic wall. In M mode, you, normally we take, but we should uh, try and uh, uh, train yourself to look at the atrial rate and the ventricular rate separately. So Next approach we should uh, develop is the quick screening by sweep method, that is cardiocranial sweep uh, to detect and take the overview of the normal versus abnormal heart. Like here, we, which we have already seen, in a single sweep, you can see all uh, those sections which we have seen in our documentation. These are the upper abdominal section, four chamber view, LVOT also called as a five chamber view section, and the right ventricular outlet view with confluence and the three vessel trachea view. And in this, another uh, video is an abnormal case. In the single sweep, you can make out there are multiple abnormalities there. Like here, what we can see, there is a two chambered heart uh, uh, instead of the four chambered. There is absence of stomach bubble there, and there is a two vessel cord there. And if you see carefully, you can see a left sided. Uh, Right chamber, so scenario of hypoplastic left heart. So wrong anomalies in the four chamber you can make out very easily in a single sweep method. Now coming to the outlet abnormalities in our uh, in a single sweep method, like here in this video you can see in single cardiocranial sweep you can make out. The four chamber view is looking slightly abnormal. There is an echogenic focus and there is an incomplete interventricular septum there. Here you can very well appreciate that there is an outlet VSD, slight overriding of aorta. And in three vessel trachea view, the pulmonary artery is smaller. 
than the aorta. Here, what you can see, four chamber view is normal, but the outlet crossing is slightly unusual. Like here, four chamber view shows two ventricles, two atria, but when you come to the outlet, the first outlet coming from the left ventricle is bifurcating, so it is a pulmonary artery. And second outlet is the aorta which is coming anteriorly from the right ventricle. Like here in the last section, you can see the aorta anterior coming from the right ventricle. So we are dealing with the uh, transposition of greater artery. And in this case, we are dealing with the evolving salivary tetralogy. So what sequence usually uh, uh, we follow in the complete cardiac diagnosis? First is the detection of abnormality normal versus abnormal heart. So most of the time by simple screening, we can uh, do that. And once you suspect the abnormality, you try to define the abnormal structure properly. You do a complete echocardiography. Then you do a detailed evaluation to get a functional information like contractility, flow alterations. Then you try to detect the extra cardiac anomalies, do a complete comprehensive fetal cardiac, uh, fetal uh, general anomaly scan and if you suspect any chromosomal anomaly in the fetus due to the uh, sonographic findings, the further appropriate evaluation should be done. And once you reach the provisional diagnosis, uh, take expert opinion regarding prognosis and treatment. And after we reach a final diagnosis, do a proper parental counseling. That is the most important uh, part of the, our cardiac <coughs> examination. So this sequence should be systematically followed. One, any, if any doubt you have, you take uh, some second opinion, confirm your diagnosis, and take expert opinions also, and report systematically. Make a simplified uh, uh, formats of reporting so that uh, everyone uh, should understand them clear cut. So coming to the sectional approach, we'll go through some normal and abnormal uh, sections to detect the cardiac anomalies. Like here in this case, what you can see, this is the normal section of the abdomen and this is the abnormal. So what is the abnormality there? This is the right side and you see a stomach on the right side. Aorta is more of near the midline and IVC on left. So definitely you are dealing with some situs abnormality or the head protaxy. So whenever you see an abnormal abdominal organ uh, orientation, the thorough examination of the fetal heart should be done. Now four chamber view normal we have seen so major chamber asymmetries uh, we can detect on the four chamber view. Like here you can see, uh, instead of four chambers, you can see only three chambers and small atrophy thick wall right ventricle there. In, in this view, we can see small left-sided chambers. Here we can see the dilated right uh, ventricle and right atrium with overall uh, dilated heart. Here we can see complete absence of the crux with single AV wall and large VSD, large atrial septal defect, and there is a, a transverse vein behind the heart. So all such major anomalies, um, once you see in the four chamber view, we should go uh, ahead with the fetal echocardiography. Now septo aortic discontinuation, like here you can see septum is incomplete here there is a overriding of the outlet vessels there here there is a single uh, outlet coming out of the heart with the outlet vsd here the vsd is very small with there is a uh, aortic override and what we can see in this case the first uh, outlet coming from the left ventricle is bifurcating so it is a pulmonary artery and you suspect that you are dealing with some malposition of the ventricular outlets so in three vessel view we look for the size of the vessel and the number of vessel. So here you can see the most right-sided vessel, which is pulmonary artery and ductal arch is smaller than the aorta. That means you are dealing with some cardiac asymmetry or the outlet anomaly. In this case, what you can see, the arrangement of the vessel is normal, but central vessel, which is aorta, is looking disproportionately smaller than the pulmonary artery, which is almost equal to the SBC. So uh, we should suspect about the evolving coagulation or any hypoplastic uh, left uh, heart syndrome. Here, what we can see is the two vessel instead of three vessel. The central vessel, which is aorta, is not there. So that means we are again dealing with the hypoplastic left heart there. 
what you can see here is the instead of three vessel how many vessels are there there are four vessels there is an extra vessel on the left side so 90% time this is related to the persistent left superior vena cava but sometime unusually you can have a ascending anomalous pulmonary vein uh, on the left side of the pulmonary artery so color doppler will be definitely useful in such cases confluence view in confluence we view what we have seen uh, the continuation of aortic arches size of the arches and the flow so what in this case we can detect, uh, see that the aortic arch is disproportionately smaller than the ductal arch in the scenario of evolving cooptation here what we can see is the pulmonary artery is showing forward flow but the aorta is showing reversal of the flow here aorta is showing forward flow and pulmonary artery is showing reversal of the flow that means we are dealing with significant cardiac abnormality below and here what you can see instead of seeing normal v sign there you can see a u loop around the trachea due to the right sided aortic arch so so we have seen how we detect or get a clue on different sections about the cardiac anomaly now we'll go through the abnormal four chambers this is the normal uh, four chamber we have already seen different uh, types of anomalies we can easily see easily seen on four chamber are the small left ventricle small right uh, ventricle small atrioventricular septal defects large atrioventricular septal defects and univentricular or double inlet single ventricular morphologies besides this there are many abnormalities we can detect on the four chamber view so let us see one by one so this is a 29 week pregnancy single cardiocranial sweep what you can see abdominal situs is normal four chamber view is showing significantly small sided left ventricle which shows thick wall and that is a small size of the left atrium and in three vessel trachea view what you can see there is a single outlet no aorta and the superior vena cava so what we are dealing with is the hypoplastic left ventricle there so this is the these are dilated pulmonary veins and a small left atrium in this case there was a reversal in the uh, aortic flow on gray scale aorta was no, not seen but when we put the color there was a retrograde filling of the aorta which shows that there is a no forward flow on the left side so this was a hypoplastic left heart now look at this as compared to the last case see this is again 28 weaker there is definitely a chamber asymmetry there is a right dominant heart pulmonary artery is looking uh, dilated but surprisingly the valves are normal foramen oval flap is opening contractility is looking normal but in outlet view see on four chamber it is a right dominant heart outlet view aorta is looking disproportionately smaller than the <coughs> ductal arch so if you compare this with this so in such cases we should suspect a cooptation like see the images the right sided dominant right sided dominant heart there is a transient reversal in the end systole in the aorta and a smaller size so diagnosis of the aorta cooptation of aorta is usually a provisional diagnosis antenatally all such cases should be meticulously followed uh, postnatally uh, at least for one year cooptation uh, now next case 18 weeks detected during the routine anomaly scan what we can see is the significant abnormal four chamber view so let us see what is the abnormality there so abdominal situs is normal instead of seeing four chambers we can see only three chambers thick echogenic wall of the right ventricle and the right ventricular cavity is almost hypoplastic or the Uh, very small and there is no uh, atrioventricular flow on the right side there so definitely we are dealing with the case of uh, tricuspid wall atresia there so next case is 22 weeker 
anomaly scan significantly dilated heart but dilatation is disproportionate right atrium and the right ventricle is looking dilated but if you see carefully to the tricuspid wall the leaflet of tricuspid wall is inserted very distally along the interventricular septum so definitely we are dealing with classical case of Epstein's anomaly there see there is on color doppler there is a gross regurgitant flow which is arising from the ventricular cavities there so this is the Epstein's anomaly so these are the features we have seen dilated right atrium right ventricle there is a atrialization of the right ventricle there tricuspid rigor regurgitation flow is uh, arising from the ventricular cavity there and due to the negative pressure of the regurgitation there is a reversal of the flow in the pulmonary artery so very close differential of the Epstein's anomaly is the tricuspid wall dysplasia but the two important features that differentiate between the Epstein's and tricuspid dysplasia are the insertion of the valve leaflet. In tricuspid dysplasia, the valve leaflet is inserted normally at the crux and the regurgitation jet, which is usually arises from the valve opening. Like here you can see it is originating from the valve opening, though the regurgitation is uh, very significant. So these two points we can uh, differentiate the tricuspid dysplasia from Epstein's. Now next gross anomaly we can detect on the four chamber view is the single ventricular cavity. So most of the time if the VSD is large and there is a single AV wall, no interatrial septum, it is very difficult to decide which chamber is this. Okay, so the definitive chamber morphology is many times very difficult to diagnose. Like here in this case, univentricular heart with single AV connection, single outlet in cases of, look at the abdominal section carefully. What we can see here is the stomach on the right side, aorta on the left side, IVC on the left side, cardiac axis on left side, and there is a two chamber heart. So this is the univentricular morphology in the case of heterotaxy. The 4D rendered hard views are very useful to, you know, giving us some different picture of the univentricular heart. Like here, you can see the previous case. You can see one AV wall is opening. There is a single ventricle, large VSD. And if you see left-sided AV wall is thick, atretic and not opening. So it was a case of mitral atresia with large VSD there and this was a single ventricle single AV wall uh, morphology on the 4D rendered view of the heart. Now coming to the septal defects most common are the VSDs whenever they are seen on the grayscale they are significant. Uh, there are three different types according to their location this is the muscular VSD clearly you can see the defect usually the true defect our true VSD shows ecogenic margins. See, this is the inlet VSD which is seen in the four chamber view near the crux. You can see interventricular septum is incomplete there. It is not reaching up to the crux. So this is an inlet VSD. Inlet and outlet VSDs usually are the membranous type. And outlet VSD we see uh, in the form of loss of uh, septo aortic discontinuation. Like here you can see the septum is ending here, aorta is getting overrided. So that was a outlet VSD there. And the different uh, spectrum of the septal defects, like here, this was a 24 weaker routine scan. And there was a large central defect there. Crux was completely absent. There was a single wall, uh, single AV wall, two equal ventricles, two atria, but the crux was completely absent. So it was a large atrioventricular septal defect. Another case with a single large AV wall with the absence of the crux. So that was an atrioventricular septal defect. Now, this was the minor VSD. If you start putting color in each and every scan, you will uh, see this is the most common cardiac anomaly we come across. These are usually a non-significant VSDs. They are picked up only on the color Doppler, but 
uh, once you see such VSDs, you should do a complete comprehensive scan of the fetus again to look for any associated malformation. Again, this was the VSD which was picked, picked up uh, during routine scan, and this was a linear uh, probe image with the color Doppler. You can see a bidirectional flow in this VSD. Now look at this very carefully. See, this was a four chamber view. Interventricular septum was complete, but what we can see here, the septum primum, that is interatrial septal portion near to the crux was not reaching up to the uh, crux actually. And there was a small defect there. So that was a septum primum defect. And this was the last uh, uh, case of the AVSD spectrum. See, the AVSD was very small, very subtle. If you don't uh, see it carefully with proper cardiac preset, you are going to miss such small AVSD. See, the defect was very small. And on four chamber view, the very subtle finding that was a parallel arrangement of AV walls and slight right dominance was there, but there was a small AVSD. If such small AVSDs are usually associated with chromosomal abnormalities like Downs and uh, trisomy. So we should uh, pick up them in very early stages. Okay, now coming to the outlet abnormalities. So normal orientation of outlets is like this. The pulmonary artery is uh, anterior and to the right. And first outlet is usually aorta, which is in the center. So different combinations of the uh, outlet anomalies, uh, what we see are shown in, the, in this diagram. The most common is the small outlet VSD, smaller pulmonary artery and override of aorta, which is the Thaler's tetralogy. Close differential to this is the Overriding artery is pulmonary artery and aorta is going to the right side and there is an outlet membranous VSD. So whenever both outlets are looking like arising more of on from the right ventricle, this is scenario of the double ventricular, double outlet right ventricle. Now when pulmonary artery is very small and there is a single uh, uh, vessel which is dominant aorta coming out of the ventricles, then we should suspect the pulmonary atresia with VSD, which is the extreme form of the Thaler's tetralogy. And if you see only single outlet, large VSD and the pulmonary artery arising from that outlet, so that is the type of common arterial trunk. And as per the origin of the pulmonary artery, there are different types of the common arterial trunk. If there is a complete transposition of great vessels like we have seen already, aorta from right ventricle, pulmonary ar artery from left ventricle, and the septum is intact, then this is the transposition of greater artery. And if there is a large VSD in scenario of abnormal arrangement of the outlets, and which is difficult to categorize in any of these uh, classical appearances, we just label them as a mal-aligned VSD. So we'll see a few examples. See, this was detected on routine anomaly scan. What we see is the very subtle abnormality. We are not comfortable with the LVOT view in this case. See, the four chamber view was normal. On three vessel view, there was a slightly smaller pulmonary artery. Again, smaller ductal arch, and there was a large outlet VSD there. So this was a Thaler's tetralogy. And in this case, the outlets were parallel. There was no VSD. And definitely, the first outlet was a pulmonary artery, and second outlet was the aorta. So that was a transposition of great artery. This was a case given to me by Dr. Sachin Patil, sir, from uh, uh, Niramai Hospital, Chinchwad. 
this was the classical case of you know double outed right ventricle like here you can see normal abdominal cycle four chamber view was showing thick uh, atriatic tricuspid wall see the mitral wall was opening there was a vfd and if you go to the outlet sections the pulmonary artery was overriding over the interventricular septum and aorta was coming out from the right ventricle so this was a classical case of double outlet right ventricle with tricuspid atresia now next case this is the single dominant outlet coming out from the both the ventricles through the large outlet vfd and when we try to look for the pulmonary artery in this case we found that pulmonary artery was arising from this common uh, uh, artery just distal to the wall so this was a common arterial trunk morphology so the chamber view was normal there was a outlet vfd and there was a parallel arrangement of the vessel so this was a transposition of greater arteries with vsd so we just label it as a mal aligned vsd with a parallel arrangement so if you categorize want to categorize or classify the uh, overriding uh, artery uh, morphology the simple rule is that if the aorta is overriding the first differential is the pallor tetralogy if the pulmonary artery is overriding first differential is the dorv and if there is a single outlet most commonly it is scenario of pulmonary atresia and second differential is the uh, common arterial trunk and if aorta overrides too much on the right ventricle it goes in favor of double outlet right ventricle and if pulmonary artery goes more on the left side it becomes more of to a transposition of greater arteries with vsd now these are some classical appearances of commonly seen uh outlet anomalies like this y appearance of the outlet like both ventricles are draining into the overriding uh, aorta and this is the fallus tetralogy this is double outlet right ventricle right ventricle draining both into the aorta and pulmonary artery but in this case pulmonary artery is slightly smaller so pulmonary hypoplasia is one of the common association of dorv and this is classical appearance of the transposition of greater arteries with parallel arrangement now two very subtle cases which was incidentally detected this was a 29 weeker all the previous scans were normal she came for the doppler now what we suspected that there is some abnormality in this four chamber view was not obvious but right ventricle appeared slightly thick and the cavity was smaller so we tried to look for the Uh, outlets carefully so what we found that the pulmonary artery was slightly dilated as compared to the aorta it was like a balloon like uh, appearance and when we looked carefully at the pulmonary wall look at this wall this is aortic wall which is opening and closing and the pulmonary wall which is thick and which is not disappearing during the systole normally what we should expect when the wall opens it should disappear like here pulmonary uh, valve was thick echogenic and it was persistently seen throughout the systole and diastole so this was a case of pulmonary uh, valve atresia like here this is aortic wall and this is thick pulmonary wall with some dilatation due to the postenotic flow so same case when we put the color see there was a large uh, aliasing and high velocity flow seen through the pulmonary artery and see thick walled small right ventricle aliasing flow high velocity the psv was around more than 300 up to the 400 cm so it was a classical case of pulmonary valve stenosis which was evolved slowly in the uh, late uh, second trimester and the third trimester again this was a 19 weeker Uh, picked up at an anomaly scan what we can see there was a thick echogenic wall left ventricle with right dominant heart and on three vessel view what we can see is the aorta is the smallest vessel and on four chamber view what we can see dilated right atrium and thick echogenic wall of the left ventricle and when we put the color there was no flow through the mitral wall no forward flow through the mitral wall like here in this section you can see 
no mitral valve flow there was a flow through forward flow through the tricuspid valve only and when we put the color uh, on the outlets what you can see there is a retrograde feeling of the um, aortic arch so this is the classical scenario of the critical aortic wall stenosis eventually this patient land up into the hypoplastic left heart and in late pregnancy and this uh, left ventricle uh, gets completely obliterated so these were the images slightly thick wall echogenic wall of the left ventricle no flow and a reversal in the outlet so that was a hypoplastic left heart now coming to the venous anomalies venous anomalies especially when they are isolated they are difficult to pick up but there are definitely some clues which you can uh, get on the routine scanning like here you can see most common uh, clue what we get on the four chamber view is the right dominant heart in cases of venous anomalies because of the increase preload on the right ventricle then there is a increase retrocardiac space in scenario of pulmonary venous anomalies when you see any confluent vein behind the heart you should look for it carefully to rule out a pulmonary venous anomaly when there is a dilated normal vein like this is the dilated coronary sinus which is seen in this case you should suspect some abnormal vein draining into that if you see dilated ivc then you should suspect some abnormal vein draining in that if you see extra vein in the three vessel trachea view you suspect plsvc or the anomalous pulmonary vein and any descending vein behind the heart on color doppler should be suspected and look carefully for the venous anomaly so let us see a few examples so this was a 19 weeker incidentally found very subtle clue was the right dominant heart and concave convex smooth border of the left atrium see and there was a increased retrocardiac space normally we should see two pulmonary veins running into the left atrium instead of that there was a confluent vein seen behind the heart right dominant heart confluent vein increased retrocardiac space so these were the clues when we put the color see there was a descending vein seen behind the heart which was draining into the venous vestibule in the liver so on sagittal section you can classically see this descending vein draining into the venous vestibule along with the hepatic vein so this was a classical case of descending type of total anomalous pulmonary venous connections again this was case a 25 weeker came for the fetal echo previous uh, reports were normal and this was very subtle no heart was normal but there was slight right dominance i found that umbilical vein is dilated and which was directly draining into the ivc instead of that what we normally expect that umbilical vein should drain into the venous vestibule through the ductus venosus so in this case see on color doppler the umbilical dilated vein was directly draining into the ivc so this was the umbilical cable shunt with absence of ductus venosus see the right dominant heart and there was a dilated pulmonary artery so this was the first clue that we picked up and then we uh, when we looked for the venous anatomy we found this again plsvc many time you see some abnormality but cannot define it then you look for you know any extra vessel like in this case you see plsvc as a extra vessel on the left side dilated coronary sinus on longitudinal section in left parasagittal section you can see uh, this persistent left superior vena cava directly draining at the base of the heart through the coronary sinus or many time the first clue you get on the four chamber view is the right dominant heart with small blade like structure behind the mitral valve on the left side so such a uh, clue should be picked up uh, very carefully and looked in for in detail miscellaneous anomalies they are sometimes just surprise sometimes very important like this is the aberrant right subclavian artery which uh, uh, now we are looking uh, looking for it in each and every anomalies can because it is uh, found to be one of the marker for the down then echogenic focus very common finding isolated there is no problem but if it is associated with other soft markers it adds to the diagnosis of the aneuploidies cardiomegaly pericardial effusion should be looked carefully for um, other associated abnormalities 
and IUGR. Sometimes you may come across the ecogenic masses around the ventricular walls like rhabdomyomas. Then abnormality of position, situs, which we are not going to cover in this lecture, but any variation in the axis, situs, position of the heart should be looked carefully for <clears throat> cardiac, intracardiac anomalies as well as the extracardiac anomalies like diaphragmatic hernias. And as we are now uh, regularly looking for tricuspid flow, many times we are getting this tricuspid regurgitation. If it is trivial, most of the time isolated, but uh, whenever you pick up this uh, tricuspid regurgitation, you should look into the heart very carefully. Abnormal rhythm, I usually try to uh, detect them visually by carefully observing the rhythm of the heart. Like here in these cases, you can see very slowly beating heart. And here, you can see regularly missed beats in this case. So only thing you should confirm is that whether it is persistent or transient. So repeated evaluation over the period of time is very important. And then this patient should be kept for systematic rate rhythm analysis uh, for assessment of the arrhythmias. Now first trimester screening, which we have already seen the, in basic protocol now, we, are, we have included the ideal intersection. In cardiac sections, we look for two equal inlets, two equal outlets with V sign. We are documenting tricuspid hall in uh, trying to document it regularly. And ductus venosus by default, we document in all the patients. So all these are normal images. And any variation in these images, like here, the NT is increased, nasal bone is absent here. There is a asymmetrical ventricular flow. There is a single outlet there, or there is a tricuspid regurgitation in this case, and there is a reversal in the ductus venosus flow. So all such abnormalities should be picked up early, and this patient should be followed carefully up to the 16 weeks or 18 weeks for evolving cardiac anomalies as well as extra cardiac anomalies. So what are the factors which uh, influence on the prognostication of the cardiac anomalies? As we have already seen, degree of chamber asymmetry is important. More the degree of chamber asymmetry, the worse is the prognosis. Then the disproportion of the outlets. More difference in the sizes of the outlets. Uh, larger is the size of VSD or amount of the flow alterations in like regurgitation or reversal in the outlet. Like here, you see the reversal in one of the outlet. There is a significant regurgitation here. All such cases have got a guarded prognosis. And in addition to that, altered contractility of ventricular um, walls, then associated abnormalities in the fetus, chromosomal abnormalities association, all these are going to influence our prognostication and counseling. So to summarize with, we just try to uh, do fetal echo in routine practice, try to pick up the anomalies and classify them as per the prognosis leading into the major, moderate and minor anomalies so that patients should be counseled properly. Uh, we should keep updating ourselves, go through the guidelines which ICOG has described. SFM India has also come up with the recent guidelines for the cardiac evaluation in our country. The two very uh, important textbooks, Fetal Echocardiography, a practical guide by Dr. Lindsay Allen, and a very beautiful book, Practical Guide for Fetal Echo by Dr. Alfred Abu Hamad and Ravi Shai. These are the most read books for the fetal heart. And I also request all of you to go through our articles, which we have published in the last couple of years on the fetal cardiac anomalies incidence, fetal venous anomalies, and critical cardiac uh, congenital heart diseases. This, this will definitely help you to improve your approach to the fetal heart. And last but not least is the key to success is practice and patience. So just keep trying. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with this, I end my presentation here. Thank you, sir. That was truly an excellent presentation. Thank you. All the best to all of you.